Oops, I forgot to put myself on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to DPA Open Mic episode uh, 65. And I, I just randomly titled this as the, yeah, a changing world that needs us to talk about. Uh, because uh, even if it doesn't need us to talk about, we will still talk about it. So, yeah. So, uh, I'm going to drop the link uh, to the uh, pinned in the live chat and uh, so that people can join and uh, not listen to me monologue because uh, every video is just me monologuing. So, uh, so let me put the link. Dun, 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 dun. So the link to join is now up in the Rumble live chat and now on the yeah, and now on the live chat. It's pinned now. It's pinned now. So you can check it out. Uh, those that want to come on to, to chit chat, you know, can come on to chit chat. So don't feel shy. Uh, anyone can come on. You can talk about anything you want. You want to talk about sports, you can talk about sports. And uh, actually, I haven't checked. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> uh, can you guys hear me? So, uh, oh, one is on. Hi. Yeah, I cut my hair for Chinese New Year, so uh, it's no longer that uh, thick blonde hair. <laughs> You're muted, Vaughn. I just said, what's up, Andrew? <laughs> Andrew, you have no sound. Hey, can you hear me now? Yep. What's up, guys? Been yeah. An interesting week. <clears throat> Can't wait to get started <laughs> talking about it. Yeah. So the week, from my perspective, what from what I know, of course, we have the Tucker Carlson uh, Putin interview, which the, uh, which have a uh, so-called almost coming to two hundred million views, which I, uh, which I think a huge number of it is fake, because it's like TikTok, you know. <laughs> It's not no people don't watch the whole thing. It just appears it's considered one view. And uh then also there is there's of course the Russian uh, offensive gaining a lot of steam. Uh Ukrainian lines are crumbling, like literally crumbling. It's not even like I'm not even being hyped about it. You know, it's, it's literally crumbling. I've never seen the city fall so fast. Um not Mariupol, not Severodonets, uh, not Bakhmut. You no, know, Edifka, you know, the northern part is falling like, like, no snow mean. Anyway, so, anyway, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Is my microphone all right? Yes, for the first time. Okay. In ages. Finally. <laughs> it was just one week, you know. <laughs> People forgot about it. No, <laughs> it's. No, it's like it's like no always everything is Russia's fault. You know, people don't remember all the good things that Russia do. It's like they only remember, oh, you you captured Crimea. No, it's always your fault. Then yeah. uh, another, I think I think eco uh the the three countries the side the three Sahel countries left ECOWAS. I think they made a statement. Yeah, I think, but I I haven't covered that yet. So yeah, I don't know much about it other than they left. So I don't know what else. What else have happened? You, you forgot to talk about the uh, Sierski. Yeah, Sierski. Yeah, Of course. It's not. It's not important. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, you uh, know how they they my, his new nickname is the Butcher or General Two Hundred. Uh, from the rumors, you no, know, I hear in the Russia after all. Uh, so. That's is that uh, so from the rumors uh from the ground within ukraine uh is super demoralizing for both civilians and military uh within ukraine um of course my source you probably saw him before <laughs> so you know the uh, funny thing about the open mic why it always come up with a topic and everyone in what chat make up their own topic you yeah. know the thing we're gonna yeah, come yeah. up to talk <laughs> tonight or afternoon whatever the fuck you are 
is different for the title. Yeah, don't worry. Even before you all started to do all this planning, it's always been the case. Like, you know, I can write about whatever. Then after that, we will talk about something else. Mm-hmm. Then, no, I, I can write about Ukraine. I put the title as something to do with the Ukraine. We, we can have the whole open mic almost don't talk about Ukraine at all. And then the next week, I talk about, I, I write something else and suddenly we talk the whole open mic about Ukraine. So, no, I'm so used to it already. Um, Wyatt, uh, there's a question in the chat. Um, what does Nikki say about Serski? Has he told you anything about him? Um, yeah, it, it, that you can it's, tell. He's not received well in Ukraine, just to put mm. it that way. Um, it, both, like, like I just said, civilians and uh, military are both like demoralized. Uh, because uh, he's seen as someone who uh, who stand troops and try to hold ground, and uh, of course, you know he uh, in 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 certain views, you know he he didn't win the battles, but more like the Russian retreat, and mm. uh, so he was in charge of the defense of Kiev and also you know the Kharkiv offensive, and uh, both of it the Russian withdrawal, and uh, the Kharkiv offensive, the Ukrainians take a lot of losses. They capture a lot of ground. So, of course, you no. Know, they give a pinch of salt, to be honest. Just to give a pinch of salt. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Because but not, in so reality. You're no longer, so, you're no longer a uh, Ukrainian. I'm no puppet. longer Ukrainian. Puppet. Him? Him? You. Me? You. Yeah. Me? What? Yes. Since when I'm a Ukrainian puppet? <laughs> We all know why it is on. I know. I know. I'm just. I'm just winding up. <laughs> Wyatt, you get paid by Zelensky, right? You you, you used to. Now he stopped. Yeah. yeah. But the reality is, you if you look you at know, the. I'm called. I'm called. I'm is not paying. Him, so, Zelensky need to fight some people. It's shame. He start with DPA. Mm-hmm. But but if you look at whatever is happening on the battleground, it doesn't really matter who which commander they you know take over. Uh, I think you can't do you can't make miracles. Uh, if your this is what you have, mm-hmm. you no. Know, so yeah, and the, and the Russians are not just well. Then just, then why don't we go ahead and start with Zersky then? Someone Since... someone someone is saying Toby is a Canadian, brought through the, in the, in the shot. <laughs> Later, he kicked you with his kangaroo legs. I tell you, <laughs> yo, uh, why actually, you know, you know, why nothing is changing because Sirsky was already the commander in chief of the Ukrainian uh ground Force, forces, right? yeah, he was already yeah. the 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 army. Of the army. Well, while so, Zaluzhny was of the whole army of the whole military, he was yeah. of the so I, so I was explaining, uh, I think in the comment, one of the people has asked. So I, I say that you no, know, there is a difference between the commander in chief and the com- commander of the whole land forces because the commander in chief handles the whole strategy and then uh, he will have to hand, uh, manage uh, the logistic as well. Uh, you know, the, the diplomacy, you know, trying to get more weapons and equipment, trying to you know, liaise with the different uh, forces and departments. His job is different from the commander of the land forces. The actual battle fighting on the ground is the commander of the land forces that is handling the fighting. So so there won't be a change because the the fighting on the ground is already so key. It's not really Zalushni that much. You know, Zalushni, he had to handle everything. You know, the Air Force, the Navy, he need to liaise with no, try to get the drones. Where to put the drones? Do they, they, need do to... they have navy? Yeah, they have. They, they have a uh, navy with no men uh, driving the ships, and then they will crash. Ah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, they do. I remember in Crinky, I think it's Crinky. Some of the marines don't know how to swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that is called submarines. They got those you naval, understand. those <laughs> naval assault barges and rubber boats and stuff. Yeah, they do have those. Apparently, those aren't really made to take like direct fire from like thirty millimeter cannons. I, I I saw this video. This guy's shooting down one of these channels, trying to get away, or or rotate is what they said. And and there's shit blowing up because they're just firing it at him as he's cruising along. It's hitting the trees before it hits him. And then he gets out in the open where they had a clear shot at him. They shot him out of the water you know it hit right behind him but the boat went flipping up so he went diving into the water i don't know if he swam away or or uh, drowned because he was carrying a bunch of shit but it was just like what was the fucking point of that it was like 
you're running the gauntlet with a rubber boat with a motor on it and there's dudes lobbing mortars at you and automatic cannons and shit like that. It's like, I hope they made it. Mm -hmm. True. So I can, can I so, respond to what Wyatt said? Wyatt, Wyatt you, you know, I think you make a good point. It doesn't really change a heck of a lot who's in charge of the, of the military. But the thing is, like, the, the situation in Ukraine now, you, you've got to wonder uh, who wants that job. Uh, after the failed offensive, the counteroffensive, it's a bit of a poison chalice, to put it mildly. So I, I, I wonder about the factionalisation of the military inside Ukraine. There was a an interview with Soldier X on Willie OAM that I think a lot of us have seen. And, you know, without validating his his economic opinions, he, he, he has some very frank things to say about the disintegration of the, the military command inside Ukraine. And I feel like it's getting out of control. And I almost feel like the commander of the Ukrainian military is, is in a very difficult place. It's, it's almost like he, he, he lacks options. He can keep feeding men into the front line, but he can't do much else. If he takes a step backwards, he'll be seen as a coward. He'll be seen as a defeatist. He may even get hunted down by the SBU as a, as a Russian spy or a Russian agent, but he doesn't have the capability to mount offensive operations anymore. Um, he doesn't even have funding. So he's in a very, very difficult situation. Um, and, and it makes me wonder what kind of man would have taken that job. Um, possibly someone who doesn't care a great deal what people think of him. Uh, I know that uh, Vidanov was, was, was asked about it and he declined it, you know, um, which was probably wise on his part. So I don't know. I, I I wonder about the situation in Ukraine. It does seem like it's disintegrating. If if what Soldier X is saying is true, and I think that there's I mean, very few options for their military. So I think I think yeah, one I mean, spot on. It doesn't really matter who has that job. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the way it's crumbling, and then you have all this uncertainty with the chain of command, and then the the outright fact that lots of people don't like him, including the military. And then his questionable tactics and, you know, getting all these people killed. I mean, there's really not a whole lot he, left he can do. I mean, he's, he's in the worst spot it could be. Nothing's going to change. And uh, I, 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 mean, want, I, want, I lost my train. I want to be, <laughs> anyway, I want to be anyway, fancy a little bit. I want to uh, you know, respect the finger. Respect the finger. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so I, I just want to update. You no, know, uh, when we raise a finger, it means we have a immediate response to the current thing that we're talking about. When there's no more finger, we can change topic or no go on the tangent. So just to know, so that so, so, if, I don't want the... it, so if I don't want the, the subject to change, I just keep my finger up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you can continue to <laughs> no keep the conversation. So anyway, I, I I just want to say the I I want to defend the skill. The, it may not be Sersky order like no his division to uh, order a defense of Bakhmut or no send men on the mid wave or whatever. It could be that he's just more obedient. That Zelensky wanted something and he he provides, yeah. which Zelensky yeah. don't want to provide. Yeah. No, which is where, where there was a clash. I didn't know there was. Or, I didn't know they have any. I'm gonna mute him. I I mute the point. So um the so no. There was these rumors about you no know, uh, Zalushni wanted the redrawal from Bakhmut, and then uh, Zelensky wanted them to stay. Then after that, Zelensky threw Zalushni and Sersky under the bus and said that no, no, my commanders tell me that they want to stay. It could be the case where Zelensky actually tell tell them to stay. Zalushni say no, Sersky say yes. Sersky say you know whatever you say, boss. You know, and then he he just follow through. That is what I'm trying to uh I I want to suggest possibility that Sersky is just you no know, want to. But more, more willing to please. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, Nunia. Just, just, just want to say something quick. Look at Prata and Joshua. Like twins, isn't it? 
And then I, I don't know like, who will feel offended. <laughs> who, who, who will feel more offended now? <laughs> Okay, not me, no, for sure. sure. I can't. Uh, it's, it's, it's a compliment for both of them. Come on, it's nothing. I'm not offended at all. It's a compliment, compliment for both. Yeah. <laughs> I really say don't go on a tangent when the finger is up. No, Nunya. Well, I just wanted to, to comment on uh, some of the previous comments that were made. Uh, I'm not so sure why that Sersky is look, willing, looking to to willing to please. I, I think he's just a career soldier and he's just following his orders, right? So, uh, you know, if the, if the commander in chief tells him to do something, he'll, he'll go out and do it. Uh, but with all of this, uh, leadership change, I'm noticing in the Western media, like they are really pushing these funding packages as if they're going to matter what, you know, one iota, like they're not going to get more men. They're not going to get more equipment. Uh, so it, it strikes me that. The reason that they're pushing, they've already got the 50 billion from the EU or 12 and a half of it this year. They're looking for another 60 out of the uh, US government, which uh, remains to be seen whether or not that'll get approved. I think I think they're done, guys. I think we're all in agreement that this this war is is pretty much done. And and Putin said as much if in the interview, which I'm sure we'll get to. But uh, the war is done at this point. I think that on the Western side of things, they got to they want to get one more tranche of money laundering through uh, before they give up, as, as well as there's the election in the U.S. in November that they're trying to, to get past. And, and then on the um, on the Russian side, they're basically, you know, Putin more or less came out and said, we're willing to make a deal uh, if you're willing to. So I think that the Russians will just hold and uh keep doing what they're doing but for all intents and purposes i don't think it'll matter one general or another to your points i mean uh you know it's over yeah i mean there's really not a whole lot they could do on the ground they're not going to get any funding in any timely manner i mean the equipment's running out the ammo's running out i mean there's discontent with the selection of their commander you know, he's got a bad reputation. You know, the Russians are applying pressure across the front and they can create any situation they want where the Ukrainians will come to them and they can just sit there and kill them with artillery or airstrikes or fabs or whatever. And they don't really have to expend a lot of fuel or men doing that. All they have to do is draw them in like they, they've been doing. I mean, they've got action around Kupiansk. you got little probes all along the above Kharkiv that are, you know, drawing stuff up there, more supplies up there. Then you've got, you know, what's going on around Chavis Yar. And then obviously Adifka, you know, and they've got to keep trying to play fireman and plug all these little holes. And that puts even more strain on guys that are already exhausted because they never get a break because they're always in contact. They're always under pressure. I mean, you can't even go out and get a fucking take a piss without getting jumped by a dude in a thermal blanket or hit by a drone. And then, you know, supplies are getting harder and harder to get. And then I'm sure no matter what the Ukraine, you know, SBU tries to do as far as suppressing Putin's speech, I'm sure a lot of them have probably heard excerpts of it. And maybe they're wondering why. I mean, how many people in, in Ukraine knew there was a peace deal in April? How many soldiers knew that? I mean, I'm just, you know... Somebody in in the open mic chat said, I think it was Jur, that you know Putin's speech might have been just as much for Western consumption as it was for Ukrainians, because that would be something hard to suppress. You know, like they can suppress war news and stuff pretty easily and keep it out of the news, but the speech would be everywhere. So maybe in a way he was saying it was a message to the Ukrainians, like you know, what are you doing? Look at look at this chance you had here. I'm willing to do this. You know, just take away the decree. I mean, I think in that sense, he basically put the offer out there like, I'll make a deal. But he knows the West won't make the deal. So he's going to keep fighting the war he wants. And when he wins re-election, I'm sure he'll stay on the course. Because there's no, he knows the West isn't going to come to him. So he made the offer. Everybody saw him make the offer. You know, if they say, oh, he's not 
he won't negotiate. It's like, bro, I'm on the TV saying I'll negotiate. You know, you have to remove the decree. You know, I mean, he. I just think it was a good setup for them to keep fighting the war the way they want. Make the make the disingenuous peace offer and keep fighting. Okay, Toby. Um, I was going to respond to Nanya saying, you know, it's done. It's done. I think, I think for sure the the Ukrainians are cooked in terms of being able to mount offensive operations, and it must be dawning on even the most uh, ardent Ukrainian that they're not going to get Crimea back anytime soon. But in terms of this war being over, I think that I've, I've been thinking a bit recently about the the way that we in the West look at this conflict. And I think that we may overestimate the amount of control that NATO have. And so we may overestimate the ability of the US to negotiate an end to the conflict. And what I mean by this is it seems to me that there's an argument that Ukraine has, is a failed state and like a really badly failed state. There, there, are, there are reports coming out about the corruption in Ukraine and the militancy of different factions of the army against one another, right, that, that suggests to me that NATO has very little control of Ukraine. They may have influence, and, and I'm sure that when NATO and the Ukrainians that are receiving the money stand in front of the camera, they all hold hands and they smile. But that doesn't translate into Ukrainian commanders in the field doing what they're told by NATO advisors. Now, I've dealt with Ukrainians, and, and Ukrainians are not a shy people, right? And they don't enjoy taking advice from outsiders, never have. Um, that's, that's not their national character. And I suspect that the proper description of Ukraine right now is that it is basically a failed state with warlords who are each running factions of an overall military. And I strongly suspect, I don't have any good intel on this, but I strongly suspect that NATO have lost what control they had after the failed counteroffensive. I've heard opinions voiced about NATO from Ukrainians which are not flattering, um, but they will still take the money. And I think that a lot of the hesitancy of the funding from America to Ukraine is not based on any fear of the, the great Russian army. I think, I think there's genuine concern that they don't know where that money is going. And, and right now inside Ukraine, the different factions, they can hear the music coming to an end. You know, this is musical chairs. And, and they're all looking for a chair in the post-conflict era. And you've got to believe that a lot of them are wanting to do deals with Russian intelligence to become the, the, the post-war power. You know, there's a lot of uh, um, historical antipathy towards the Polish. They're, 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 you know, you've got to believe that these militias will do a deal if they can. And so I think NATO probably wonder where all their money is going. There are staggering amounts of money going missing right? And, and that won't be lost on NATO. And so if they don't have real control and they can't see any capability for sustained offences, if NATO take the view that, that Ukraine is, is disintegrated into like a series of warlord militias, then this conflict is not necessarily over, especially if Russia don't want to take charge of that. So Although, although Ukraine's ability to operate as a cohesive military and beat Russia may be over, that doesn't mean that Ukraine gets peace. Because if Russia keep holding back and Russia don't want to win Ukraine because it is this failed state that's impoverished where everybody is left and there's no local demand to support any economy, then what you might end up with is... NATO pulling back because they don't want anything to do with it anymore and Russia refusing to advance because they don't want anything to do with it. And then what you're going to get is like a massive Gaza situation, right, where you, you've got this huge failed state with no real economy 
and it will be left on a form of life support from from the US and and Germany and that could go on for well how long's Gaza been going on so I don't know that the, 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 what's the, the alternative it's so easy you know well, the the alternative, way to thing Prada someone has to establish order in that country but and will Russia be able to be, will no, be able to order to see Will Russia be able to pay for it? Will NATO's, Russia, will, will Russia well, will willing to pay for it? So that's also the question. Well, it's not a question of, of paying for it. It's a question of laying down the law. Someone has got to establish order in Ukraine, right? And I think that this idea that the Ukrainians are going to fall into good order because they're getting a few bucks from NATO is very naive, right? I don't think that that's ever been the case. I don't think NATO has ever had anything but a dream of that. And I don't think that the Russians are going to be able to establish good order unless they denazify Ukraine. And what that means is they bring all the warlords to heel, right? They stamp out nationalism and, and virulent nationalism. That is going to get ugly. And I'm not sure Russia want that bag. And so I think that as long as NATO is prepared to fund the failed state, then Russia will just basically put up a defensive wall around it and um, leave it where it is. So I don't see any quick end to this conflict. But anyway, that's, that's my two bits on that. Toby, I've got a question for you. You know, you mm. talk about money, money, money all over the way. Yes. We, know, we all know how much these people in Ukraine love their money. Are they still get paid? I mean, the soldiers. Well, if their commanders aren't stealing it, and, and you know, the, 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 there are some black ops funding and, and, you know, there are reserves, and the government can always just print more money as well. But so, so it's not like they're going to fall over all of a sudden. But Ukraine has to import fuel. It has to import food. It has to buy things. It has to have a functioning railway system to distribute them. And from what I'm hearing, that's all falling apart. And so, and there's also factional infighting between the different army groups. So if, if the West basically washes its hands of Ukraine, right, which could very well happen. Listen, if the guys on Wall Street and if the guys in the Pentagon decided that this is a busted flush and that there's nothing you can do with these people, they will walk away. They don't owe those people anything. They don't care. They'll go fight a war somewhere else and make money somewhere yeah. else. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, and Russia won't necessarily step in. So, Look, yeah. I I know. Know. It is going to end up really, really fucked up, you know. Well, it is. Oh, okay, so you guys talked about two things which are very important, which is like the internal the internal structures uh, being more or less uh, destroyed, uh, going into a failed state. And this is very easy to happen, and especially the thing about uh, consequences, which I think will be inevitable. It's the, it doesn't matter who wins, which is a kind of war world uh, distribution of the scrambles that will appear, be it after or during the, the last days of the war, because if Ukraine stops fighting now, everybody will start uh, turning against each other. This is also, also actually a fact. That's one of the reasons, perhaps, why I think they are so afraid of frozen, frozen the conflict. And it, this, it, this brings me to the external part of this conflict, who is financing it. And I'll be a bit cynical. Many people, perhaps of you, don't know that a lot of the money given to Ukraine, it actually goes back to the US in order to finance those congressmen, those senators, especially the senators, in order for them to be kept on the, um, always on the top of the information about Ukraine and bring uh, their influence towards all the, you, you guys call it the deep state, whatever, uh, all those different layers of decision making that the US have, and they are not very transparent, transparent and that's where these guys actually have, and why Putin said, we don't understand it, how this will work. Well, it's many layers of uh, decision-making, and these guys inside of the Congress and inside of the, inside of the um, uh, um, uh, uh, other uh, structures uh, uh, know how to deal. So uh, 
this is one part of it. The other one, I think, and I noticed this in Europe, is that Eastern, Eastern uh, European countries are extremely scared uh, that the war is solved. They, they really, I think they're really scared about the paying back because there will be a payback for what many of these countries did inside of Ukraine during this war. They actually almost actively pay, uh, killed Russians and this can't happen. This has to have a consequences. It looks like the US can't allow other people to kill their citizens, also the Russians, if they want to project power, they will have to teach a lesson. And these countries are very, very uh, scared. I also noticed that inside, I, I talked to that provoking Andrew several times and saying that Western European countries are getting a bit um, fed up with all these uh, square mongering and these uh, uh, um, narratives from Eastern Europe of uh, uh, extreme Russophobic uh, uh, narratives. And I think we, we are start seeing it. Actually, Publico just uh, wrote down an article, a wonderful article, where it explains that the European Union, if it doesn't want to have really uh, uh, structural problems in the very near future, has to scale down the Eastern European countries in the way they are controlling the institution decision making, just uh, focused in Ukraine. This is becoming quite a, a conflict inside of the European Union. And so this is where um, we have this problem about financing. Uh, the countries gave that money and the European countries as well. They understand that they are, this money will go back also to the US if the US doesn't pay anything. They also understand that the consequences are very dear because as I, as uh, um, um, he was saying that this, uh, the warlords, the developing to warlords, the, 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 the complete uh, f fail of the economy and so on, this is quite possible. And it doesn't, it, it can happen anytime. Actually, it's already happening. Just the money is sustaining all these situations. Um, yeah, and this is uh, where I wanted to intervene. Is to give a kind of a perspective of what is happening on the other side, which at this point is quite problematic even if they said they were going to give the money. Go, Leo. Yeah. Uh, by the way, my voice is pretty sick since I'm sick and I'm 15. But anyway, I don't think that uh, uh, where will be like uh, the Ukraine would be left on its own with like as a failed state since for Russia, like, okay. Ukraine is, it's like a minefield, and it's its society, it's already failed. As partially as it is in Russia, it's the society had also partially failed. But in Ukraine, the, I mean, I I just know those people, and honestly, this society is really broken mind. But uh, the thing is. Russia doesn't want to like a terrorist state next to its borders and to uh, having a whole line of defense on its border, keeping the army because uh, even NATO, for NATO, this war had costed a lot of money. For Russia, it's also a lot of money. And to uh, it's quite significant for Russia because Russia is actually, in case of money, it's a pretty poor country. And our military budget is actually pretty poor if we look at the US or China. But as soon as this war, this proxy war for uh, costs more for NATO than for, our, uh, for us, it's pretty fine. This is what I think Russia is honestly waiting for NATO completely like. As soon as NATO is not anymore interested in Ukraine, Russia will just go forwards because right now we're just like doing those mid grant operations all over the front in Kupiansk, in Bakhmut, in Avdiivka direction, just to tie out the resources from NATO. But this idea that Ukraine gonna just left on its own and where's not gonna be Russia, I think it, it won't happen because like even Ukraine gonna get demilitarized. Uh, I mean, if you just gonna leave it, it's, it can still form its own army 
and it's it's gonna be aggressive state towards Russia and all of his hate is gonna even grow more and uh just leaving it on its own like R- Russia is learning also from other places and like what happened in Gaza we just got a state what had been left on its own like for decades what we did to Israel they attacked it R- Russia don't want to get attacked by Ukraine so like I don't think there's a way that Ukraine's just gonna be left on its own between NATO and Russia Go Vaz. Okay, yeah, okay, before we move to the new guy who introduced himself, just wanna let's do a quick quick introduction. Yeah, just, wanna say, just wanna say something to Leo. You know, you say Russia is very poor when it comes to money. You know, between all these countries, Russia is the richest one because Russia doesn't need anything to eat, doesn't need anyone. You go your everything. In the West, it's different. They need to buy everything. So Russia is pretty safe when it comes to being rich. I mean, okay, joy. There's it's like only system. thing uh, was in Russia. There's one really important thing. Everything in Russia actually costs two times less when in the West. Yeah. Okay, people don't need a lot of things. We have poor people also. But But that's that's the relation. You're gonna find people. poor people everywhere, you know? You buy with your money. I mean, okay, well, why don't we get back to Ukraine? Russia has money, yeah, Ukraine okay. doesn't. Okay, we got Von, it. Von, let but. just Joy introduce himself before we move on. Joy, are you there? We cannot hear you. There's no vo- there's no sound. You can hear me. Can you hear me? It's too loud. Yeah, I adjust it. It's too loud. Yeah, yeah, my is a bit. So yeah, I'm adjusting the volume. Yeah. Okay, first. You, you uh, see something? Yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. First, thank you for allowing me into the chat. Uh, I'm a big fan of Wyatt and his TPA channels. Uh okay. I've, Coming a bit late, I've, I've been hearing your discussion about uh, Ukraine, maybe ramp Ukraine. And maybe I'm, uh, uh, I don't know if you've discussed this before because I've just come in late. Okay, I'm looking at this situation. Uh, let's say Russia wins the high intensity conven- conventional war in South and Eastern Ukraine. Yeah, and they manage to hold it because in those regions, it's mostly ethnic Russians and Russian speakers. Now there's this question of what happens to West and Central Ukraine if Russia wins in the East. Let's say they roll up up to the Dnieper River. So there's this argument that, oh, we'll just leave ramp Ukraine as it is. Hungary can take the portion that was historically there. Poland can take the portion that was historically there. And uh, Moscow just finishes at the Dnieper, of course, take Kherson, on the other side. Uh, maybe my take is that it may not be as easy as that because one, the Ukrainians, we might hate the ideology, but they have been very, very tenacious fighters. We, I think we have to accept that. Russia has a five to 10 to one artillery superiority, but they are not, this is not deep, deep battle juggernaut like the one you saw in World War II, the Ukrainians are fighting like hell. And my fear is that even if Russia wins the high-intensity conventional war, uh, Ukrainian tenacity might result in a long, protracted guerrilla warfare, especially in, in Western Ukraine, where there are ethnic Ukrainians, whereby I, I think a good chunk of them hate Russians. And Russia cannot just leave with ramp Ukraine to NATO, yeah, to, to be a NATO outpost who can and have... Uh, the ethnic Ukrainians forming a guerrilla unit that can harass the new Russian borders. So how do people look at it? Will Russia have to roll over to Poland? What are the chances of a long protracted guerrilla war? And 
can Russia even win that long protracted guerrilla war? And for that, they might need to mobilize millions of troops to really deal with that. And is it possible oh. to, or really to be an Afghanistan, an endless guerrilla conflict, Afghanistan 2.0, Vietnam 2.0, which Russia in the long run cannot strategically win? I mean, how's that how's that going to happen when the goal of the Russian army is to de demilitarize Ukraine? So they're going to wipe out every military target they can until the peace deal's inked. Realistically, they'll push up to the Dnieper. I mean, if the Ukrainians want to try some guerrilla warfare, I guess if they can get across the Dnieper and into eastern Russia... You know, maybe they can fuck around, you know, with uh, the Odessa area. But, I mean, they're going to have all that. They're going to drive to Odessa. They'll look up with Transnistria. I mean, it's a suicide mission to go in there. I mean, the DRGs with professional SF guys ain't making any penetrations. Most of the time they get picked up and killed. You know, these guys that are going to run around and fight for what? You know, there's nothing left to fight for in the, you know, They'll probably just run away to the west somewhere. And I mean, the river itself is the perfect barrier. I mean, if Russia wants to, they can drop all the bridges. You see what happens when you try to cross a boat and the Russians can see you. There's no way in hell they're going to. Yeah, I mean, insurgency warfare after the Ukrainian military is defeated and the Kiev regime collapses and is replaced by whatever is, you know, there, it's more likely to happen in western Ukraine with them fighting over what's left than any area that Russia controls. It's not to say they won't get in there and do stuff, but it'll be very ruthless and efficient. Those people will be killed and hunted down. So it, it will be very risk averse to try to do that. And they don't really have to rotate millions of people and mobilize millions of people. All they got to do is cover the crossing points. You can do that with thermal imagers and cameras. And then you can just have a garrison nearby or an artillery unit nearby that just drops on the target that they see on the river. I mean, it's not going to be hard. Or you just send a drone to go kill them, you know, once the camera picks them up. I mean, it'll be real easy to keep these guys out. Okay. I think one of the Russians go when they say they want to dry Ukraine, they mean dry NATO. If you see, before everyone was chipping in, I've go like 10 times. I've got two helicopters, and now they are discussing between them what have you got to send to Ukraine? And they got nothing. There is no production because these countries in the West, I'm not going to say the East in Europe because they are irrelevant, but in the West, Europe, wherever the fuck are they producing, cost money. They ask for money. They doing this for money. And they're not going to they factories, they making like, let's see, they make plates. They're not going to turn the factory into a military factory like Russia is doing. So, so far, Russia is drying NATO. Maybe they got money, but they don't have the resource to produce whatever the fuck they need. But, but, but remember, you don't need a lot of high-tech equipment to run a, 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 an insurgency. Remember Afgan Afghanistan, the, they, didn't, they didn't have a support from any major power for the what? 20 years. That US, what about the what about United States? I'm saying like in Afghanistan, uh, just with, they even, they they even they, yeah, Afghanistan, they even made a move yeah, about it. Yeah, I'm saying the United States was there for Let's go and go to Ukraine. Is three. Mostly You're gonna flat. No. Joey, Ukraine okay. is most, mostly flat. So the type of insurances you are suggesting mm. are will just be able in the Transcarpathian, where they actually are also suffering with this Ukrainian nationalism. So I think the worst thing it can happen is insurgents inside of Russia, and like we have been seeing, and those ones you are right, mm. they are very difficult to stop. Uh, but the question is how long we are willing to support that as a revenge i don't think i hope that doesn't happen because i really hope that will come for peace deal where the u.s will uh will somehow um uh, can i say uh, decided also not to support where they will 
try to, uh, to to the U.S., they won't uh, support these type of actions, no? So like Putin said, okay. somehow it's like a war with, with CIA, yeah. But it's possible, okay. yeah. yeah. Not in Ukraine, okay. but... Okay, I'm putting this scenario. Okay, so let's say even the Kiev government falls, and then now Russia puts in a pro-Russian government. Yeah, you still have those banderists, you still have those neo-Nazis, you still have a lot of em embittered ethnic Ukrainians. And what I'm saying is that Russia cannot just say, I'll seal the border at the Dnieper, leave ramp Ukraine as it is in chaos. If let Poland, Hungary take their, their historical lands, if NATO is still there hovering around, let them remain that way. I don't think that's, that can work for, for Russia. That's, it's, it's just too unstable a state within its borders to be allowed to exist that way. So I think Russia, eventually, if there's no, even if there's a political settlement, if you have some diehards around there, they can cause a lot of chaos for, for, for Russia in its, within its borders. So Russia will still have to go yeah. in somehow. And what I was saying, you don't need you don't need helicopters, tanks, missiles to look at Iraq. Iraq was a flat land, yeah, but it gave you the United States a lot of help for a lot of years. And the Iraqi insurgents are not getting funding from any major power. So even let's say US abandons Ukraine, you just need small arms to conduct an insurgency. I think at some point Moscow will have to deal with Western Ukraine. Just leaving it ramp Ukraine as that is is, is just too unstable a situation for Russia to have near its borders. They'll have to go oh, in. When yeah. they go in, they might find themselves in a guerrilla mess, yeah, with a lot of ethnic. You know, a guerrilla, a guerrilla so, yeah, but Re Russia can Russia Ukraine. can play all that. Russia can play all that up. They're gonna they can seal their borders. I mean, what do you think? Because they seal their borders, they're not going to have people over there hunting these guys down, these Nazis down, these war criminals down. They're going to be hunting those motherfuckers. They're going to have bounties on those motherfuckers. They're going to send people in there to sow ethnic strife between the Azov guys and the regular army guys and the civilian. I mean, you could say it's going to be chaotic for Russia. Yeah, it might be to a point, but they can create way more chaos over there than than Ukraine can create for Russia or whatever's left of Russia. NATO can help them to screw around, but it's it, again you have to feel f filter all those assets and resources into ukraine whereas russia they can literally just walk down the fucking road it, is that guy a ukrainian is he a russian is he in is he as off is he i mean you don't i mean there's way more ways for russia to control the situation and exploit the situation i mean it's not like they're that far removed from the good old days of the KGB and shit. And there's plenty of old timers around. They can bring back the old ways to purify the new land and cleanse their problems away. I mean, it'll be bloody. It'll be ruthless. But I mean, there's no reason to say that Russia wouldn't be feeding these rivalries and these factions against each other to, so they don't bother Russia while Russia's going in there and, like the Israelis do and killing people. And hunting them down and imprisoning them. I mean, they got okay. lists too. That shit's not going to stop. Yeah. Most people are just basically going to go from a war to a supposed peace time where you're basically people. still being hunted down. And they're going to hunt you down with people. They're going to hunt you down by computer. They'll hunt you down with drones. I mean, there's not going to be any rest for these people that want to fuck with Russia because Russia is not going to just stop and let them regroup. Why would they? And you Remember can see what Chichenia? they've been doing in Zaporizhia and in Melitopol, in Kherson, and in the Donbass. They have almost no insurgents. Because they are the it's ethnic really, Russians. Very you see, ethnic Guys. Russians do not rise up against them. Well, but ethnic well, Ukrainians in Western Ukraine, that can be a very fertile building ground for an insurgent. They, will be, they, will be they might have local in. support. They will be closed in. You know, Joy, there is one thing. These people... Mm in west ukraine they are next to the people that hate them poland they're gonna have to fight these people as well because yeah, I mean, poland, western poland, 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 wants that beat. poland wants that beat and don't want these people there i mean think about it western ukraine is going to have a lot more problems to worry about than having yeah. time to fuck with russia I mean, because Russia can create really problems for them. Then you got to worry about what these other countries. Hung, what if Hungary wants the Carpathians back all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. you know, what if Poland wants reparations? 
I mean, it, 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 and the thing is, is Russia can go in there and encourage all kinds of bullshit and not even have to fire a shot. They can just go and encourage shit, encourage discontent, you know, whisper in somebody's ear, get them riled up. Van, it's not like that. It can just do what the way you're saying it. The way you're saying it, Van, is going to make chaos and it's going to even make it worse than ever. The first thing I'm going to say right now is that uh, it will be worse for Ukraine. That's about it. No, no, no. Know, it's going to be worse for Russia. Mike, if you Mike, have to, Mike, yes, Mike, this is the thing. This, the way you guys are saying it, you guys think that you are talking about over, overload. This is going to make things worse for the for Ukraine, Ukraine. I mean, for Russia than ever. Not for Ukraine. Yes. Let's first ask question. The question is that uh, we everybody keeps saying insurgent, insurgent, insurgent. Then he asks question: What kind of level of insurgent are we talking about here, right? And the third thing is that uh, when we're talking about insurgent, right? Russia has been dealing with a lot of insurgent. It's not new to Russia, okay? But some people keep saying, "Oh, insurgent gonna do this." Mm, they have a limit what they can do, right now. That's what I ask: What kind of level are we talking about? Are we talking about the level with uh, a lot of? Uh, power or just round up some people that's not gonna be happening the way you guys are also thinking about it because right now let me say one thing ukraine is completely blowing up right now and uh, most of their leaders are bailing out on the jets as fast as they could you see what happened to zelozina they are not firing him they are just bailing him out okay this is this is a system trick they are playing with the people there they are messing with the people's mind make it look like oh wow well this is a bad guy. They are firing him. They are not firing him. They are taking him. They are bailing him out. This is a contract he has. Bailing him out They're going to save his life. Okay? And that's exactly <laughs> what is happening. Soon, Zelensky is going to bail out because they say his time is over. So he cannot become a president anymore. No, what, what next is bail out too? All those smart, smart, smart ones, the ones that corrupt, they ruin the whole country, are bailing out faster than the, the people could ever think of. This is a contract the right. negotiation they have with them. Mike, Mike, did you watch okay. the interview? Did you watch the interview? Yes, I do. Yes. Basically, Putin say one thing there that's going to make all these countries fighting Ukraine just for a bit of land. That was Ukraine and the other bit for Hungary and Romania and whatever other countries. They're, all of them going to go there to pick up the bits they want. No, right now. And what they're going right to be now? busy. But, are, maybe, maybe, the maybe. Thing? Right now, right now, this is going to be a better, bitter on a Ukrainian mouth right now. What's about to happen to them when all those leaders are playing out? They will be more focused on be angry with those people than focus on the Russian. Okay? Because their anger is going to be toward all those leaders that ruined this country, that ruined the entire country. That's my, that's my point. All this destruction I mean, okay that's my point no ukraine even even polar come in fact like i said west had said something earlier saying soon they're going to be make friends with russian just to start fighting back the west for what they do to them they're going to make friends because you know enemy of my enemy is my friend <laughs> I, ca yeah, I, can't see, I can't see russia be friends with these people from west ukraine there's no that's way the best case scenario <laughs> there is no way <laughs> So we're doing the finger thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, Toby. Okay, so like if it's it's worth thinking about like how a peace would be achieved and what would be the terms of a deal that leads to a peace uh, situation. And obviously it would be a tenuous peace. I don't see an insurgency of Ukrainians backed by NATO against Russian forces, but I can see an insurgency of Ukrainian nationalists against pro-Russian Ukrainian politicians. Now, the thing is, the Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Lugansk have all become part of Russia. That has meaning because if, if a peace deal is done, and NATO wash their hands of Ukraine, they're still going to want to get paid back their money because the gift of money to Ukraine is actually a loan. And so part of NATO walking away will be an agreement that Ukraine will pay back what it can. That is going to put an unbelievable debt burden on whatever remains of Ukraine. And at the moment, that's not going to include Donetsk and Lugansk and Crimea. Now, the way I see this panning out in the long term, I'm going to look in my crystal ball, 
if I was Putin, what I would do is I would keep the borders as they are and I would let I would have pro-Russians uh, come to power in Ukraine as Ukrainians and I would let them have the debt burden that they have to pay back to NATO, which would make them all slaves in the worst possible way. I mean, they would be so poor because that debt burden is insurmountable. And then what I would do is I would allow any region in Ukraine that wanted to to have a referenda to join whatever country it wanted to. And very quickly, the Hungarian part would vote to join Hungary. The Romanian part would vote to join Romania. People would vote to join Russia probably in, in Odessa and in uh, Kharkov just to get away from the debt burden. And what you'd probably end up with is a bunch of nationalists in Lvov wearing an insurmountable debt and then you basically have the destruction of ukraine the dismemberment of it over time but it would be through the process of referenda and people choosing to leave i don't see a scenario where russia occupy ukraine and and then you know fight a hostile insurgency if they wanted to do that they would have done that already but I, I, when i listen to putin he, he's willing to make a deal and he wants a, no NATO in Ukraine and obviously he wants to denazify it, which means that it's got to be a Russian-friendly government, right? It's basically a client state. But, he, but he's talking about a deal and Trump is a deal maker and so basically Putin will say, well, what do you want? That's what I want. What do you want? And what NATO is going to want is their money back. So as long as Putin agrees that Ukraine becomes like the Rhineland in Germany between the wars after World War I, it'll be like Versailles, right? Uh, Ukraine will become a factory to pay back its NATO debt. And then I think little bits of Ukraine will just secede because that would be such a miserable future. But that, that's how I see it panning out. I don't see Russia marching through and occupying the country. I mean, I, I don't really think that any regions like from West would join any like Poland, Hungary or Romania unless they don't uh, give money there. Because this is why actually there's no more insurgency in like new Russian regions. Because Ukraine, it's a fucking poor state. It's a state where, it's, you know, like, on a city, in a city, on the streets, streets is actually deciding where, because, for example, we'll, I'll, I'll take city of Sumi, yeah? If you're there, not in a gang, and you're, work, and you're walking on street of, like, our street, and you're not in their gang, if you don't have enough good reason, they're gonna beat you all shit out of you and this pretty much a situation all over ukraine and those people are really really poor that they are ready to beat everything out of you just to take your jacket and i mean we didn't really went far here in austria at least but honestly if those country they're not gonna portray themselves. They're not gonna give this future, not this poor shit what they've been living all their life. And of course, there's gonna be insurgency. So for me, I look at it, at it in terms of scenarios. Best case you scenario. Know, mm, Joe, Be, can yeah? you just, you know, give some time to Joe? Because I think he's about to go to watch football and he really <laughs> wants to talk can you hear me okay yeah yeah okay no i think uh people are over maximizing both sides goals uh, i think if you look at what russia wants it wants enough of a geographical buffer and what the west wanted was to destabilize russia to some point where it could liberalize and get access to its resources and that's not happening so what does it want now it wants to be done with it and it wants it with a the most minimal liability possible. And that means their goals are intertwined now. They're, they come together. So NATO's more than happy for Russia to take pretty much all of Ukraine. And that way it has 
such a little financial and security liability with just having Kiev and, you know, Lviv, all that. And so that's going to happen. The hang up is the Nazis. And so what they're waiting now, what everyone's waiting on is the schism to happen between the Nazis and the, you know, non ultra nationalists. And, you know, until that happens, we're going to keep having this war. But that's the, that's the ultimate goal. There's not going to be some big insurgency because there's not too many, that many ideologues in Ukraine. The ones that are in power are just in power. And it's in the West's interest for those people to go away at some point, at least once Ukraine go, gets officially under its auspices, right? So I I think I think this is a, once it goes down, it's gonna be a lot more peaceful than people think it is. And it's gonna just it's just gonna be a flip of the switch. Yeah, I want to, to follow up on that um, that comment as well as one that Mike had said earlier about how uh, Ukraine would actually turn to Russia eventually to, to look for, for assistance. And I, I can see that happening. But more broadly speaking, we're already seeing it in the rest of Europe. I'm starting to see a whole lot of articles and uh, politicians a lot of them coming out of Germany, which shouldn't shock anybody. A lot of these articles are now looking at uh, shining the light on Germany and the, the failure of the German economy. And underlying that is the reason why the European economies are failing. People are realizing now <laughs> how important Russian resources were to those economies. They all get that now. So I think you're going to see a really rapid push. Forget about Schultz. He's done. Forget about what he says. He's done. Look at some of the other, though, uh, members of parliament within Germany. They're starting to speak out. You're starting to see a lot more articles in the mainstream media in Germany. Uh, I think they're looking to make a deal. And I think, uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of that this year. So uh, I agree with what Josh just said. I think it'll be a lot more peaceful than what people think. I think uh, Putin, in the interview, he kind of uh, set the table to say, you know, we're willing to make a deal, and but you guys, i.e., you guys, you Europeans who messed this up, you guys need to figure something out too. And what he meant by that was, what are you going to do about the uh, Western Ukraine? That's what I think he was talking about. So uh, I, I think that the uh, the ingredients are there for a deal for sure. The fact, the fact that they still are pipeline working and ready to go, and Sherman is not doing anything, means United States got something over Germany, because the economy in Europe is fucked up at the moment, really, really fucked up. And they waking up the loss. Yeah, they need to. They need to. And Putin just told them, "There is God for you guys. All you have to do is just say yes. We want to deal." And tomorrow you're going to get gas. If, if I may, um, what okay. I'd like to say is that I don't believe that Russia is going to go beyond where their culture extends. And that's their thing is that we, we're, look, we're thinking physical borders. And I believe Putin is thinking cultural borders. Where spheres of natural sphere of influence is already established, just because of the closeness to you, you know, and it, that's you know, United States trying to put influence, cultural influence in a whole another continent, is just a a failing prospect. It will never work, you know, because it's not natural to you. You're injecting something that's not natural to the region. The region has to figure it out for himself. You can't just toss something in there. And that's what Ukraine kind of became. And that's, you know, it's a hard, hard, hard lesson to learn, but it's true. But I don't think, you know, Putin's smart enough. Why would he go and try to subdue the West of the, of, of the Ukraine where their culture isn't, although the language is, but Russian culture isn't present and it's not wanted. Why would he want that headache? Why would the Russian people want the headache of having to pay to keep security forces in there constantly dealing with a headache? They don't. That's the thing. Just we need to start thinking of cultural borders instead of, of physical borders here.
I think. And I think that's what Putin was getting across. He also, he mentioned prior to the SMO and in current, during the SMO, several times he talked about nation sovereignty. And this is what he's talking about. The sovereignty, yeah, I, the sovereignty of a nation to choose its own path without the influence of money or outside sources. Because God knows what some of these countries could have become, uh, excuse me, could have become had we not foot stomped and stomped all over the place there. So we can't really even say that we're our way is best. We don't know. We just and walked away saying, hey, we just brought democracy to you. Well, that's not how it works. Hey, Prada. I would like to comment yes i think the we need a we need a deal because germany has been uh nunia was saying about some articles coming out and one of the things that actually won when um during the the new budget and the germany had to cut six billions out of the previous uh budget due to you know it's not important to talk about why but the thing is that he 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 was very he said things very strange and everybody thought like he's going to war and then some articles started to come out and we knew they are afraid that in in case the the front line breaks that 10 million people or more will run into europe we know that if they if this happens uh, not just you, uh, they would go mainly to Germany because it has been also Germany has been getting most of these people. Um, all other countries in Europe would close their borders because they will see the chaos that that will bring. That will bring German economy completely to down, and that will bring probably Europe uh, will destroy Europe in a way. But what I see is that they, realizing how bad that can be realizing how unsustainable it is to have a, a, a fourth round of uh, counteroffensive, that they really need to create a situation where this doesn't happen. So NATO needs, even with that thing about insurgents, the fear and so on, there is a much bigger fear in Europe that 10, 10 millions or even more um, uh, people would just try to run into Europe Afraid, running from Kiev because the Russians are coming, running from Lvov because they feel that the Russians are coming, and this will be and, and, and knowing that the, the Ukrainian economy is already, already um, extremely stretched, and then there is even something worse. Imagine all these people coming. Many of them they were in battle. They know how to use weapons. They would bring weapons with them. Europe will be like far east. It it will be wild wild west. It, it will be something like impossible to imagine. And even if things stabilize, you would have a failed state run by warlords, like you guys were saying. And these warlords would create a situation in the borders of Europe that is um, you, unsustainable. You. Criminality of all types. Hey, hey guys, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just follow up on Prada's comment. How are all those Ukrainian gangs in Western Europe working out for you guys now? Because yeah, I'll bet you there's be lots really of them. Bad. German. Yeah. Those gangs, those are really funny people. Those are really countries funny people. At risk. Countries at risk. German. Wait until, wait, un, wait until those gangs are now filled with disgruntled fanatic Nazis that don't have a place to be because the war has ended. Yep. Yes. How do you think that's gonna work out? I, I think it's not about even Nazis, since most of them just care about like. You know. I mean, if you talk you about know, average people, that you guy. Know, uh, you know, uh, reality, and and Russians have that, and uh, the Ukrainians have that very well done. Odessa is well known for at least four extremely organized criminal dynasties, it, and it, this is not the only one. It's everywhere. That's why. Whatever the European Union is doing or is trying to do in Ukraine, or uh, it, they will never manage. This is like a, this is a, a yeah. mirage. They think they can teach oh, the Ukrainians. They think they can teach the Ukrainians the the Western way of life. We could go a bit. Uh, we could go a bit further um, to the to, to the one... nations. The, the 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 building nations to it would, of Ukraine is based on the war on the criminal wars on the 90s and all the structure. 
all the economical structure, all the political structure of Ukraine is based on what on the outcome of those wars in the 90s. And this is not going to say the, the oligarchs, they don't have now really uh, uh, armies like they used to have, or in 2014, they still ha used to have, but they still have their contacts within those militias. Those militias didn't disappear. They are still there. Sorry. And I, I, I tell you guys, everybody, see you next time or later, if everything is, uh, goes well. Bye now. Cheers. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I mean, Hans, what is that, uh, the, the level of criminality in all of European countries that already, you know, went up because those people. Okay. What first happened time, the West is going to over, had money. over Ukraine like, to Russia. This is going to be the okay. only problem. Way to fix the problem is to hand it to Russia, just like the way Russia hand over Afghanistan to West uh, to America to take care of the problem. Because the problem in Afghan was so much for the uh, uh, Russian to take it until the American take over it, right? Now, that's exactly what they're going to do in uh, Ukraine. They are going to hand over Ukraine to Russian. That Russian, you break it, you take care of it. It's your problem now. We get, we have, we, we don't. So, because they don't, the problem of the Ukraine is going to become a super headache for everybody, not just for Russian, but for the West. For mostly by betrayed, betrayer, and how they mess the country up. The second thing is that they, right now, the country is over. Okay, this war is the Ukraine is finished. Now they are turning their attention. The West is going to drawing board. See how the what did they mess up? How did they allow it to mess up? Okay, and the people that allow the thing that the West do not calculate on this war is the China. Okay, the China. Is one that really, really make different for this war. The when the West was calculating, it, they thought, oh, where if you as long as the West, China did not give Russian weapon, they will be fine. But they overlook so many things, and the thing they overlook are the one that come back and bite West, right? Like a drones, right? All those things, Western completely overlook it. Say, mm, what is it gonna do? They yeah. start to see how effect of it, of, of it. Now they're going back to. Fight with China. Seven and days China ago, you said, West. Mike, seven days ago, you yeah. said the Ukraine was winning. What uh, changed? Don't was, yeah. Yeah, uh, I see. Uh, the, I Nunia, see. I said something funny. The way the war is Nunia, going. Nunia see, said something funny. Okay. He said that uh, Ukraine is over. And everyone started uh, uh, <laughs> projecting what's going to happen in 10 years when you, uh, when Russia takes over the Ukraine. I mean, it's it's not over. Let a let at least uh, let Russia take uh, uh, come at least to the Dnieper, okay? And then we can discuss this. I think we, you guys, went into the uh, ten thousand years into the future. I would say that. Okay? I'll be surprised if it's a year. Nothing. <laughs> well, okay, but I'm just wanted to exaggerate just as much. You guys exaggerate uh, possibilities. What's gonna happen in when Russia takes over? Or when uh, uh, Ukraine collapsed, Ukraine is not over yet. Okay, Nunya, Ukraine is not over yet. Let's discuss <laughs> the front line. Yeah, it let's, is. Let's it's discuss over. a little bit. No, it's uh, over. Maybe they didn't get uh, get the note. You know, maybe they didn't get the note that they are over. Maybe they, we should let them know uh, so that they can just uh, you know start insurgency already. <laughs> Uh, you know, if there was that a be, that, that's exactly what they are starting. So yes, they are over. It's like <laughs> what we're seeing right now. What we're seeing right now is basically no. Russia is letting the Ukrainian army come to them, and they're annihilating them as they're coming. Uh, but it, it's kind of like me and my, you know, me when I'm playing around with my with my uh, seven year old, right? Uh, wrestling with my seven year old, I'm kind of like, you know giving them the the sense that they're winning and stuff and, and that they're still in the fight, but, you know, really I can crush them anytime I want. That's what Russia's doing. That's what I mean by it's over. I, I don't mean that diplomatically it's going to be over, and I'm not even saying that militarily this is going to end tomorrow or even next week or next month or maybe even next year, but for all intents and purposes, they're finished. It's over. The, 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 the government there doesn't function anymore. Uh, Did you understand they don't have any saying? money. 
they don't they don't have any weapons they don't have any military like for all intents and purposes guys it's done that's all i was saying yeah, it's uh, sorry, completely, wrong. It, but it's completely it, wrong. Yeah, uh, that over can mean another 100,000 people died. At least okay. 100,000. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. That's Let's not over. Okay. Well, no, yeah, okay. but what are they going to do? Okay. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. It is, though, it is, though, because those 100,000 don't have to die because the ultimate outcome yeah. is the Ukraine is finished. So why continue to fight at this time? It's 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 illogical. And right now, when I feel I want to explain something, what what I feel that the Russians are doing on the front line to the to Ukrainians is something I, I was trying to explain, and maybe it doesn't make sense to other people. But think of it as a wrestler that's leaning all its weight on its opponent, and it's bigger than they are. It doesn't really physically have to do much. To put pressure on the Ukrainians, nor does it really have to exert a lot of force. Just by the sheer mass that's building up, the Ukrainians are forced to bounce back and forth, trying to hold the weight of the Russian, uh, some of the Russian forces back where they could actually break through, probably. But at this time, there, it wouldn't be beneficial to go to any strategic operational gain at this point. All they're doing is they're just making sure the pressure is still on the Ukrainians, that they still have to exert energy, logistics, men, manpower, everything is still has to be fed to the front because they have to keep it there or else it will just implode. I'll stop there. And, and just well, to it add doesn't that have many, to implode. I think just to add on to that point is. Um, uh, what what Putin was saying in the interview, if you listen to what he said, he's basically said, OK, we're how I read the interview anyway. And how I read what he said was basically we're pretty, pretty much OK with where we are in, in terms of uh, territory. We're going to give you a chance to get your shit together and come to us with a proposal. And if you don't, then we'll take action. But the way I kind of read into it was Putin was giving them one last chance to negotiate Odessa. That's how I read it. And uh, you can either take it or not. And uh, well, I guess we'll see if, if they take it or not. But uh, that's certainly how I read the interview when, when he was talking about that. The reason why Ukraine is in this fight right now, the West want them to be in this fight. And for one reason, one reason only, what I say earlier, they want to ground out all those ones that have ability to fight. They want Russia to ground them out. Because if the Russians do not ground those people that they have ability to fight, they have anger in them to fight, they will turn against West and they will start fighting West. So it will be much easier for Russia, for West, for Russia to ground those people down. Right, that is why they keep giving them a little bit weapon, not for them to survive, but just for you know, like they used to say, you know, you feed somebody to to be alive, not just to be wealth. Okay, that is what they're doing now. To they want Russia to grant them all out, because if the West, if the West stop today, those people would turn to West and start fighting West. All those Germany, Poland, all of them will be having so much insurgent than Russia will ever have, okay? All the way to wherever you are, entire Europe will be in mess, okay? So that is why they want Russia to grind them down as fast, as, as best as they could. So, and that's why they see pain, the, uh, they're still waiting for Zelensky to keep sending them, so that way they could extract Zelensky when the time comes, they already extract um, Zelensky. See, this is a system they play, this is a game they play. They are not fired, those guys. Every smart one are bailing out fast as they could. And this is what they do. They ruin the people's life. They destroy people's lives. But they are running away. Yeah. I think I think okay, Russia has the strategic initiative right now. You know, I look at this, I look at this uh, as a more like I compare it to the Great Patriotic War, in that after Kask, 
Russia had the overall strategic initiative. So the failed counteroffensive in Zaporizhia is like cask. Yeah. So Russia has a strategic initiative, but if you remember during World War II, even post cask the, the, I think the bloodiest year of the war was the last year of the war. Yeah, the Germans fought. They were beaten, but they fought fanatically and inflicted epic casualties, both on the Russians and on the Western allies. So I still think even though Russia has the strategic initiative, just like they had the strategic initiative post cask uh, there's still a lot of fighting to go on. And the Ukrainians have shown that they are unbelievably tenacious. Maybe to go back on the, what I was saying earlier, I still think even if Russia grabs everything up to the Dnieper, the, the ramp Ukraine, ramp Ukraine can start. The the people in ramp Ukraine can be doing can start initiating cross border attacks. Right, right now they are already attacking Belgorod, Kask. They're even reaching all the way to Saint Petersburg. So they just need a few drones, a few artillery hits here and there shooting them over the Dnieper, hitting somewhere in Kherson, hitting somewhere in Zaporizhia. And then now Russia will say, oh, okay, we keep on being at, having these low-level attacks. Let's send in a security force over the border to deal with these militias. And you know how such was start. They start to you, you bring in a few troops. The sergeants prove to be too difficult. You bring in more troops, more troops. It becomes a slippery slope like... The way the U.S. kept on increasing troops in uh, Vietnam, thinking they could defeat the insurgency. That's where my fear is. Yes, what you are talking about is the best yes. case scenario. Kiev government falls, like what's, Nazi Germany falls. What's the neo-Nazis the, 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 the neo so they had no power, so they just dissipated. That's, that's still that's that's far the in the future. Yeah. Yeah. That's too far in the future. Mm. So what's going on with the front uh, uh, right now? That, let's talk about it. Uh, what's important also, who replaced Sirsky as commander of the ground's forces? Uh, who's that guy? Because it's obvious uh, to me the next logical strategic step that uh, Ukraine should do in order to defend themselves is what Sirovik, uh, Surovikin did. They have to consolidate their lines and provide the defense. Uh, the, the Russians were in panic mode after the uh, Kherson offensive by Ukrainians. It was so successful, so they had to employ the um, Wagner to uh, uh, attract Ukrainian army into the Bakhmut, where they were like uh, openly, uh, 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 how say, uh, baiting them on to get to the Bakhmut so that the uh, rest of the front get a breathing, Russian front get a breathing from a, a possible uh, Ukrainian attack. That was in 22. So um, now they need a, a Surovikin who's going to consolidate the fence. That's what Ukrainians need. And if they do that, uh, then they can last another two years without any help from the West. Okay. They can last for another two years. Uh, I don't think. So. But what uh, when you when you yes yeah, okay okay. Uh, so what um, uh, Hitler made a big uh, mistake. It was they never consolidated, right? They never consolidated. They kept losing. They couldn't consolidate the lines, uh, and they kept losing. Uh, once uh, Russia took initiative, it was just kept going until they got to the uh, in front of the Warsaw. That's when they stopped. So this is going to happen with Ukraine forces if they don't consolidate the lines, as Surovikin did. Uh, they, they, they will keep losing. The Russia will slowly move forward. They have to do I it. Think, that's a logical step. If they don't do it, you know what's going to happen. That, that's what Zaluzhny would have done. Saski so would do the, the exact opposite. I think Zaluzhny was... That can is like is like von Manstein during World War II. He's a guy who you don't need to put troops in a futile situation. I think even the Zaluzhny was the one who was saying we, we need to withdraw from Bakhmut Ali. Saski is the opposite. Saski is the one who we don't Zelensky know. Is like we don't Hitler. know there's Pans. so much rumors. There was so no, many rumors. Yeah. We don't know what was happening, who was saying yeah. what. There is so much uh, propaganda yeah. going on. We don't know if uh, today the Sirski is implemented, as Wyatt says, because he is the, yeah. um, uh, the servile puppy that will do mm. anything was ordered. Uh, that even if the Zelensky wants to negotiate with Russians, 
um, and he orders it to Sirski, he will just follow up and uh, surrender, while uh, Zaluzhny will never do that. So that's a possibility, you see. That's what they, the Russians are discussing, actually. Just to let you know, that's what the Russians are discussing. Is Sirsky placed there in order to be a servile puppy and uh, follow the orders by president and just surrender, if that's going to be the case, you see? That's a possibility, cool. right? Because yes. that's what the Russians are discussing. Jordan, okay? Jordan, let's talk about what's going on in the front line. And I'm glad Von is here. So, Von, do you want to start with that? With what? What's going on in the front line at the moment? I mean, I was gone for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So, I mean, we could just, you know, there's nothing going on in Kursan. Robotny, they're getting pushed out little by little. I think they uh, took some more territory back out of the Robotny salient. I mean, and then, you know, you just got the pressure along the front. I mean, really, there's not the hot spots of Divka right now. I mean, you might, Kupians, and Sever, or that town out in front of it, at Severnersky, whatever. Then you got Turney. Then you've got all the pressure around Kharkov. And, uh, I mean, it, it's almost like this Putin's interview rejuvenated them in a sense. Because, you know, I mean, it's not like they're not, they're stagnant. But, you know, we know there's pressure every day. And then it was like, you know, they do the interview and all of a sudden there's reports of all kinds of, you know, little breakthroughs and captures and, you know, pushbacks or taking a key point. I think somebody posted in the chat that they're, for all intents and purposes, now physically in control of the road of death. So, you know, you know, maybe they're not sitting right on it, but, you know, they could throw a grenade from where they're at. So it's pretty much cut. But I mean, really... Uh, you know, you look at Seversky and his reputation, and then what's going on in Adivka. I mean, they should be leaving. And I don't know if they're trying to leave now. I mean, there seems to be reports that say they're leaving. Other reports say they're fighting and they're sending more reserves to the flanks to keep the keep it open. But it's getting to the point now, like even if you keep the opening, you know, if you keep it open up around the coke plant, it doesn't matter because they've already cut the city in half at that uh, rail bridge and the auto park. And now they're, you know, basically sitting on the road of death. So they've cut off the southern half of the Divka. So all those guys are, you know, they're done. They're trapped. There's no way to get out. I mean, I guess you could try to run out and, you know, if 20 guys run, maybe three or four will make it like they did in Bakhmut. You know, you see two or three guys. And they even and back then they didn't have as many drones, and they still hunted down those small groups. So imagine how much less of a possibility that is now when they have way more drones. I mean, there was, I mean, they got guys that got their own videos where, you know, their whole job is just to fly around and kill soldiers. I mean, they're specifically targeting soldiers walking around and shit. So it's like, how are you going to get out of there? I mean, the guys that north of the cut, you know, around the coke plant, maybe they could still get out. But they already said all that's under fire control. So even if they get out, they're under constant fire. But at least they have more of a chance to get out than everybody else. You know, and they got to be desperate to hold Kupiansk because if that goes, you know, Kharkiv's threatened, the whole Seversk front's threatened. It just creates another point to cut it off. But, you know, it just depends if they get through there or not. I mean, it's just one of those things. There's so many pressure points right now. Anything can go. Adivka's collapsing. So, you know, that's probably the biggest thing to watch right now is what's going on around there. I mean, but then again, you know, there could be something going on somewhere else on the front that all of a sudden it opens up or somebody breaks down and, you know, whatever. Yeah, Vaughn, I saw a video of a fresh soldier, Ukrainian fresh soldier. Is that a video just a propaganda or is real fresh soldiers ready to go to a to fight, you know? I, just, I really want to know. Okay, Jordan. I think you got something to say. Uh, yeah, I always have something to say, but I don't want to <laughs> disturb everything. Okay, Medi. Yeah, the, the talk talk about the front line. Medi. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on Adivka. I mean, if you look, 
that Vaughn just said is completely true. And you look at the only option of escape is to the north, northwest, which is channeling up to Orlith or Lutka, which I've mentioned before. But it's they got to go through what they have like five hedgerows and then it's all open territory that they would have to navigate to get back and forth from feeding into a deep gut trying to keep the southern section of it uh supplied with men bullets and bodies it, it's not they they're literally going to be a turkey shoot trying to feed it both ways and it's 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 going to be one of those things where you know the the, the russians it's in what we know about them is that they often will leave cauldrons somewhat open so small groups of men will filter out because they will pick them up later anyway so they let these small groups of filter out because then they don't have to fight them the idea is to trap the command and the equipment and make sure that they can't take any of that with them is one of the things they do but you know who knows uh you know cutting it off though it's it is done now like vaughn said it's how there's no way they're going to be able to keep a logistics flow secure enough to go back and forth trying to feed it to, to keep these guys supplied it's not going to happen i mean you know there was always rumors about how fortified a defica is and how it's got all these underground tunnels so i i mean i guess best case scenario is they can hold the gap open they can hold the coke plant and maybe there's some tunnels there that go all the way down into southern Adifka that the Russians haven't cut off or penetrated. And maybe they could do that, run, run it underground. But, you know, the thing is, you still have to get to the coke plant and that whole area is under constant observation and fire. So and then if you do get to the coke plant, it's not like they don't know supplies just showed up. So now they're going to be looking to see where the supplies might pop up. Maybe they'll start. I mean, it's just. I mean, the guys in the southern part of Adifka are fucked. They should just surrender, really, instead of dying, whatever's left of them. I don't even know how many people are even down there. And then uh, the guys in the north should pull back and try to regroup and, you know, conserve that force. But it doesn't sound like Sersky's that kind of guy. So, And they're going to lose no matter what. Even if they decided to pull out right now and withdraw, they're still going to lose a bunch of stuff because everything's going to be bombed on the way out. But, I mean, you sit there and wonder what they're thinking. It's like... The guys in the south are done. The guys in the coke plant could probably get out to some extent intact, you know, at least to get some of them back. But they're just going to sit there and then they're going to send more people there to try to hold it open when half the city can't even evacuate if they did hold it open. Um, I'm looking at the map right now. And there's something I'd like to point out. If you look at it with a little bit of distance, don't get right up on it pull back a little bit i wish people would do this more if you look at the russians on the uh to the uh south southwest they have hit uh by Severno. they have gotten to that waterway which acts as a natural way that the enemy now has to funnel because they're going to have a hard time trying to crash back and forth across that waterway trying to get there so now there's really even less room they can actually retreat through. They're going to be channeled between two water obstacles. If you pull back, yeah. you can see it. And that's where they're going to box them in. Yeah, and it's the same thing up around like Turney and, you know, and east of Seversk there. You know, if they can pinch those waterways, and they're not significant waterways, they're just small canals and little reservoirs and stuff, but they're linked together by, you know, little rivers or canals. It's like, all you got to do is pinch those off. All those guys are trapped. They have to get out of the area by going across these multiple waterways, even though they're small. That means they're not taking out anything heavy. It's going to be what they can swim across or float across on small boats. I mean, as soon as a pontoon pops up, it's going to get nailed. So they can't, I mean, like he's saying down there, Deepka, you, you, you pinch these waterways and stuff, and it, it may not look like much, but it, it might mean the difference between a bunch of guys running out with ATGM kits or a bunch of guys just running out with their AKs, you know, or if they have I, to leave the mortar behind or the heavy machine guns because they can't get across. If I may I explain mean, what, what, uh, Russian thinking, how they they think about this. This is I'm uh, uh, listening to some uh, commanders and all their uh, their strategic thinking. Okay, they don't think in uh, terms of the 
uh, territory, but in terms of uh, uh, trapping Ukrainians and destroying, uh, basically Putin kind of was already saying in this interview that's, uh, uh, that the demilitarization is kind of over, right? But there's still the denazification. Uh, because it's, I mean, how he can say that by, because it's such an overwhelming uh, force now by Russians over the Ukrainians. It's, or it's going to be soon, pretty soon. Uh, the the, the long-term strategy, how the, the, the Russians are thinking is uh, the first, after the Ukrainian counteroffensive, they uh, had to take initiative first, in the first phase is taking the initiative from the Ukrainians because in counteroffensive uh, Ukrainians had the initiative, right? And then, uh, so th by the New Year's, they took the initiative. And then in the second phase, which is now, uh, is supposed to be weaken all the front lines, uh, really keep pressure on everyone, exhaust them, all their um, uh, the weaponry, artillery, uh, shells, uh, the capabilities, right? To exhaust as much as possible and uh, exhaust the frontline units that are defending uh, everything. And then in a third phase, which should end by the election time in Russia, so that time should that those three phases should finish by the election time and uh, give give uh, Russian soldiers time to uh, vote right to join an election so that's when uh, when it should be finished the third phase and then uh, you know get, make some pause and get ready for the Ukrainian um, plans offensives that they usually do in a uh, summertime while the Russians are uh, offensively acti uh, active in a uh, winter time. So it, it's kind of almost agreed upon that that uh, period, you know, uh, and uh, but we don't know if they're going to survive that. Right. Uh, and the third phase is to really go and push breakthroughs and try to uh, get to the edge of the uh, Donetsk Republic. So basically to relieve everything behind the Slavians, Kramatorsk, all that line that goes down to the Bakhmut uh, of the cities, line of the cities, uh, chain of the cities that goes down to Bakhmut. So uh, that's kind of plan. Yes, it's in territory. Now in the third phase, that's possibility if they really exhaust them now in this second phase that might last another 15 days, maybe 20 days. Okay, that that that's the how Russians are planning the uh, strategic long term. I'd like to to I'd like to correct one thing though, and not really correct, but just just say something about it. It, it. Sometimes people say that the Russians just totally ignore terrain. That's not correct. They take terrain for tactical and strategic needs. They don't take terrain as an objective to maintain and control for any reason because their army is designed to go destroy the other army not necessarily to hold land that's the reason why you, you, you gotta you know i'm not saying you were wrong uh one of course it's just that some people think that oh no well they just totally ignore train that is not correct the one thing about what Vaughn, uh 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 excuse me <laughs> that Vaughn was saying was that um you know, by channeling these men in forces between these two these two water obstacles, it also not only is a great economy of force because now you're not firing fire missions all over the place. You have them in a the condensed area where your your actual fire missions are now actually more effective, killing more men with less less need of of. Uh, artillery so there's a lot of reasons why they they could they sh they would do that will they do that with the as their goal we don't know but we can only predict we don't know what their actual goals are so and that's all i wanted to say it's also a question I mean, of surrender honestly. i mean we discussed like six months ago like what would surrender look like for ukraine who surrenders how do they surrender and we say well surrender 
the military doesn't really surrender it's the political forces and if there's no path forward for the political forces to surrender they're just going to keep on throwing the military till there's nothing left how does russia take its advantage so play it to create a path forward for ukraine to surrender well if i can answer that like the thing is you've got to destroy the fighting power of your enemy and fighting power is a combination of like firepower and willpower and the thing is that the equation so far has been that Russia was fighting an enemy that actually believed that they could defeat Russia on the battlefield and that they could push Russia to internal collapse by defeating them on the battlefield. The Ukrainians up until relatively recently actually believed that they could take back Crimea. <laughs> this was the, the chat. You know, you laugh, right? And then I, I share your skepticism, but they believed it. And that's the point, I right? I know, I know. Right? They, they, they no longer believe that, right? The, the, the crushing failure of the counteroffensive, I think that it's actually felt much harder in the Ukrainian military than we even perceive it because the corporate media didn't report how bad it was. But from everything I've seen coming out of, of Ukraine, from the Ukrainian side, it was an unmitigated disaster. They didn't just lose a lot of men, they lost their best men, and they lost them in terrible circumstances for virtually no gain. And so here's, here's my point here, right? Previously, Russia was leaning on Ukraine and killing Ukrainians when they could and when it was cost-effective, but the Ukrainians had this willpower. They had the fight. Russia's doing the same thing. They're turning the grinder. They're grinding them down. But, this, but the way that those losses are being perceived now on the Ukrainian side, it's like, what are we dying for? What's well, right? the question? And What's so the every, surrender? Man, what, what does surrender look now? like? Every man that is killed now in the Ukrainian military is having a, a tenfold effect on morale because they're not just overlooking it and dreaming of, of the grand victory. Now every man in Ukraine is saying, I'm next, I'm being fed into a meat grinder. And that that puts unbelievable pressure on the political system of, of the, of the uh, regime. And from everything I'm reading, you know, this, this is what is going to push Ukraine into complete anarchy, if not surrender. Now, I realize what you're saying, David, you know, like the, the surrender has to come from Zelensky, but at the same time, Zelensky could face open rebellion from parts of his military very soon. And if that happens, I mean, let's let's face it, Zeluzny wasn't far off that. Zelensky asked him to resign and Zeluzny told him to get, get stuffed. I think he called <laughs> him a little beast from Kivarog or something. Like, you know, there's a l lack of respect shown. And I think that now because of the equation, because the Ukrainians no longer believe they can win, every death that Russia inflicts, every bit of pressure is psychologically devastating and that has a knock-on effect uh, on the civilian administration. So I think that collapse is coming rapidly with, yeah, uh, with that, without yeah. a change in tactics from Russia. Hey, I Toby, think he to also to go back to Adiska real quick. You know, last week or the week before they reported there was an M1 down there supposedly in the area. I don't think it was down there. I think it was just a stunt to try and increase the morale because if you think about it, everybody's like, oh, it's such a surprise. They just stormed into the city. We're getting stuff two or three days later. It's probably so much worse than we know, and the Russians are getting so much farther in. The Ukrainians pull a stunt and, and post a picture of an M1, you know, to try and boost morale because ain't nobody seen it since then and it ain't been destroyed and there's no whiff of it anywhere. So it's like, was it even in the area or was it just a picture of some woods with some snow and they said it was down there just to try and boost these guys morale. And at that point it was obviously over back then and we just didn't know how bad it was because, you know, within a few days all of a sudden they're just pouring through the city everywhere. Is oh, just, just to follow yeah. up on uh, Toby's comments. Uh, and then I'll follow uh, up on yours. Okay, sure. The morale about the uh, uh, the front lines and how bad it's gotten. Probably about a it's month ago, I remember seeing uh, a video of a, a female. She was a medic. 
and uh, she was on the front line in the trenches and she was completely done. Like she was just, the tears were going down her, her face and she was li live streaming and she was basically saying, I've never seen it this bad. She said, uh, we used to have, you know, we'd lose maybe one person every few months. She said, everybody on my team is dead. And she she was having a, a nervous breakdown right there in the trench as she was uh, streaming. It was probably about a month ago. And when I saw that, uh, just to follow up on Toby's point, yeah, I think I think uh, psychologically they are finished. Yes, Medi. Sorry, did I cut you off? No, no, no. I I, I just wanted to throw in there about uh, about Zaluzhny Zelensky, and that is the reason why. Vicky Cookies Newland shows up in Kiev because she has to make sure that gets resolved. And Zuzhny knows he has power because he's got military behind him. So she's got to come down as a representative of the U.S. government. Think of this. I want to ask you, what do you think they offered him to accept to walk away? Thanks. I think the reason why the Ukrainians are losing right now is because Please, Mike, don't. So the reason why is because Russia find a way to blind Ukrainian Please, don't. by taking down the uh, Baba Yuga, right? If you take a, if you look right now, all this uh, the way where you, uh, Ukra, I mean Russia been advancing, you notice one thing, you see how much Baba Yuga they've been taking down, okay? Somehow, somehow. Russia be able to get their hand on something they can use to pin down the Baba Yoga, right? Because that is when you blind your opponent, that's it. You're good. And now they could track all those Baba Yoga down and they could start taking them down. When they start taking them down, you see they start moving, they start to advance. Because the Baba Yoga is more, more, in fact, more valuable to Russia. I mean, to Ukraine than. Um, than uh, other, any other weapons they could ever get. This is the best weapon ever to pin Russian down to know every their movement after Stalin. Which Russia find a way to get that, be able to take down easily. And they still keep doing it. Now they will find solution to you know counter that as time go by. But for now, they do without the eye. And their eye in the okay. sky, it's, it, it's kind of true what you said. Uh, yeah, they made them blind, but not uh, so much uh, from Baba Yuga. But uh, yes, even though Baba Yaga is very important, uh, thermal uh, has a thermal vision, and uh, they can they can see at night uh, the every Russian movement. Well, how it happened uh, in that uh, how the Russians were successful in the middle uh, by the one fourteenth brigade. And to be able to cut this uh, uh, Avdivka in half is by uh, actually the Wagner forces uh, joined uh, 114 Brigade, uh, which is uh, the, the Donbas militia, and they were using thermal ponchos, uh, basically just uh, aluminum foil wrapped in uh, linen, just enough to to protect it, and that's what. Uh, uh, Russians started using en mass because it's cheap product, easily to to make, and uh, the, by help of the Wagner uh, members planning, uh, they actually all used ponchos and crawled during the night to approach uh, Ukrainian defensive uh, points in in, in that uh, northwestern corner of uh, uh, Abdivka and. Uh, in the morning, the other unit was uh, attacking, and while the, uh, the the Ukrainians were busy with those uh, looking at those uh, uh, units that were attacking, the guys from 114 jumped up from the hiding and overwhelmed them. There are so many reports from Ukrainian how they just showed up in front of them. They didn't know how they appeared, how they arrived there. They didn't know nothing. They just confused because the Russians were uh, all around. Uh, I mean, in between them, everywhere, between the houses, 
they didn't know where they're coming from because they used the uh, Wagner tactics. And that's uh, how they were able to advance over there by the Blue Lagoon. And then they allowed uh, other uh, Spesnats and other forces to advance forward. We've seen those uh, Spesnats um, a group, or maybe even Wagner, um, the group being uh, three of them being uh, uh, imprisoned by Ukrainians. Those are the ones that are uh, achieved that advance. It was it was just uh, surprising for Ukrainians. That's how they achieved it. I, I'm looking into the uh, details of what's happening on the front. I'm not spec speculating. Okay, this is the Russians' report, uh, all about how it happened. Joey, let me let, let me ask Von something because he brought up uh, the issue of the M1 Abrams. What happened to the challengers and the M1 Abrams? Why, why haven't we seen them being deployed in any major way? The thinking that what I've been hearing is that it's because because of the wind and the the spring thaw that will come, the, these tanks are too heavy to maneuver in the battlefield. Is that the reason why we haven't seen them? Because right now it's just leopards being destroyed all over the place. If, if I, may, I, I, can, I can tell you this right now, the reason why is because the Pentagon does not want U.S. M1A1 smoking wreck <laughs> yeah. on TV yeah. and on the internet. No, I'm serious. Yeah. They, they can't afford it because in especially, the Oban, especially that they've been destroyed by Russian yeah. weapons. I yeah. mean, think of, think of that. I mean, I mean, if you look at the challengers, you know, you remember there was a big explosion last year it looked yeah, like a right. nuclear bomb going off and a lot of people speculate oh. that that might have been the challengers ammo supply so they didn't have any ammo left so they're pulled off the lines because they, they don't have anything for them or whatever they got isn't enough or maybe they just you know they didn't have a lot of ammo they lost what i don't know two or three for sure so they just yanked them. Yeah, and the but M1s, I think they're saving the M1s for something else or a last yeah, defense. It's usually uh, British, you know, British they, tactics. They, they had British one. tactics uh, from long time ago is to let other forces advance. And uh, when they reach the city, like Paris, like uh, um, the Messina in uh, Sicily and all of it, they want to come in and be shown on TV, you know, as their <laughs> weapons, they're entering, they're uh, actually the main force that uh, freed the, the city. That that's that was why they were keeping challengers behind. They were supposed to be going last and take Tokmak, oh, breakthrough. you know, oh, and, yeah. and gave, give that presentation of the freedom, you know, create, creators. And, so and on. another what, another thing with the M ones. Uh, go the, ahead, Maddie. But the one thing about you know, I want to I want to say is that the Russians train to fight in all types of weather. The, there is no operational pause in their head because it's raining out. There is yeah. there is battlefield reality that they must deal with, but it doesn't mean that they will not fight because if you think about it. The mud does not affect both sides at, at the same level. Russia has a huge advantage in tracked vehicles. That means that no matter how, how bad it's affecting them, it is affecting Ukraine probably 70% worse. And they're retreating in mud, which if you read uh, World War II, the Germans even speak about it. It was, it was very tiring for their, their forces to retreat in mud. Not only that, it also requires a lot more fuel and bangs up more on engines and all that shit, yeah. as you would expect. Jesus, jet fuel. Okay, before we move on, we go a new guy here. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. Right you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 I'm Mohul. And um, I'm from living UK. I'm from India, though. So yeah, this is the first time here to meet you, the guys. Like I've been mean, follow following up your your online chat. It's pretty interesting to talk about this topic, especially about this current geopolitics. It's very hard time to find someone to talk to about this kind of geopolitics of the current event. You know, and it's nice to like you know to get along some people from different countries and uh, yeah, sharing information. 
nice to meet with y'all guys yes nice to meet you too god save the king no but i was just gonna say one more thing with the m1s is you know i just figure they don't want to risk risk them they're, they're there for a reason and it's not just to go piecemeal into something and they might be hesitant to put them out there because they don't want one captured or maybe they don't trust the ukrainians yeah. not to Right. lose one you know mysteriously <laughs> and then you see it on russia tv in perfect condition i mean they're around it's just and their ammo is probably good because they don't use the same ammo as the challenger it's just i mean and there's really nowhere where they're going to do anything right now i mean there's no tank on tank battles that's what it was built for it's not it doesn't have any rounds to sit there and lob artillery like the russians do so I, I figure they're hiding in Kiev or Kharkiv because you could just park them in garages and hide them. And, you know, if, if something happens, maybe they'll send them out then. But, I mean, that if they that, find them and get wind of where they're at, they're going to bomb the living shit out of wherever that spot is. And you'll probably know something was up. But well, I, you know, I think they got them scattered around. Like that, that one in the deep guy, I think that was just a publicity stuff, maybe to boost morale. Like, oh, the other ones are coming. Because no one ever saw it again. It, 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 there's not mm. a footage of it driving somewhere else. There's no drone footage of it. You know, it was like a random video of it driving through a snowy field in Ukraine during the winter. There was some PR shit. There, um, there's a there was a great comment in in the chat, and it was by Logazin A. And what he said was, and you know, I never we I've never really thought of this, but until Ron brought it up a while ago, they could have been destroyed behind the lines. We don't know mm. what was hit in some of these warehouses and stuff. What if they found out where, like where the underground motor pool was for these things? I mean, you, yeah. you can spread them out, but you can only spread them out so far because you don't have the logistics to support one that's over here, one over here. They got to be kind of centralized. Yeah. Maybe they've already been destroyed and that's the reason why we don't see them. Yeah, I mean, I hate, I'd hate to think that, but that's entirely possible too. You know, maybe that one is the only mm -hmm. one left. That's but I mean, yeah. you've seen some of those warehouses get hit and, and just explode, and who knows what the hell was in there? And no one's showing video. I mean, if there was burned out M ones in there, they ain't gonna let no motherfucker walk by with a cell phone and take a picture. So <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, I hate to think that, but Medi's probably closer in reality to the truth, maybe than we want to believe, because. You know, it's like the that big explosion and the challengers just disappear, you know. And then the M1 gets seen a few months ago, supposedly somewhere in western Ukraine. Then they show a video of it driving around in the snow. But, you know, where are, where's the other ones, you know? Maybe they yeah, need I to get think blown. That, I think it was a PR thing. You know, they're retreating mm -hmm. from Avdeevka. They got to have – they got to show something. They're like, oh – we have well think Abrams about it. you got an coming. M1 tank holding the holding the gap open for you, you know, fine yeah. the wonder weapon. You know, maybe Something that's like what they that. were going for. Because obviously yeah, we haven't seen really it again. On the, we saw it one time and that was it. I think that you guys are spot on with the uh, reason why we don't see a lot of these Western weapons go out there is because the leopard had its reputation dragged through the mud. And I don't, I don't think the Abrams is a, that much of a better tank than the Leopard. So that's what's in store for Abrams as well. I mean, it doesn't matter how quickly you can retreat if you can't even get anywhere in that mud. You know, you're just a sitting duck. You're just a target. And I don't so think that the Abrams yeah. just wasn't designed for Ukrainian mud from the ground up. Mm, yeah, that's not what that tank is designed to do. It's not designed... <laughs> Which is it, it's designed for all the weather and stuff. It's just there's obviously going to be more difficult mud than other mud. I mean, it, you know, the they're obviously going to try to plan their operations around to not get into these obstacles and stuff. The, you know, yeah, it's debatable to say if how well it would do. But I mean, from what I've seen, I wouldn't take those fucking things out in the fucking cornfield. The the M1 was designed to replace the M68 three I commanded mm. in NATO. It was where it was originally designed to fight, but it was designed to fight in a different way. And that's the problem is that in what you're saying about its weight, its height, all of it is true. It affects it in the mud, but it was not really designed to be an offensive tank. It was designed to be a, de a, defensive, ta a defensive tank that would be fighting 
incorporated within NATO defensive lines. It was not supposed to be going charging out front and running down, um, running down. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I disagree. I think it's it's both. I mean, it's fast. It doesn't it's agile. It's got stabilized gun. It was it, it was designed it to fight the NATO doctrine with massive amounts of artillery yeah, and air Vaughn, support as it you're, maneuver. Talking, you're looking at it, Vaughn. You're looking Vaughn. at it in terms of like, can the tank? Uh, make this kind of advance at speed through this kind of terrain? Sure, but there's a lot of other things that go into that. What about logistics? What about well, after oh, you do charge there and you take the position and now you're going to have to do some maintenance on the tank and it turns out you need a super specialized, I don't know, part oh, well, or something well, like that. The problem, the, problem is, the problem with it is is that oh, fuck. I'm sorry, Vaughn. Go. Yeah. It's designed to, to fight in the doctrine of NATO, which is maneuver, which can mean moving forward or falling back and trading space for time. But it's all about maneuver. That's why it's a fast tank and it's heavy, but it's because of the armor protection. It's designed to but work it's, on it's a fast tank and it, it, would, it would perform well in Europe. I mean, that was where it's designed to fight. It's just like any other tank, even Russian tanks get stuck in the mud. So mud is mud. I mean, and their tanks are probably 10 to 20 tons lighter. So, but they, they have to go through those areas because maybe there's minefields on the road. So they have to try and get through there. Same with the M1. Right, the M1 was fucking designed to run on the NATO road system. It was not designed to go forward into attack. It Can doesn't have, it does, it doesn't have the operational range to do extended missions out into nowhere because that would require a huge logistics uh supply line right behind it just to try yeah, to but they would easily they would take an objective they would pick an objective within the range of the tank and then attack it yeah they would just, just adapt their tactics to that they're range. not going to go run 400 miles willy-nilly you can't leave it out there they don't they don't work like that. They they go out and they have to be forward too. And if you don't have, you can't run more than eight hours. We're not talking miles. We're talking fucking hours. That it that limits that tank to how far it can go and what the fuck it can do. I mean, it runs out of yeah. it runs out of fuel just sitting there. Trying Maybe to it can sprint pushing. very. It can do the the four hundred meter dash very very well. But then after that, you're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna drag the Gatorade up to the freaking marathon runner, and that marathon runner takes a lot. Uh, I mean, of I don't know. I was on an M1 tank, and we didn't seem to have any problems doing that. Now, obviously, in a combat situation, it would be different. But I mean, look at Desert Storm. We had forward position farps. The tanks drove to the gas, gas station, got gas, and kept on going. I mean, there's any this. number of ways that that situation could be dealt with with logistics. You could pre-position stuff forward like they did in Iraq. They had fucking okay. fuel bases set hundreds of miles forward of the enemy lines, behind enemy lines, and they swung up into it and what refueled. About Does, doesn't the M1 use – I don't know about this. This is where I've read before, but doesn't the M1 use um, specialized fuel? And also, no, it's, it's a multi fuel engine. It can run on gasoline. It can run on diesel. It can run on JP4. It can run on whatever else. Now, the okay. different fuels might cause it to run less efficiently, but it can burn all the fuels. So, right. gasoline's right. not a problem. I mean, I could drive up to a gas station in Russia and, and tap on the, you know, get it filled up with diesel, and I'm good. Or if all I right. wanted to, I could fill it with auto gas. It'd probably run like shit, but it's still running. Well, it might require some different kind of maintenance because you might have to clean out the fuel lines and shit because it's not burning the same but yeah jp4 is the best because that's you know air aviation fuel for a turbine but i mean there's any number of ways that can be dealt with i mean it's it's, it's not that i'm discounting what anything that he's saying it's just you know they they have ways of doing that they if they're going to move up they're going to have the support there you know if they get lucky and break through then they'll figure it out you know i mean but they're going to have gas and the, the guys driving and stuff they're not going to drive until they're empty they're going to stop and lag, or if they can stop, they're going to get out and check the tracks, tighten bolts, you know, maybe do some quick maintenance if they have a few minutes and keep going. But, I mean, it, it just depends on what they're going through. I mean, if they're driving along, getting hit by artillery, there might be shit that gets fucked up they can't fix, like a site or something. But maybe the, all the tracks are still operational and they drive, but maybe you can't use your laser rangefinder. Maybe the thermal's busted or something. But, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out. I mean, that kind of shit has to be fixed, but... 
a lot of those parts are component parts that they could literally unbolt and bolt back on. So in that sense, it's a fairly quick fix if it's something like that, but it just depends on the damage and it depends what they're doing. But realistically, they, they would operate within the range of their ability and then they would have fuel and all that. And of course you have to factor in the Russians are going to be bombing the shit out of the fuel convoys and the depots and everything else. So, it, it would just be like anything else. The Russians would have the same problem doing the same thing because we would be attacking their fuel trucks and their fuel depots. So they'd have pr problems fueling their tanks. So in that sense, it's, it's really the same for both sides. The only difference would be is, you know, Russia could probably flood more air in quicker and do more damage up front maybe. But, you know, if it was a, par a parody in the air, then, you know, both sides would be destroying shit. Both sides would be trying to get gas and ammo. But the the one thing, and I agree with everything you're saying, Vaughn, and I know I got to hear you. I know you know your business. It, it, it's that as a tank commander, though, sitting there looking that I have an oper operational range of hours, not miles, would be a constant thing I would have to be managing all, for, like, just sitting. How long do I let the system sit? without the engine running? Do I let the battery run down? Do I restart it? When do we restart it? Are we doing a tactical restart? All that shit. You know what I'm talking about. And you're, you're right. I mean, it, it, they, we can pre-position it, but it, we've, we, we kind of, that, that thing though, just to me, because I'm old school, it limits it so much because it's like being in a plane. You can only go so far before you have to return or you can't get back at all because you don't have the fuel, you know, so that that's where I was coming from. But Vaughn made some really good points. Yeah. So basically, if they were to take the Abrams out, of course, they would uh, plan around that that platform and have uh, what they would require in order to make effective use of the platform, which makes sense. Well, the other thing is, too, is they're operating a platform outside of what it was doctrinally made to do. I mean, they're not going to support that properly with the logistics and the aircraft and the artillery. And and everyone knows once an M1 shows up, it's priority number one because it's got like a $150,000 bounty on it. So everybody's going to want to hit it. And that's the thing. Once they pull them out, you're going to see them or you're going to see the logistics footprint. And then they're going to be it's going to be game on. You know, are they even going to get to the fight? I mean, there was a story back before Robotny started, and I think it was uh, Leopards with, uh, I don't know, maybe the 47th, I don't know. It was one of the brigades that got wiped out 20 different times. Yeah, 47th Mechanist Brigade, yeah. Yeah, and they, were, they got hit by artillery, and they lost the majority of their vehicles, and they were 21 kilometers from the line of departure into Robotny. So, I mean, who knows what's going on? But that's the thing. Once those tanks show up, it's, it's fucking game on. I mean, they got AI... Uh, Drones, where the Lance drones now that can fly 70 kilometers and, and they fly in all weather. I saw a motherfucker kill a Paladin, which is a self propelled artillery piece, in the middle of a fucking blizzard. The other one was flying above it in the blizzard, filming it, and the fucking Lancet went in there and blew the shit out of it. So they have That's all weather present. capability. They have AI on these drones. I mean, once those M1s pop up, it's, it's a free for all. I mean, for who sure. knows? The Russians might have to give orders for dudes to chill out. So they don't fucking get killed trying to get fucking paid. Let me let me let me ask something. We'll say there were thirty thousand tanks hit that day. Every guy that's fucking <laughs> made saw that the uh, M1 was credited with the kill. Yeah, I mean, think about it. They're going to be fighting over that shit. The drone operator that saw it's going to hey, want to cut of the action. Hey, Ron, the can you give a word to the someone else, dude. Uh, please? One. Can you give a word to someone else? Uh, you discussed uh, M1 for half an hour. Okay. Uh, We're well, good, man. We can move used. on. Well, we can move on. What do y'all want to do? Andrew yeah. seems to have a question about tanks too. No, I just wanted to say it. It, it seems like you assume Ameri uh, Ukrainians are uh, uh, creatures with uh, a brain, um, and that they will will uh, do everything they can to uh, assure that uh, their Abrams are used effectively. That is, in fact, not the case with the Ukrainian army. Uh, it seems that they have been using all pieces of Western uh, equipment in the, not only in a, in a wrong way, in the complete, completely wrong way. 
Uh, we've seen how they ch they they used leopard to fucking charge <laughs> on a charge towards Rabatine, hoping they would get throw. You you you, you, you must remember that, of course, Bradley uh, Vaughn. You, you remember the images we saw. You remember the the Bradleys opening fire at the tree lines, hoping to hit the uh, the Russian ATGM crews, but instead even even hitting each other in certain cases. I I saw that. That was hilarious, actually, and. I don't think I don't think you, uh, Ukrainians are simply used to that kind of of, of warfare and to the warfare Western equipment is 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 uh, aimed for. Uh, they are used to tanks that break down and that you can fix them easily even in a fucking garage. You know, have you ever seen, if you saw that video of that Russian soldier talking about the Soviet equipment? Uh, they're not used to such. Uh, sophisticated equipment that that needs such care and such cure in its usage that's my opinion at least okay if we move on from the technical if you get back to the strategic aspect and you know possibly like the day after thoughts on it does russia are they adapting their current strategy based on the predictions of the day after like you mean god forbid you think what's happening in israel like all they focus on is the day after where they're not even really focusing on what's happening today because they're so you know basically like after we win what are we going to do in the political but like is russia have that day after strategy uh is it possible that russia wants to slow roll it or that they're looking to uh you know, meld some sort of ground victory into a political victory or they're looking you know at uh geopolitics and how they played in terms of the west uh, you know, maybe it's better for Russia to drag it on for another few years to further weaken the you know, the West. Well, what Paul Clausewitz says is that the longer a war goes on, the more both sides' goals change. So that it doesn't stay the same. If the war goes on for another year, the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Americans are all going to have new set of goals and new new things that they're going to try to see if they can accomplish. So, at least in territory. Um, I mean, if the border well, territory-wise, and also like how the war is going to end, right? For example, we don't really see Ukrainians talking so much about we're going to take Crimea back. It's sort of settled in that probably, probably not for a long time, at least, you know. So that's kind of not really talked about so much at the higher, uh, like maybe Zelensky might say something, but for the most part, they kind of get it. So, I mean, the, the goals of the war have changed, you know. Now, if they could get the same deal that they were trying, that the Russians were offering them in March and April of 2022, they'd probably go for that deal. But they can't because the Russians' goals have changed as well. So as, as the war goes on, you're going to constantly get the changing, shifting goalposts for everybody involved. I think, I, I think they're looking for political victory. You know why, like, like for instance, you know the the, the 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 mobilization what they had the partial mobilization, it, it was a bit of a difficult to uh, or to say, like publicly wise it wasn't that popular, and uh, and then they have mobilized at some level of um, soldiers like they have like six hundred thousand soldiers now, or they're gonna fight with it, but they have a trouble to mobilize more than that. I think I think they are fixed to it, and, and they're using another six hundred thousand for re rotating it, but to to occupy the territorially. They need they need more soldiers. They need like two to three million soldiers to do that because Ukraine is huge. So they're trying to like decrease the morale in a, in the Ukrainian side, you know, in the public side, and trying to get some political concession and uh, win politically, than territorially. And 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 after when they have negotiation, they might ask for territorial uh, session. But until then, they're gonna just keep on grinding on, keep grinding them, grinding them, keep them keep winning a slow victory, a small territory wise. And at some point, you know, they're gonna have a low morale and, and and somehow they'll push politically to come for negotiation. And during negotiation, they might have a now they wanna ask for more ter territories. They may they may ask for to have a land route to Transnistria or something like that, you know. So yeah. That's well, what you know, are they gonna they already present the presented are they, they gonna build the state it? where where they're gonna the occupy or annex the territory was... told or they're gonna spin it off. Are they going to try to you know, make it a spin-off in the Denex that the territory then have them raise up their own military, or do they feel they have to occupy all the way to the Dnepro? Okay, I so I, I was about to present it. What uh, what Putin was doing, 
in the beginning uh, he wasn't presenting any territorial or political goals just uh, the uh, demilitarization and the denazification which is the most complicated explanation but uh, that, and then he was offering uh, the uh, the the western ukraine to poland uh, uh, romania uh, hungary right but now we see the change as you said the San, what Sun Tzu says as uh, war progresses the goals are changing so now he's uh, offering guarantees of territorial integrity of U U ukraine that was a few months ago it was saying only russia could have offered the uh, uh, guarantees of territorial integrity because the western friends are are uh, salivating over the western ukraine so that's what he was saying and now they were presenting the 150 kilometer uh, the buffer zone from the present R russian territories which include uh, luhansk donetsk zaporizhia kershon right now he's saying it has to be 150 buffer zone from that border that's what he's saying now and saying no we're not gonna let anyone come in ukraine so he's aiming for uh, whole ukraine now uh th that's what i can read from this last uh, uh last uh, interview with carlson He's aiming for the whole yeah, Ukraine. But it, all, it's all a negotiation. That's, it's all on because the, that's all only, all the negotiation. only way. That's the only way to denazify de Ukraine. Hmm. That's what I was seeing. I think there's a lot of stuff on the negotiating table. Even even uh, if you look, with listen to Putin's uh, with discussion. The, in with Americans, uh, not with Ukrainians. Speech, he's, he was saying that um, uh, even denazification was on the table. The Ukrainians were willing to totally put not just neutrality, but they were willing to discuss denazification. And I think he even clarified the like that they're not gonna not the non uh, glorification of banderism and all this other stuff. So the Ukrainians were willing to put a lot on the table uh, for that for those negotiations at first too. I think that the Russian plan really did scare them. It, it really did almost work. Um, and I. Even now, throughout that interview with Tucker Carlson, who mentioned several times that he was still open to negotiations, you know, and he was like, after you guys lied to me, you know, it lied to us several times, multiple times, you guys are going to have to show us some goodwill gestures, you know, but it's even he re recognizes this still ends in negotiation, you know, it's, it's if if war is politics by other means to bring up Clausewitz again, I guess. Was that yeah, that Russia's Russia's is slow play, Russia's slow playing like its hand on the battlefield that you know conceivably they could start uh you're rolling forward to the Dnepro taking more territory, but there's no advantage to doing it, so they're just gonna slow play and do the meat grinder, push the line tiny bit, solidify it so that it can't be taken back. Yeah, if it's not about land, if if it's about the, the political goal at the end, then the way that you achieve that. It's not by getting up to the Dnieper and then maybe having to back off and then getting there again. I, that's that's maybe that looks good on a map, but it's pretty clear that the Russians don't really they didn't never paid that much attention to the propaganda wars. You know, they're not. It's not their forte. They can't do it like the Soviet Union did, I guess. So does nobody does it as well as we do. Russia's advantage to slow play it. Well. It, it, there's no reason for them not to do it, right? It's like what Medi was saying. If you're just a, a bigger wrestler, you, all you have to do is lean on the smaller wrestler. Eventually, that's your gravity is going to tire them out for you. It's just going to. Why would you exert yourself, to pull a tendon somewhere if you're just going to if you're just going to suffocate this guy slowly until he gives up, until he taps out? Which, you know, the Ukrainians don't want to do it, but eventually. Um, you put enough weight, you put enough pressure, something's about, to, something's going to happen. Something's going to break somewhere, you know? I think that's how the Russians look at it. Like, why would you, why would you do anything more than what you're doing right now if that, if that works? What are the yeah. Ukrainians going to do? Massive counteroffensive? What, what's going to happen? The British are going to come in and bail the Ukrainians out? With what army? Oh, yes. With what oh, challenger yes. tanks? Well, say generally, like, well, what are they going to do? As quick as possible, and I'm saying there's they many just, reasons why you wouldn't buy. They just need five challenge. What did you say, Vaz? They just need five challenge time. 
to take over. Yeah, you see five challenger tanks <laughs> in the SAS. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you think that also the that Russia's strategy might be partially to uh, ruin the international credibility, weaken, uh, continue uh, weakening the West, America, and NATO. I don't think that's their strategy. With, like, I think, I think that that's a, that's. I think that that is a natural consequence of the way that we're choosing to play this thing. Like it, the if the, if we were arming the Ukrainians with a bunch of Bradleys, there wouldn't have been a bunch of blown up Bradleys. We wouldn't have had Bradley Square. You know, we're the ones that decided to do that it. Russia could uh, fast play this. Um, and there might be consequences, but but if they're slow playing it, that part of the reason they're slow playing it is because they want the West and NATO to continue weakening our weakening ourselves uh, by keeping this going on. Yeah, I, I don't. Maybe there's some some of that going on, but I don't think that that's the calculus. I think the calculus is that um, we, we try to basically nab Ukraine out from under the Russian kind of sphere of influence. The Russians were like, nah. -uh. And they're going to not ha not let it happen. They're not gonna they're not gonna do. It's obvious now that the Russians weren't going to uh, do a massive blitzkrieg and and do Ukraine kind of like we did Iraq or something like that. They're going. If the goal is a political to get to get the Ukrainians to bend to your political will, you know, if if the goal is to be able to have them compromise on your terms. You know, and you're going to say, listen, we, we can talk about your EU partnership or whatever, but NATO is off the table. You know, the Ukrainians, it's still a compromise. The Russians give something in, in return, but they get what they really want, with, with what's really important to them, the security architecture, you know, the, well, we the re this, security uh, architecture. And so they, like, if they what, do that slowly, if they do that quickly, it's not going to actually change the timetable. What if we expand it to been, uh, you know, the reason why they want to weaken the U.S. is from, like, the axis, uh, including, you know, like, maybe Iran, China, the Middle East, the situation in Israel and Gaza. How important is it for Russia that the U.S. also pull out its bases in Syria and Iraq? And if there's a connection between their, say, does Russia not care, uh, and it's only Iran that cares that there's the mil U.S. military bases in uh, Syria and Iraq, or is Russia also strategically looking, okay, can they uh, keep what's going on with uh, Hezbollah in Israel and the war in Ukraine? And eventually the U.S. is going to completely have to pull out not only of Ukraine, but it's also going to have to pull out of the Middle East, uh, you know, specifically Syria and Iraq. I mean, I have something to say about that, but I want to hear what Toby has to say. No, I was just going to say, Bradley, I, I think you've been drinking the Putin Kool-Aid the, the, the man is not a god, he's a, he's a politician, right? And so the, the situation in Ukraine is, is a political one inside Russia as well. And if you listen closely to what Putin said in his, his uh, thing with, with Tucker, he, he, he made a point about Ukrainians and Russians being one people and eventually things will heal. Well, Putin's got a long history of lamenting the downfall of the Soviet Union, and he's made a lot of political capital inside his own country by sort of promising a return to greatness. Now, he doesn't actually have to deliver on it, but that is his shtick, right? His political shtick is promising a return to greatness, and he kind of did that in his speech with Tucker too. He kind of suggested that eventually Ukraine will come back into the the Russian sphere. Now, when when Tucker asked him about denazification, that was a really good question, I think, because, like, it means political control. It's not just because the, 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 the overtly Nazi militias have so much influence in the current regime, but because by any practical measure, in order to enforce that, you're going to have to have political control. Now, that doesn't mean that they have to have military control, but it does mean that NATO is going to have to withdraw and allow Russia to set up a client state there. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's, that, that's what's on the cards there. I, I don't think that Russia necessarily have to conquer it. But anyway, I also wanted to make a, a, a sort of like a cute point here 
Recently, Australia passed a very strange law that banned the display of Nazi memorabilia because the wise government of Australia, when they search for hate symbols, go to Germany 80 years ago because there's nothing closer to home. But in any case, I thought it was kind of interesting because what Putin is asking for in Ukraine is essentially what we've just passed in Australia. So Putin is really, you know, he wants to be an Aussie. He, 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 he wants to share Australian values and, and ban Nazi memorabilia and ban the display of these Nazi symbols. And so I thought that was kind of a curious alliance of values there. Wait, Toby, there, I think the significance of Nazi memorabilia to I Russians is just different. Offended Andrew. I think it's different than the significance of Nazi memorabilia to Australians, you know. Yeah, well, you, you would say that, Bradley. Well, it's just that uh, you, share you, you talk to Russians, they still <laughs> talk about World War II like it happened, you know, in the 90s. For, for a lot of Russians, World War II is just like so, such a big part of their DNA. That you know, he's still well, apparently it's part of ours as well. But I <laughs> imagine that, right? I mean, we, we genocided the Tasmanian Aboriginals, or more to the point, the British did, right? The British completely <laughs> slaughtered the Aboriginals in Tasmania. Okay, let's wait. Let's wait on this. Not, okay, we let's, wanna, let's not anyway, brag now, Toby. Let's not brag, okay? We all <laughs> genocided someone. It's <laughs> <laughs> what okay. do you guys have a genocide? <laughs> the borders are made with blood. Dude, the, the invasion yeah. of Ethiopia. Are we are we moving on? Yeah, kind of. Well, I, mean, I just talk about that. I, I, I want to really nail down this point where I want to figure out oh. where uh, where I've been drinking the Putin Kool Aid, according to Toby. Because um, maybe I mean, I try, I, has something to say. He was laughing uh, on our uh, uh, speculations. Well, we got a few more yeah, people. There was so many people. speculations. So yeah, upgrade might want to correct us on it. Would yeah, you like it? Do. Just wanted to say that want to tie you, this into you wanna, uh, what the do you military wanna know? bases in Iraq and Syria. Okay, so when it comes to whether the whether or not the Russians care about our bases in Iraq and Syria, I think some of them they care more about than others, the ones that impact their interests. I'm sure they really care about, what is it, Al-Tanf in Syria? I'm sure they really care about the base in Syria. They'd like to get, you know, they'd like to get that one done with i'm sure they care a lot less about you know bases in i don't know ethiopia or something i'm sure they care a lot less about our bases in the south south, south america you know that I, I think they care about their interests i think they have their own national interests and that's what they're concerned about i don't think that the uh, russians are sitting there plotting like huh the americans have 800 bases tomorrow like or next year on this chart if it goes down from 800 to 754 somebody's getting a promotion i don't think that's how they think you know and if you look li like just listen to putin's interview he's like what are you guys doing with the destruction of your dollar like is everybody there mad what are you guys nuts you know so it's like even even to that point the russians are like it's not like they're actively seeking the destruction of the dollar you know um I, that's not how i see it I think that maybe some people do think in that in those terms, but for the most part, people like Putin, right, or Lavrov, that's not what they're doing. You know, they're busy figuring out and hashing out Russia's interests okay. and trying to sell that to their people, trying to balance that. I don't think that they're uh, out there pl plotting how to close down America's 800 bases. Okay, upgrade and let's run around the circle. Yeah, um, about the dollar thing i i always find that very funny like the u.s dollar is still the most wanted paper in the world if you like it or not you can pay everywhere with the dollar and um it's not going away like in the next year or two years or five years or ten years it still has a lot of uh, power and the united states has still a lot of um, power diplomatically, even if they're a shit show now, but uh, that can change with uh, a new president very quickly. Um, we just need to be a little bit patient with uh, uh, making a party before the things are over. We don't know, maybe uh, in one month they will give them uh, the Ukraine 60 billions, they will give 50 uh, 15 billions to the israelis and so on 
So let's just uh, watch and um, see what's going to happen. But definitely, uh, you, Ukraine is not in a good spot. I, 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 I talk to people. I see people from both sides, and you can smell it in the air. It's it has a really stinky, you know, like a rotten mouse under your house, you know, and it's the rot is coming up above, and you can actually smell it. So it's definitely not a, a good thing what's happening right now. About the interview, it was very interesting, especially for people who uh, didn't follow Putin at all or didn't hear the Russian voice at all, because the uh, Russian speakers, they like, he said that two years ago, he's saying the same thing over and over again. Yeah, for you, it's it's obvious, right? For, but for the uh, most of the people who actually want to listen to a, a, a second um, point of view, um, they didn't know. Right? They didn't know what was the Russian position. They didn't know how they felt or how uh, they saw the things. If everything is right or wrong, that's everybody's uh, um, individual uh, intelligence to figure it out. Right? He's a KGB agent. Maybe he's lying. Maybe he's very good in front of the camera and so on and so forth. But maybe there's some truths. You know, he did a lot of anecdotes uh, who were very interesting, I think especially about uh, some presidents uh, and then uh, actually they should do journalism you know these people who are uh, shitting on Tucker um, they should go ask maybe the Western leaders uh, about the quotes of Putin did he really say that did, did, did it really went like this but they don't do that because obviously they uh, think he is uh, yeah what he is uh, but yeah it was very interesting Definitely. By the way, by the way, these people they know how to make interview. The thing is, they know allowed to ask this kind of thing to the people that pay them. You know, once you get a job in CNN, BBC, MSNBC, you know they're gonna tell you what to do. That's what they do. Trust me, these people they yeah. are journalists because when they get a chance to do an interview to someone they don't like they go hard on them you know yeah and i also find it funny when the, they say yeah it was a softball interview it was this and that what about the softball interview zelensky got for two years guys <laughs> he got the softest uh, yeah. how beautiful are you how yeah. how tall are you how, can how I, rich can i give you can i give you a hug can i give you a hug I miss yeah, give, give me a hug, please. It's <laughs> my baby. No, no, we, no, no, no. You misunderstand. The interviews were more like, go, go, go. Okay, yeah. well, now you may go. Well, let's go around the circle a little bit. Yeah, so, so it's the, 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 one of the strange things is like, you know, I mean, after Putin gave this interview, like, you have very few, like, uh, mainstream media actually criticized it. Like, like the, they're literally picking what, what to say, and they couldn't. And, and 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 they were just talking about this this uh, thirty minutes lecture that Putin was talking about, and and they they make fun of it, but they couldn't like had any historical fact to say that okay something is wrong, like you know he's lying. They couldn't say anything. Like they they were just like they only talked about it. Hey, yeah, he he tell told great about Elon Musk. You know, yeah, he's he's gonna make so, like he wanna conquer the world. You know, some he, they they made some shit, but but they couldn't say they couldn't factual like they couldn't say anything against the, the facts. Oh, yeah. Joe well, Biden, Biden is on tape saying that he's going to blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. And after that shit happened, no one, no one asked him if he did it. Yeah. Please, no yeah. one. Yeah, they did Manya. ask them. Yeah. Well, I think I, my general uh, opinion on the interview itself, I, I thought it was a very good interview for Putin. I think that, uh, you know, he, he pretty much hit a home run with it. Uh, long-winded at the beginning with the little history lesson, I think may have turned off a lot of, uh, a lot of viewers, but, um, yeah. you know, he, I don't think he was necessarily speaking to them anyway. Um, uh, to what was just said about, uh, the media, I mean, they were, the mainstream media was conditioning each and every one of us to not even bother watching the interview two days before the interview even happened. 
And they were conditioning us to believe that, you know, whatever a madman like Putin would have to say or do is completely, uh, you know, uh, out to lunch because he's a complete madman. That was what they were conditioning <laughs> us. Then after the interview, which, you know, Putin, I thought, came across as a very measured, very pragmatic leader. Um, the whole time I was thinking to myself, can you imagine Joe Biden or Justin Trudeau or Rishi Sunak or... Hey, leave Sunak alone, pa. And, and I was just thinking to myself, I cannot imagine one of these leaders sitting down for two hours plus without notes and being able to do this. Um, and, and none of them could. I mean, that's clear. So, Maybe Lukashenko. Um, Lukashenko might be the only one. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I thought that he was really impressive. I thought he gave good answers, good uh, context which I like. He also provided, as, as was just said, a lot of facts. And, you know, at one point he was like, you know, waving something, you know, some piece of paper saying, you know, everything I say, I can back up. And, um, you know, I think that after the interview, the mainstream media, they, they didn't even get into a, a discussion about facts whatsoever. It was all well, Putin, well, Tucker, he was, you know, a Putin puppet and and Putin got out and he spewed his lies, his lies, and he's a madman. <laughs> and that's all they had. And anybody who has got like a room temperature IQ, they're looking at this and they're saying to themselves, well, no, that's that's not what Putin said. He actually came off as being a very reasonable person. And furthermore, I'm, I'm starting to see now that everything that you politicians are telling us is a bunch of BS because all you're doing is talking in tropes and you've got no facts to back you up and you've got no context to back you up. So I think for a lot of people, if they were paying attention and this was their first, uh, let's say their first, uh, their first experience looking at, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin and seeing what he's all about. Uh, I'd be shocked if, if many people came out of it just scratching their head and saying, gee, what a madman. Like, he didn't give that vibe whatsoever. So I think that, uh, you know, for, for the layman who was checking this out, and there's a lot of laymen. Last I checked, it was 200 plus million viewers on uh, X alone. Uh, I think that a lot of people are coming out of this with a lot of questions. And they've got questions for their governments. They've got questions. I want to jump on top of that, but I'll, I'll go after upgrade. Sure. I want... uh, no, I, I'm done. Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> go ahead, upgrade. I want to jump on. I totally on agree with you, uh, Nunia, about many points you just mentioned. But also, what I see and hear from people actually, uh, I'm asking because I'm uh, quite um, interesting about uh, other people's opinion uh, who are not agreeing with, with, uh, with uh, Putin or so so on and um, when you ask them did you watch the interview they always say the same thing i had like maybe 10 person who i asked this question or 15 maybe and they always say the same question oh i i heard the interview i saw the interview i'm like okay and then the second sentence they actually say is i reviewed it from another person so they never the people never go to the first source to actually see the interview by themselves to to figure out their own opinion about what he's saying they taking a second source who's telling them what they need to say what they need to think and i i'm really shocked by this because in switzerland is usually not like this we always try to make our mind by searching for the first source um to check it out if it's actually true because anybody can say anything about uh, something they see they can inter interpret uh, interpret it differently and um it's very weird that uh, like you said also Veng Veng uh, said uh, also some good uh, thing about they don't have actual rebel the only rebel i heard is like oh he said zelinsky's father was fighting against nazis and something like that and that's not true then i'm like the only thing of this entire two hours interview is this point then it must be 
a good interview, you know, because that, that's... Well, I, I think that, awesome. I think Nanya yeah. made a really interesting point, which I didn't think of at first, but I guess it kind of makes sense. That if, what if Putin wasn't talking to the audience that would be checked out after 30 minutes, right? Because you got to think about it. What if there's people that you're like, well, they actually don't know what to believe. They don't even know my perspective and my point of view, right? If you're that person and you're trying to actually figure it out for yourself, that 30 minute diatribe into Russian history w w probably was perfect for you, right? Also fucking Depending on what kind of person well, you are, that might have been it. Let's let's you. put it this way. If if you can come out of it and the only real gripe you can have about his performance is that he's got just this amazing grasp of Russian history. If that's the only thing you can take away from it is as a negative, I think the guy's doing okay, you know. I say I, I said that in the voice chat, you know, a lot of people not gonna watch the interview, they're just gonna wait for their favorite propaganda to come up with some bullshit and everyone everyone is talking about the first 25 minutes everyone is talking about the rest no one is talking about it but trust That's me, not that, important part. yeah but trust me if you really want to know that first 25 minutes is the key of that interview yep if you really yeah. want to know the key of yeah, that interview is in the first 25 minutes yeah, Tucker but, Carlson made a little bit of a mistake at the beginning where he was like, oh, yeah, I, I'm a historian by trade. And his, Putin's like, oh, I, I'm also a historian. There's nothing more that I love than to listen to history lectures. And I've even provided original documents from the archive for you. And Tucker's like, whoa, whoa, I'm not a historian like that, man. Like, I just I need a, I need to have something on the paper so that I'm legitimate when I'm asking people questions on TV like. I'm, I'm a different kind of historian. Boone's like, well, here, for your good memory, here's these archival documents. If I was sitting there, I'd be like, give me those archival documents right now. <laughs> Tucker Carlson's like, no, 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 I have specific questions I'm trying to ask you. Like, what did you feel? How did you perceive this threat from NATO? That, can you do a better job of communicating that to my audience? And Putin obviously had his own had his own uh, thing that he was on. And is so, Putin the feeling. first president who actually did a long form like podcast it was always like almost like a podcast into it was not like an interview for me it was yeah. like like a podcast uh, scenario yeah. where he was like asking a question and really let him speak like for for like half an hour or 45 exactly. minutes like, between you know, question it was very people interesting say, it was that for, people say people say like that years. people say that it, it wasn't huh? too hard on vladimir putin it wasn't too hard everyone in the west say vladimir putin is a fucking madman he killed for fun. Guess what? Tucker Carlson asked him about a journalist is in jail for being a spy. And Tucker said, come on, he's a young man. He's not a spy. If Putin was a really, really mad man, he would kill that guy there straight away. Yes or no? And he went all the way and say why that guy is in jail. And then Tarakas was uh, like, Toby, well, do, you, do you wanna go first before me? You were holding uh, your finger uh, first. Before. Uh, when they, well, amazing, you go, you go. <laughs> you I'll go okay. after you, I'll go after you. I'll go after you. <laughs> okay. Medi. I posted, I posted, I posted the, the, the news from the uh, Margarita Simonian from Russian TV. Uh, she is the famous one of the hosts, and uh, uh, she says she ordered the, uh, her uh, team to find out, uh, to calculate how much uh, uh, views there are total all across the world, uh, all across the platforms. So she said it must be somewhere close to a billion views of the Putin's interview. Okay, that's uh, many out of let's say half a billion, uh, which is most probable, half a billion views. Uh, many are Ukrainians, and what I see, what I my strategic uh, view of the Putin interview is, uh, he came with a folder. How's that? He came with a folder, right? 
Did you notice that? So he was preparing before the interview, before anything, no matter what question uh, Tucker Carlson would ask him, he would talk about uh, history of Ukraine, uh, which is what uh, what's important for him in that interview. Uh, he gave a history talk on Ukraine, how it's a Russian, uh, 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 Russian people. It's not Ukrainians as a separate nation, it's a, a Russian people. And he apologized also. Okay, he, he gave the history lesson on Ukraine and provided all the uh, copies of the archives, uh, contracts and letters from Ukraine to show the truthfulness of, of it so that nobody in the world can uh, uh, negate what he's saying, okay? That all the journalists that would immediately try to lie about it, they cannot. Uh, but uh, of course, Carlson wouldn't, uh, he just opened it, looked at it and closed it like uh, it's a throwaway garbage. That's uh, because he's a bad journalist, right? Uh, and uh, uh, th what happened? He just knows his audience. He knows. This, he knows. He knows audience. I think we could also yeah. have been tapping. Uh, the the thing me. is, so this is the Putin's uh, uh, talk to Ukrainians. He was saying, "You're Russians, and through the history, we, when we were weak, we let you go your own way, and you'd ask for help from Poland, Poland, but they came in." Uh, try to change your uh, religion, try to change your co culture, called you Ukrainian, made up a new language just to uh, show you that you are not Russian. You know, they propagandized you. We apologize for that, for letting you go alone, but we accepted you. And now we did the same again, you know. We did the same. We let you go your own way. You went to the West again, asking for the help. They pretend you're at the, at friends, the very least, but they're fucking we you up. We, at the very they're least, we understand the Russian perspective, you know? So, the Russian, so that's, got his that's perspective the, But he has okay. a, a copies me. of the archives, all the contracts, all the letters from Ukrainians, correspondence from the Ukrainians when they will let them uh, go on their own when the Russia was weak. So, so sure, he's basically apologizing he's, for that. And another message that he presented later on is that uh, those Western friends are again fucking them up. They promise them everything, right? But uh, uh, they, they're actually just abusing you. We could have had peace, you could have had peace, uh, but uh, uh, Bonson, uh, Boris Johnson came in and uh, you know made you go into meat grinder, so they just throw you away. That's they propaganda. Use you. That's they're propaganda. throwing you away. Uh, so, uh, so th this is what uh, we apologize for. For it, we're gonna take you back and protect you. That's his message to Ukrainians. And the rest of the, his interview, and the rest of his interview is basically just some really interesting anecdote with how they correspond with the uh, uh, West. What's the attitude of the West towards the Russia? But I now they're agree. strong. Now they audience. can go their own way. <laughs> Okay, well, well, we'll we'll start. Toby, we'll start. Toby was going to speak next. The Ukrainians. Toby was going to speak next. Yeah, I I wanted to to make a point about um, you know later on we're going to move towards the the Trump Colorado case and there's an interesting word in there which is insurrectionist and the thing about the interview with Tucker and Putin is if you are really hardcore. NAFO, if you really believe that Putin is evil and that Russia are the enemy, right, and frankly there are a lot of people who believe this in the West, then what Tucker did was give aid to the enemy, which is treason. And the point that I'm making here is that when things get heightened when 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 war when the war drums start banging on that interview with the world leader becomes propaganda for hitler right and and i don't think we should be deceived the the fact that we were able to see that and and listen to putin's views that says more about the current time that we're in and, and, it, and it underlines the fact that we are not actually 
in a state of hot war with Russia. But I'd ask you, you know, don't be deceived. That can change, and it can change incredibly quickly. Uh, and when it, and if and when it does change, don't expect the majority opinion to be academic. It will be like COVID. You know, if 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 the if the official line is that Putin is the enemy and that he is insane, saying the sorts of things that you all have been saying about him being a reasonable man will actually be very dangerous. You know, when countries go to war, everything changes. And and I'm not talking. You know, I don't. I, we live in this modern age, and we think, oh, you know, the internet's opening up everything. But I don't think we should be deceived. If we go to war, all the freedom of information is going to change and it's going to change really, really quickly. In, in all the wars that I've studied, it's, it's uncanny how quickly you can become an enemy of the people uh, and, and you can become one of them. And so when I watched the Putin interview and, and all the media surrounding it, I kind of... Um, I kind of took heart that we are not actually in a war with Russia yet, but I'm not convinced that we are protected from such a thing just because Putin and Tucker had a chat. And I think that if we do go to war with Russia and or China and or anyone else, uh, I, I don't think that that interview is going to mean very much. So, I, you know, I, I don't I don't really see it as being a, a particularly meaningful interview, but that's that's just me. I, I see poli I see Putin as a politician, not some vi visionary figure. Yeah, first and foremost, I, I, I say that he is a politician. Yeah, I must disagree, Toby. <coughs> it has had a huge impact. Look how many views. Just look how many views. How many people watch this interview who never maybe thought about uh, listening to this guy? All these people who are maybe in the middle who think uh, maybe it's not really intelligent to send billions of US dollars, you know, to this country. For what? What is the end goal for the US? We still it's didn't hear difficult. anything from the from the from the president of the United States. He's just saying weaken Russia. Okay, weaken Russia with Ukrainian lives. Is this the is this the the country of democracy, freedom, who's pretending it doesn't all, matter because changing all around the world, it, it matters. It matters. That's exactly the exactly the wrong, the wrong minds of people. But the wait, wait, just give me a second to explain to you. Look at how the people react around the world. People don't react like before. They don't shut the fuck up when the U.S. is coming, bombing shit, or giving people money or giving them military aid if they see it's not right or if they see it's not logic. The times have changed, my friend. It's not like before. And especially when you have a weak president like this, you kind of need to even remember where the fuck he is. When the band plays hell to the king, they will point their cannons at you, man. Yeah, but the people have very little power. So even, even if the U.S. What are you talking are about people have little power in the war, even in the European countries, it's very likely the war will continue. The elites will continue supporting it. I mean, you see that with the protests. Uh, uh, Palestinian and Israel, like it's very unpopular, but the U.S. is still going into it. And you look at Vietnam, like they didn't US, bring up the 14 billions. You have didn't an unpopular them. war that could be waged, uh, you know, for decades, and you could have the majority of the U.S. against it. The election system, you have two candidates. In all likelihood, both candidates are going to support it. So when uh, the reality wins after a while, you cannot just push unpopular things to your population without consequences yeah but you can there is I mean, consequences you're, you're elected by the people the people can also throw you away and take another person and people at the politician level they always want to keep their job so they always idealistic. The like you know that's idealistic. and if you don't do it most of the time the reality catches up and then they get the fuck out of here and then you post I mean, uh, nah, that, I mean, that's, that's the case idea in with Switzerland, it. but like not power in maintains some of the power countries all around the people around who the world. have wealth and power have different interests than the masses, and it's very difficult for the masses to have an effect, even in democracy. Go ahead, Most Jack, of sir, the places are not like that upgrade. 
you see most of the places are not like that upgrade uh, switzerland uh, yeah you can enjoy that but uh most of the places let's say where those leaders are for there for 20 30 years some some are good some are bad they cannot remove them like kings of jordan or uh saudi uh, uh line in a uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. I cannot remove all these guys. I'm I mean, talking Putin, about Putin Putin countries who have elections. Deep state. Hey guys. Yeah, sorry, Nunia. I, I, I think uh, Vengzar was before okay, me. Yeah. Go no, ahead. The, like, you know, the saddest part here is like during the Soviet Union time, Ukraine was one of the uh, like a, a kind of a richest part of the a nation because it was closer to the Black Sea and they literally had everything. They were so self sustained. Like they they had a they they had their own power generation. They had their own aircraft manufacturing. They have this own military base. They pretty much like you know, like they can have they they, they can do everything by themselves. They, they literally had everything. And uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they still inherited everything without any destruction. They still had nuclear weapon which they had to withdraw it because Americans wanted to do that. And uh, yeah, but. Yeah, there was there was a corruption, but still they had pretty much everything to it to a base level, and the economy was so much integrated into Russia, and they had a good bargaining power to 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 have to to put their price of their product much more easily, and they were able to manufacture their own tank, own aircraft like Antonov, and uh, they were exporting their energy to, to to the other European countries. So they pretty much and 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 yeah, there are a lot of educated people in Ukraine. They understand this, and now like. What they're proposing, the, the, the proposal is to, uh, yeah, let's destroy everything that was created for 100 years. And now let's bring something, you know, uh, for, from the European Union, like like a, maybe a branch or some kind of you know, like, a, like a cheap labor thing. And let's export this labor to them. This is what these people want. I don't think they want. I think they, they're looking into it. So, but they just don't have this kind of, you know, a, kind of a, a will to talk. You know, against the government because they have this strong nationalist uh, government, which is actually like you know they're pretty, uh, they're pretty extreme, and the moderators are not able to come out and speak. And I think eventually, like you know, when when, when the West is losing, West stops, stops supporting or you know something, when something loses its power, these guys are gonna come up and they're gonna make some changes, and it's gonna take some time. I think it, it begins now. It begins by now to do that. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to follow up on something that uh, Toby was talking about as well as upgrade. And, and what Toby was saying was uh, absolutely correct uh, in that, you know, we're kind of in this weird time now where uh, we can't really look to our media for the, the truth. And, and a lot of it is because we're starting to become introspective, I think. And maybe I'm being overly optimistic here, but... I seem to start to, to see that we're being, we're starting to be a bit more uh, introspective in here in the West uh, with respect to what we're doing to the rest of the world. And, and hear me out. I don't laugh all at once, but uh, <laughs> um, initially when this conflict in Ukraine broke out, it was your normal, Oh, rah, rah, we got to go save the democracy and Ukraine's a democracy and we got to fight for democracy and blah, 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 blah. The same old tropes, right? That didn't work because everybody quickly realized that Ukraine wasn't a democracy and it was actually a really corrupt shithole. Uh, so the narrative, you know, sort of shifted, if you recall, uh, they couldn't get the money. And the democracy line wasn't worked working, and then it switched to, well, he's not going to stop there. If, if 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 he if he takes you know uh, Kiev, he'll take Paris, he'll take London. That was the narrative for a couple months, and then everybody quickly realized that that was uh, a bunch of horseshit. Uh, and if they saw the Putin interview, they walked out of it knowing that it was because he just doesn't fit what the narrative has been saying about. So now, and I'll open this up to you guys, what I'm starting to see the last couple days since the Putin interview and, and even a couple days before it, we're sorting, 
I, I'm starting to see a lot more politicians and a lot more uh, Western media start going back to the quote rules based order. But they're delving into what the rules based order means because they used the rules based order before, but they didn't explain it. Now they're starting to give people a bit of context to say, well, the rules based order is actually why we all live kind of well. Yeah, and maybe in Canada. Maybe in yeah. Canada. Well, oh, okay. Well, I'm starting to see a lot more of this coming from our politicians. Trudeau came out and said something along the lines of this the other day. I'm starting to see it in our media where they're starting to uh, come clean somewhat as best they can to say, listen, this is what it's all about. It's not about this stuff that we've been talking about democracy. They're a bunch of crooks. We all know it. It's not about him taking Paris. He doesn't want Paris. We all know that. It's all about the resources. It's all about us having control over this, that, and the other thing. I think if that narrative starts to come out more, um, you know, people might buy it or they might not. Who, who knows, right? Uh, but at least they'll be given some semblance of the truth. And maybe I'm being, like I said, way optimistic in my thinking that, you know, this is what society as a whole is seeing. But uh, I, I'm starting to think that, you know, they see a need for a narrative shift and they want to, you know, kind of bring it home to where it matters to us, which is, you know, our standard of living. You might think Putin tends to... I would, to he started, he started, I would like, he started, I would like to invite Naomi to say if she watched uh, Putin's interview and if she has any opinion on it. What, uh, what's your take on it? Uh, did you watch it, Naomi? Yeah, I did. And I thought a couple of things I found interesting. Um, I thought it was interesting how Tucker kept trying to form a narrative uh, about China. Um, it's like they're gearing up to kind of um, align Russia with whatever upcoming administration, which I think he hopes is going to be Trump, to work with the United States to contain China. Did, it, did any of you guys notice that? Yeah. Yes, I did. You know, <clears throat> that's because of never. So the, the, never the, 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 when I was, when I was, yeah, when I was in the military back during the Cold War, we kind of had this idea that we needed to, to keep a wedge in between China and Russia. And I think they're going to try to go back to that. And they realize like, the Ukraine, you know, everything else that's going on is pushing them together. So they're going to try to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, go, go ahead, Vaz. Yeah, Tucker Carlson never, ever hidden what he thinks about China. He always going to be on the side, whatever the next president of the United States is going to be, to go to war against China. And he tried just mm -hmm. to make sure Vladimir Putin is on the next United States president side, you know. But I think it's too late because if you see the way Vladimir Putin defend China, it's like you guys had your time and you Buzz, I think you're I think you're wrong there, Buzz. I, I thought I think Naomi's right because I noticed Putin was conspicuous in not defending China when in yeah. fact when Putin criticized American financial policy, he was almost lamenting the loss of the dollar. Like, you know, he, he, he was not taking the time to celebrate the great new trade between Russia and China. He wasn't um, celebrating Russia's great new position. He was actually lamenting the lost good old days, you know, when the American yeah. dollar was mm -hmm. something everyone rely on so i agree with naomi i kind of picked up on that and i thought this is almost like a negotiation a preliminary negotiation between i think putin was laying out the terms and and like you know i've done a few business negotiations and trump is a businessman i think putin was saying look this is the deal nato clears out right, and you give me Ukraine, and now what do you want, right? So, and so that's why I think that the peace deal... That so, why are you saying, 
So will why be, you say Toby? Well, so Trump, Trump, you... Trump is going to say what I want, right, is to get money because that's how Trump gets the American Senate and particularly the MIC and everybody who's sunk money into Ukraine. <coughs> I think the West wants to wash their hands of Ukraine, but they'd really like to get their money back. And I think that's where peace lies. I think NATO leaves Ukraine, but Ukraine, under Russian guidance, agrees to pay off NATO for their war debt. But that, that, I agree with Naomi. I saw that interview no, almost as about, a precursor yeah, yeah, to but about peace China, negotiation. About China. I don't think Vladimir Putin is going to team up with the United States to go against China. There is no way. He already said that he can't trust these people. About six months ago, he said if he could be young again, the first thing he would do is don't trust these people in the West. This guy is still called these people our friends from our colleagues from the West, you know? And everyone in Russia was like, no, come on, these people, they are not your friends. They're gonna stab you in the back. Yeah, but and I think he yeah. learned that lesson. There's no way he's gonna go back there. Well, yeah, but well, yeah, the thing is, did, did... well, the the way I kind of uh, saw that, uh, I agree with Toby and Naomi. Uh, make no mistake, Putin left the door open uh for business in europe i mean he straight up came out and said hey we can we can fire up nord stream too anytime you guys want so yeah. uh i think he was uh i think he was trying to leave the door open to p future business dealings in europe which is smart uh but you know he didn't throw china under the bus he said everything that he yeah. needed to say That's we're neighbors we've got a border we share a history yada 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 but no i i don't think uh, i don't think him coming out and and you know for lack of a better term bragging about how well russia's economy is doing vis-a-vis -vis europe or or how you know hey great we're gonna de-dollarize and we're gonna destroy you all that no. That wouldn't have been helpful, that's, and that's okay, not that's really not, his style. That's okay, it was, yeah, it was interrupted think... Naomi while she was talking. While she's uh, also had the problem of three second leg. Yes, was you interrupted her while she was talking. So and she let you talk. Okay, uh, yeah, so man, she was... wanted to say something, but she also has a problem like I used to have three second lag. So you when she starts it. talking, it takes three seconds. Okay, so that that's what happened. So Naomi, go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to say, you know, like um, at the beginning of this thing, he talked about how Russia is a bulwark against, served as a bulwark between um, the East and the in the West in Europe. So I think he, I think that he is uh, negotiating. Like, yeah, that's all. That's all I wanted to say. He said that early and on. Also um, throwing in the those like, like, oh, he's bitter because he was rejected by NATO, and even in his post interview, uh, Tucker repeated that, like he, like he's certain that Putin's a bitter man because NATO rejected him, which might go along with the, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, like Trump gets in and will bring you back into the fold, like you know, the blue eyed man unites against China, um, you know, Tucker, like oh, exactly. Like, um, so, but I mean, I don't know if you tied that together. This like, is is Putin a bitter man because mm -hmm. uh, NATO rejected him? Right, right, yeah. I mean, right. Yes, do they is. really think that? Yeah. He's a madman. Like, yes, he is. He's a madman. Does, he, does, he, does is that how he came across to you on the interview? Is that what you saw? That you saw a bitter, <laughs> angry man. No, I didn't think so. I, but I, I just know that Tucker repeated that. No, just post no, 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 no. But I mean, that's the only yeah, thing. I, I think that Tucker tried to, you know. Tucker kept trying to frame a frame the questions in a way that his audience that that his audience understands. And Putin was trying to do his own thing, you know. That's what that's kind of how it came across to me. Where Tucker is like, okay, give me the give me the skinny on the maybe <coughs> even give me some some more stuff. Like he's telling me more about Nord Stream. Like he's like wanted to hear more details about. You know, you guys have your own intelligence investigations. What have you found out? Can you give me more awesome, juicy details, right? And Putin's like, what wavelength are you on? Anyway, back to 400 years ago, you know? 
So Kevin, it's like Tuck, uh, Tucker's on like the blue eyed nationalism wave where he's looking like, you know, Putin, like you're a blue eyed man. And like, there's a whole bunch of strategic, like, like can it, yep, we exactly. this with like Trump, NATO, Europe, Putin, like the blue eyed man versus our real enemy, China. And like, I don't think Putin was on the yep. same blue eyed nationalism. He was like, yeah, I'm I not, agree gonna, with you. I'm not yep, gonna choose like, the blue eyed people over China. If it makes more sense to go with China, Putin's gonna go with China, not the other blue eyed people. Because there are a couple of questions which Tucker said that you could tell that Putin was like, okay, how do I even? It's kind of like that effect when you have a sandwich and it's really big. You're like, where do I even start? You know, what what is this that just got put on my plate? You know, so Tucker's like, well, what about uh, the threat that you felt from NATO? What specifically triggered you and made you feel like there was a threat to NATO? Putin's like, well, uh, this has been a long process. You know, this is a centuries long process of what triggered me and, and makes Russians feel threatened about that. There's the Napoleonic Wars. Russia has been invaded through Ukraine several times. And besides, the war in Ukraine, in Putin's perspective, that's already a war on basically historical Russian lands. Like, there's nowhere to retreat. You know, so Putin's going there. And then Tucker go, turns around and goes like, okay, well, give me specific details that make that make headlines, you know? Like, Putin drops a bombshell about, you know, ec- evidence of, of the Nord Stream bombing or something like this, you know? That, that would have been probably uh, a real force amplifier for the for that interview and Putin wasn't doing that he wasn't trying to be sensational like that it feels like he was like if you want to know the Russian perspective or the, his perspective let's say it's all propaganda you don't believe you don't believe his recounting of history well you still got his perspective there's he, that's what Putin thinks you know that's how they justify it to themselves at least you at least you understand that now right Just so I think that about um, the interview I mean there's a lot of people want to speak but to mention the deep state state context because it appears like Putin maybe was trying to find common ground with Tucker and his audience to say like you know damn well that there's a deep state that runs America Biden uh the d- democratic public you don't run America like you might think like there's a we in a democracy but there's a deep state and Putin was pretty clear like pushing that a few times about uh, deep state conspiracies and I'm not sure if Tucker was kind of like well you know, unfortunately you're right and like an implication, well, who is the deep state? Is it the Jews? Is it the corporations? Is it, uh, you know, whoever the deep state is? But like Putin was clearly, uh, you know, hinting like it's not Biden. It's not a democracy. There's a deep state there. Yeah. There yeah was it's a lot the CIA of and like Tucker's that. part of it. That's what he was trying to imply, I think. Yeah, I mean that that was, well, I don't, I don't, was like, I don't think like, that he was that, like, that Tucker, don't saying. give me this like you're my friend because yeah. you oppose Biden. Like it was you know, like like Putin was pretty clear. Like Tucker, like like Putin probably thought Tucker was there to try to kill him. I think Tucker I think so. literally want to. Like, I, I think if, if they thought that he would have gotten the Macron treatment across that big ass long ass table, I think that Putin trusted Tucker to some degree, you know, enough to actually sit that close to him have a long ass interview with him um so i i, I don't know i think that was this that interview was important for the both state. of them i mean tucker's putin's going well, not even because remember he putin goes putin's like hey you know the cia they it's a job they they're doing their thing you know they're out there trying to influence stuff in other countries like ukraine i mean can't be mad at them that's what they did, but I mean, we like, made a deal, and they went back on our deal, right? So e- even there, Putin's like, yeah, I understand how this works. I was part of the KGB, you know. It's not like no hard feelings, but when you when you sign a piece of paper with me, and you break the the agreement, and you do it over and over again, at some point in time, you could see how there's no what else am I supposed to do? So it's not any one single event. Maybe you could point out and say, oh yeah, there was a. The Ukrainians really massively amplified the bombing campaign on Donbass the preceding days before the Russians win. Something like this, right? You could maybe find something, but Putin's trying to not go there. It well, seemed Putin to me on purpose, like he was trying to say, no, CIA. it's bigger than that. It's Putin all together. The deep state's it's, the CIA, but like Tucker's audience doesn't think the deep state's the CIA. I mean, there's a lot of hands, but uh, you know, like maybe these things all tie together. So what do you think? Okay, well, I'm going to shut up and let somebody else speak. Okay, Vaughn. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, from, like, the American point of view, in my mind, I mean, just a regular guy, you know, the first half hour was 
you know, it may have been boring, but it was a basic history lesson that laid the groundwork for what Putin's arguments and beliefs were. And, you know, if you were mildly educated and had some history, it was easy enough to follow. It's not like you couldn't fact check him on anything like that. You know, and, and people obviously did nitpick what he said. And then, uh, you know, as he went through the process of the negotiations and offers of NATO, you know, I think it just highlights to a lot of people, you know, maybe some people that have pay attention are like, yeah, you know, I heard that before, you know, now it's maybe some confirmation. Maybe people are like, oh, you know, I thought that was a conspiracy theory. And now it's true. Other people are like, oh, I never heard that before. And I think the way he talked with Tucker you know, I agree with Jur when he was saying it. it was also a message to the Ukrainians because that's probably one of the few things that's going to get through the, uh, you know, the suppression of the media. I mean, because it's just everywhere. It's everywhere. But I think he really tried to speak to just regular people, you know, like the Germans, like, hey, you're getting fucked this way, this way, and this way, you know, and the Americans, like, don't you have better things to do than come over here and fuck around? What about your dollar? What I mean, are you guys doing? Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, I think he just really went through the process. He talked about how the minks, you know, let's just call it the minks betrayal <laughs> because they they admitted openly that they lied about it. So it wasn't even anything genuine. And, you know, he was reasonable. You know, he spoke, you know, like I said, it wasn't all Diplo speak and crap, you know, and you could follow along what he was saying, oh, and no. whether you agree with what he said or not. At the end, it's like at least you got the other side's point of view, what he believes in, what his justifications are, some basic history of the situation, why things may have been done. And, you know, to back it up and bring some of the receipts, you know, he talked about, hey, you know, when this offer was made or I made this offer, these people were in the room. Ask them. You know, he's like, you know, ask them. Here's the name of this guy. Here's the name of this guy. You know, when when this was said and this was their response these guys were in the room asking what they said. I mean, he he laid it out reasonably to, to people to like, yeah, you know, why don't you ask some questions? You know, why don't why don't you go ask Joe Biden or Bill Clinton? Because, you know, they're going to be like, oh, uh, you know, you know, what are they going to do live? Because there's probably a transcript of it. So, I mean, if they say it didn't happen, Putin will probably be like, well, here's a fucking transcript from the, the little typist person that sits there and they record everything. Right. So. I mean, I just thought it was well done in the sense that he 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 laid out his message and his reasoning in a in a way that most people could understand. I mean, obviously, there's going to be people that didn't want to hear it and don't care. But I mean, if you were paying attention, you're like, you know, that that's kind of fucked up. And maybe if you weren't really paying attention, it at least makes you start asking questions, and it's going to make funding difficult and continue because you know, people are going to be calling their congressmen and something. Oh, what the fuck, dude? I call, you know, this mother, you know, because he brought up a lot of little points. I mean, a lot of people might say it's petty or hard or whatever, but you know, your father, you know, I said, Voldemort, your, your father, your, your grandfather or father fought against the fascists. You know, what are you doing? I mean, just shit like that, you know, whether it's, you know, embellished to a, a little bit or not, it still hits. And, you know, I just think he did a really good job of making the counterpoint to, to the Western regular people to not fund it and not support it until these, you know, question what's going on, where the money's going, why are we doing it? Who are we really supporting? You know, I, I think it just opened the doors also. I think it was a very successful interview and, you know, people may have their particular points about it. I'm sure I do, but I mean, overall, I think it was perfect for him to lay out his case to the other side. And it's ridiculous that, you know, like it was really embarrassing when they said, that he had not spoken to President Biden since before the war started. And that just shows you how dangerous these people are and, and immature and petty. And I mean, it's like, seriously. And, and then, like he said, how, how can I talk to these people when they've admitted to lying? I, mean, I, just, think he Joe Biden. So never I just think he made a good Obama. case and it, 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 it people are going to ask a lot of questions and hopefully it leads to things wrapping up or at least the support getting cut off and stuff like that. Cause I mean, I think it was pretty devastating what he said. You know, when Tucker was like, uh, he, when he was talking, like, when he mentioned China, like, st still, still, like, still, they're trying to, like, divide, like, and I bring a Cold War era of, you know, like, a two divide division. And he made it very clear, like, you know, let's just, like, you know, it's, it, this is my area and I have my influence. The Eurasian is my influence. 
I know China is, is a huge power, but I know how to handle it. You don't have to lecture me. Okay, and you have your own influence of power. Don't go home, don't come. Everyone, like he literally meant, means like it's a multipolarity. And let's just have a multipolarity in its own way. I know you have your dollar. Okay, use your dollar to do whatever you want. Okay, and I will use my currency to do whatever you want. Let's just don't interfere into each other's influence. Let's have real multi multipolarity. That's something he really put that point into it. That's know, awesome. Yeah, that's true. I'm that's gonna. Uh, okay. I'm gonna agree. We we'll go Is communist. It, yeah. yeah, fellow communists. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to agree completely. I think with Toby and uh, and Naomi, or at least what I think you were saying, that there's an offer there to preserve some semblance of the. Uh, uh, the U.S. dollar order, where the U.S. did not throw around its control of the dollar to achieve political aims. It, it essentially uses as a neutral trade uh, medium and so on. And that offer is very clearly, I think, being made, or at least a slower transition to a different system that isn't so abrupt or potentially damaging to the U.S. I think that is absolutely true. That's there. But before getting into the other substance of Putin's interview, I want to make a point about the Tucker thing again. I agree with Bond completely. This is a very successful conveyance of that message, but it's specific to Tucker's audience. I mean, I was surprised at how how narrowly Putin phrased his argument to be comprehensible to nationalists in general, to not just to Orban nationalists in general and people like that in Europe, but also very specifically to Tucker's audience. I agree that not saying that the CIA somehow is or is mostly the deep state is a way of leaving the door open to other theories, right? So, you know, the nationalist argument about the fundamental unity of the peoples, right? So he, I, I lost track at about a dozen, like three points that Putin could have made that he left on the table. Like he, he could have talked about basing nuclear weapons being too close to Moscow as fundamentally destabilizing and guaranteeing a, a false, uh, positive uh, nuclear war. He, he could have talked about the um, specific, very specifically genocidal rhetoric of some of the Ukraine officials and cabinet, very similar to what's employed now in Israel. Uh, he, he had a lot of ammo. He could have talked about the uh, dozens of invasions from the West towards Russia, starting in the Crusades and the necessity of making alliances eastward to avoid genocidal threats from the West. He had a lot, just in history, he had a lot he did not mention. So, but emphasizing that positive nationalist view and leaving that door open to the economic cooperations and potentials, that is aimed very narrowly at, at Tucker's audience. If he had been interviewed by Chris Hedges, who has a very deep critique of the CIA, and a fundamental critique of the whole constructed myth of America, I'm sure that interview would have been very different and Putin's account of history would have chimed in on all of those points and he would have tried to get Chris Hedges to make the accusations that it's non-diplomatic to make. So I think that this shows a mastery of who, what audience he's reaching and I think there will be more interviews with Western reporters and I think he will illustrate different aspects of his case if this war goes any further, which it may not because this is so effective a method to reach into the American zeitgeist. So the I last mean, thing I want to say... You, just real quick, like like you're saying, I mean, he's basically hitting right at the people that are going to call their congressmen and are going to yeah. ask questions and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. In, in that sense, it's a masterful blow because he's hitting... I mean, if you yeah. want to look at it militarily, he's hitting the logistics that support... If I can add, it is. He also, just a last, a last point before, a last point before I drop it. That that there is also he made mention of key facts, like that there were people who identified clearly as Hungarian minority living in the far west of Ukraine. He knows damn well that an issue that will come up probably before the ICJ is that Ukraine has been forcibly conscripting these people, putting them in highly disadvantaged positions, putting Nazis behind them, and essentially genociding them by conscription. He returns the prisoners who are of ethnic Hungarian descent to Hungary, and Hungary has repeatedly objected about these practices in Ukraine many times. It's not a coincidence that he mentions the Hungarians. And the other thing, so that's a support, strong support for Orban in case Orban wants to file an ICJ case about that. Another thing also, that he does... Didn't they also threaten, like, Hungary with some kind of sanctions if they didn't or didn't somebody file yes. a complaint because they wouldn't return the POWs to Ukraine's custody 
They did, and this whole issue is, will come up in both EU and ICJ courts, right? So his mentioning of those Hungarian minorities is very strategic. Another very strategic mention was the mention of the Canadian Parliament incident. If you guys will remember, way back in Open Mic 5, I said when Canadians find out that there's Nazis in the mix, all public support will essentially begin to erode and rapidly disappear. It does happen. You don't see Ukrainian flags flying around Canada anymore after that incident in the parliament. Now, not only did Putin make a point of that as his main and sole response to the Nazi argument, he certainly could have made a stronger case a hundred ways, but he mentions that incident for a reason. One reason is that he knows that we're out there watching Alex Christofferou every day and that Trudeau managed to win the clown world of the year by the handling of that mess. He also knows that Christian Freeland is on the political hot seat in Canada for her abuse of powers in the Emergencies Act, what the judge has just deemed. He knows she's wildly unpopular, and she knows that she's the number two pick in the Liberal Party to replace Trudeau after Mark Carney. Putin would rather have Carney take that job. So by mentioning that incident and also putting out this... Um, case regarding can we please return to the old order he also knows damn well that it was christopher freeland as pro as finance minister that convinced the germans to exclude russia from swift and that this would all be hunky-dory and collapse russia's economy <clears throat> so he has taken three different tacks against her in one interview and he wants her knocked out of the picture as much as he wants Victoria Newland knocked out, as much as he wants Blinken knocked out, as much as he wants Netanyahu knocked out. Netanyahu, if you remember back in the 80s, used mm -hmm. to describe the USSR as the sole creator of uh, uh, terrorism in the whole nation. And Netanyahu had, Netanyahu had quite a bit to do with the US, with Russia getting very little help after the USSR collapsed. So his enemies list was all very surgically aimed at in that interview. I'm going to agree with you. Putin was doing some serious 4D chess. Like, I don't think Tucker, yeah. like, Tucker was kind of just, you know, doing his regular play to the audience yeah. or, like, maybe he had some message. But, like, you know, your Putin had, like, serious 4D chess message to uh, different messages to all sorts of constituents. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, too, you know, the people he named are all people that are unpopular in, in a variety, either generally in the public <laughs> or political yes. circles. So, he 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 specifically picked people that are generally disliked either politically or you know publicly. So like Clinton, you know, already, he's got his lovers yeah. and his haters, but he's pretty well disliked in most circles. You know, all these people, these these you know adjutants and stuff he named these diplomats. They're all people that nobody likes. You know, so that was another smart move. You know, he he named people that. You know, Americans that pay attention know, oh, fuck that motherfucker, fuck that bitch, you know. His most so cutting just, blow just was, was, was that. That they're, bad, that they're bad people. Yeah. His most cutting blow, I think, was that he actually made a point of saying that he met at Bush, Bush during Bush Jr.'s uh, tenure at the ranch with Bush Sr. there. Bush Sr., former head of CIA, former president one of the top suspects in the JFK assassination, right? And one of the people that are very often named as the deep state guy. And he made a point of the fact that even in the conversation with the Bush crime family, that you they didn't control everything, that they couldn't direct the deep state to do anything. Now, if the Bushes, both Bushes together, cannot make a lasting deal to stabilize Northern Europe and North Asia, then, then basically maybe the whole thing's out of control and institutionally it all has to go because if those two guys together could not prevail on the system to make a lasting stable deal, then no I one mean, can. I mean, think about what you're saying. I mean, he basically just fed into every American's deep state conspiracy theory because, I mean, think about yep. it. it. It's like, how scary is it? It's like those motherfuckers can't even make a deal Every yep. other motherfucker couldn't make it. I mean, he names names of people like, hey, you know, this guy said this. Yep. And then a couple of months later, he got back to me and said, oh, fuck that. Never mind. Pretend I never said it. You know, yep. so it's like it just reinforces the whole idea. Like, who's really calling the fucking shots? Because like you said, Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. and Cheney as the side man, they couldn't get nothing. Couldn't I mean, get nothing. There's some, there's some motherfuckers that really got, you know, I guess they got the, the purse strings for real.
I mean, so anyway, obviously this, something's going yeah. on, and he was perfect. You know, he says he 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 mentions it without accusation and just leaves the door open so you can go ask the questions. No, I, don't, I don't think he's playing American politics there. I think he's making the point that there needs to be a new architecture in Europe. And what the point I want to make here before Naomi says something is, you know, that it's interesting that Putin sent his message to Europe and the U.S. And it's interesting how little he talked about the BRICS, right? Now, I've, I've got some insight here, and that is that the Russian economy is very well suited to Europe. Trade with Europe and trade with America makes Russians rich. Trade with China, not so much, right? Like, really not so much. It might be, it might be a politically useful to talk about how chummy all the bricks are, but the bricks aren't really all that chummy and, and, and China doesn't make anybody all that rich by trading with them compared to Europe. And so, and I know this from my own work background, but there's also the cultural aspect. Remember Putin is a politician in Russia. Russians would rather have peace with Europe and America. Russians actually like Americans. Russians would like to be part of the West economically and culturally. And I think that it was really interesting that Putin was not bellicose. Putin really was trying to lay out a way back towards peace with Europe. You know, he was feeding the Germans bones by blaming Poland for World War II, which I thought was Lavrov-level trolling, right? But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, and, but, but really he was conspicuously silent about the, 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 what, the wonderful bricks and how great it is to be trading with India and China and selling them his oil at like, you know, $20 less per barrel. I think, I think Putin is a Russian politician and I think he very much wants to do a deal and I think Trump will have heard that. And I think that really the common ground is restructuring NATO. NATO, and I think this is also what he was talking about with like the deep state and the, and the lack of cohesion and the lack of sensibility even amongst <coughs> the deep state is like the Bush clan. I think he's making the point that NATO is, is yesterday's project and that it's standing in the way of, uh, the, the, you know, a more productive relationship. And I think what he's offering America there He's offering them the reserve currency back. Now, that is a big deal, right? That is a big deal. And I think that's why Trump thinks that he can probably bring peace about because he can do business with that. Anyway, that, that's my two points. But Naomi, you, you had your finger up. Okay, well, I wanted to, I wanted to, to say that this whole diatribe that he went into about history, there was, a, there was a sneaky little thing that he was trying to do there. Back in 19, in the 90s, when the U.S. was negotiating um, the um, the Bucharest memos, um, the Carnegie Center published a paper written by Barry, Barry, um, what the heck was his name? Hold on a second. Barry Posen called the Bastion Strategy. And what they were doing was they were think tanking um, a war between Ukraine and Russia. Okay. And everything that was written in that paper has actually happened. And a lot of the things that he was saying in his historical um, narrative was written about in that paper. So he was indirectly speaking to the people that he thinks, um, you know, pull the strings because that was kind of like, are you guys following me? That paper was like a whole plan for going to war with Russia. Um, yeah. And the thing about this paper was, is they concluded that Ukraine could not win a war against Russia. The paper concluded that they couldn't win a war against Russia. And the only point um, for the United States to back Ukraine in such a war would be to weaken Russia economically. And so he was trying to say, OK, you guys already saw this coming. You knew that Ukraine wasn't going to be able to win a war. You were wrong about how it was going to weaken Russia. So he's speaking to, to, to those people, the people behind the scenes. But the paper also said how um, what they need to do is pump up the nationalist um, identity for Ukraine, um, the zealots to prepare them to fight this war that they knew they were going to lose in order to weaken Russia. 
but the paper said that um, it was going to be difficult for them to bring, bring in that net the, the the Nazis, the Ukrainian Nazis, uh, even though even though they could see that they could be losing, and that the only way that they were going to be able to rein them in is to just stop funding them. Okay, which we're seeing right now because they're not going to they're not going to fund the Ukraine Ukrainian war anymore. So he was speaking to that audience. I caught I picked that up. The other so thing too, like by Gary, what he's saying, Gary Posen, if you guys want to, I can post that picture Posen, okay. um, in yeah. the, the DP group so you guys can look at it. Yeah, do please. Yeah. That's really important. Yeah, you, you can see with that how they miscalculated because they're like, oh, you know, they're going to be able to get, you know, they probably thought Russia was going to collapse economically and then that would, you know, get what they wanted, but they mis that's where they miscalculated. The economy didn't go the way they wanted to to set the table for the other things. If you look you at know, Putin's closing it, point, his, his closing point there, that very poignant story about the Russians speaking, the people speaking perfect Russian saying Russians do not surrender and then being wiped out to a man. Uh, like that was astonishing. First of all, I don't know if it's true, but it's very clear sure. that he is, he's speaking to both the domestic and an external audience in that regard. And I think Naomi, thank you for bringing up that, that paper because that paper is almost Putin's key evidence in the post-war that he can wave at Ukrainians and say, you were suckered, you were played, you should never fall into the hands yeah. of the West again. They don't care about you. They did this to you. They dragged you into this, and it was a plan from the start, and to use it as a way to knit them back into the fold firmly. By the I just way, have to add that the paper also, I have to add that the paper also concluded that Ukraine was going to lose East Ukraine, you know, the, the Novorossiya. That at the end of that yeah. war, it would Crimea and you know all over with Donbass, all of that was going to end up returning to Russia. So they saw it all coming. It, oh, I mean, yeah, think they about saw it. it all coming. So that's probably what's going to happen. If you're saying that it generally went down according to the paper, you know, it it just proves right there that you know they followed this pay. They probably use this paper as a plan. And they, you know, and they predicted everything accurately. How bad the casualties were going to be, the fact they were going to lose Eastern Ukraine and all that. But for whatever reason, they 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 drink the Kool Aid and still do the same. Still do it when they know how it's going to end. It's ridiculous. Exactly, and, and all and all to weaken Russia. So yeah, they were sacrificing all of that. Over, over, overtly Russia, so. And and, and that's that. Overtly, totally Lindsey Graham says it. They didn't weaken Russia. So I mean, and, and they and mm -hmm. that's where they miscalculated the most, and you know they just drink the Kool Aid and act like that part is not happening. It's like you know they just discount the manufacturing increase, the doubling yeah. of the military budget. They just ignore it and act like you know it's still the plan. The plan is the plan, which is even more fucked up when you think about it. You know, it's like they basically know how it's going to end, but they're still going to do it anyway. Did anyone read too much into the Elon okay. Musk comments? Yeah. Can I? Okay. Go ahead, Vaz. I want to go after Vaz. Yeah. To Greg, the story about Russia don't surrender, I think it's true because Kirk Rita said that thing about more than six times over 10, 12 months ago. And they always say our goal is to weaken Russia. I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is weaken EU. Because at the moment, if you see who's winning this war, for me who's winning is United States and who's losing is the EU. Look at yeah. them at the moment. Um, EU is fucked. But, uh, if, if the EU is weakened, it, it won't be able it. to to buy uh, that, ma that much of the weaponry from uh, uh, American uh, military industrial complex. So I don't see, and, and they achieved it fully. Now they all have to buy, uh, you know, M uh, Abram tanks, uh, all the, you know, all the weaponry they have to buy from the US. They, they don't have their manufacturing except <laughs> France. They, are, they so are weak. They can't do anything. 
weaken they, if they weaken the EU, uh, it's gonna counter that. No, they depend. Them. You know, the, they see, want the EU the to depend on them. At the yes, moment, if true. you see these countries are fucked. Look at your so country. We discussed earlier Sorry. how, but, but as wars go on, uh, goals can change for both sides, and I think that that the that's part of what what is uh, what's the, what we've seen in Ukraine. It's not that there's like an incoherent strategy from the Western, you know, on Ukraine's Western backers. It's that at first they thought that they could really get get the victory. They really thought that they could do it. They were like, okay, the Russians are stretched. We, we can actually do this. You know, they're going to have to do a mobilization. Maybe that's politically not going to be feasible. How feasible is it going to be? This is going to be a massive propaganda loss, you know. Then that didn't work out. Um, they had a different idea. They're going to do the massive, they're going to repeat their successful offensive, right? They're going to do the summer counter offensive. That also didn't pan out. So I think now what, they're, what they want to do is they want to hold on to as much of Ukraine as they can. They, they don't mind partitioning partitioning it, cutting their losses, and uh, trying to get away with as much as, as they can. But number one, you, now you have an issue with the Ukrainians themselves, which the ones that I've spoken with that are actually out there fighting the war, a, to a, a large extent, they're still totally it, on board with, yeah, we're going to get Crimea back someday, you know? Because <laughs> uh, they're also heavily propagandized there as well. Um, so... The Ukrainian soldiers are on that le- wavelength. Then Zelensky and you know Zeluzhny are on their own wavelength. They're doing their own thing. They probably want to see what they can do to cut their losses, get the golden parachutes going. Zelensky is playing some political intrigue thing. Going. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to lose power because you know for whatever re- you know whatever complicated dark deep reasons that that they're going to uncover, you know, about him. So I think that everybody is kind of. Uh, while the Ukrainians are pulling for that, our goals have changed to, hey, if we can just hold on to Odessa, we can hold on to a lot of this farmland that we bought for hella cheap. Uh, we build another nuclear power plant or two in Ukraine. Uh, we maybe get our hands on some fossil fuel resources. Uh, but then we could still get a, a huge chunk of what we of what we really want with Europe, which is basically lock in our vassals you know lock in the economic rents that they're gonna have to pay for the exorbitant prices they're gonna have to pay for food right but there's a lot of farmer protests going on right now because um it's getting more difficult for farmers to make ends meet well the the plan right ideally is to be able to if let's say they hold on to odessa they uh sell hella cheap ukrainian grain which is right now being used as animal feed flood those European markets, get whatever you can in terms of fossil fuels, uh, charge exorbitant prices for that, you know, maybe liquefied natural gas being transported by ship is not uh, the super long-term uh, and solution. You, you maybe they think they're going to have uh, actually, because remember, they found off of Odessa, not Odessa, sorry, off of Crimea, they found natural gas fields. That was the thing before the war started that they found there was ma- lots of reserves, huge reserves of natural gas. Uh, well, wait, before we get into the whole energy economics thing in which, frankly, this group maybe not necessarily the at, at the moment, not maybe doesn't have the right expertise mix for. But I, before we leave the Putin interview and get onto that, let's make the bridge point here, which is. Putin did one thing militarily and one thing economically that I don't think we've really discussed yet in, in the interview. And the military thing he did was he said, we pulled back from Kiev and Kharkov. And he's basically taking away that part of the narrative that said Ukraine achieved anything. So that is a, an attempt to undermine that morale situation and to make that case that may not have been made to Tucker's audience. But the Nobody's economic gonna... point, the economic point, to, I'm going to link it to yours in a sec, is that when you raise that issue of potentially bringing back the U.S. reserve currency, slowing down the BRICS transition and such, you inherently have opened up the potential of something like a resource revenue split in the in the Black Sea. It makes you can't go and extract gas or or neon or anything when you're under missile attack. So the only thing that makes any sense, if there's going to be any continued tension and still a Ukraine 
is that they agree to do it together and then share the revenues. And we, we have seen this kind of a deal at least set up for the Eastern Mediterranean uh, where Gaza, okay, sure. Lebanon, and Israel do it, right? right so great. so um, that's, that's all part of it. But, but you're getting way ahead of yourself when you talk about the construction of a post- uh, war Ukraine because well, that okay. thing hold doesn't up, have up. an economy yet. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I don't know what the outcome of post-war Ukraine will be. All I'm just saying is that the goals have are shifting. The goals have shifted for the different sides, and the fact that some Ukrainians are still motivated by some of the old goals, you know. But meanwhile, we're already talking about other stuff, right? Yeah. We're talking about well, yeah. uh, basically, we're good. Russia lost the war because they didn't take Kiev in three days. Um, yeah. So we can move on past that guy and we could say, okay, it's not total loss. It's a wash, you know, um, but, you know, so that however they end up, uh, however they end up spinning that, I don't really know. But what I'm saying is that right now, I don't think the goal is to be able to, maybe they were not going to get those gas fields off of Crimea, but maybe there's other stuff that they can get, you know, maybe, maybe they can't, won't be able to charge the exorbitant prices for uh, yeah. natural gas, but they'll be able to charge the exorbitant prices still for the uh, nuclear energy that they're going to be transferring to Europe uh, and for the, for the grain, right. Or whatever it is, so, so they're going to try to cut their losses to some degree and, and, and maintain some of that. And it seems like Putin, by being that kind of reasonable, you know, he's he's uh, he understands that. I think I don't know. That's that's kind of how I see it. Some people say he's definitely going to have to take all of Ukraine. He's going to have to go to the end. I don't know. I don't think Putin. Is, I don't see that in Putin. I don't think that he's that kind of that kind of a political operator. But anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Was it Bond next? I was just going to say. I, I mean, I don't really know what goals the Russians had for sure, and I don't think they've changed because the goal is. Realistically, everything east of the Dnieper, a land bridge to Trans Transnistria, control of Odessa, because Odessa is a Russian city. Putin said it, so it's not negotiable. They're going to get it one way or the other. They can get it the easy way or the hard way. They're fine with either way. And I think that's the bottom line, really. Their, yeah. their goals are the same. You know, the, the high-risk, high-reward operation to get Kiev to capitulate probably would have ended with them getting pretty much what they wanted. Maybe they would have had to share Odessa, but that would have only been a matter of time. It's not like they would have not taken it eventually or, or just got it like they got the Crimea at some point. But I mean, I don't think their goals have changed. I mean, obviously the Ukrainians goals constantly change because they have to grasp at straws, but really, I mean, Russia's going to get, they they're they're gonna get the territory they, they want. And they're gonna, uh, and that's their goal. And I mean, plus they gotta denazify the the, the Ukraine. They gotta demilitarize it. So once Warren, those oh, first two are accomplished, they can, a look they, they, the can they can Warren. get the other things. I, let me finish. I mean, once they denazify the country and demilitarize it, the rest of the territory comes. They can literally walk to it, drive through it. There's not gonna be. They're gonna. They can wait until there's nothing left to stop them. Sure, they have all the Warren, time in the world. Putin, Show yeah. during that interview, right, that he had already tried to negotiate before and that he was still willing to negotiate now. If they had I think, negotiated, I think before, the offers now are disingenuous because he knows the West will not take the offer. I mean, he said, You have to repeal the decree to negotiate with me. He mm -hmm. knows Zelensky's not going to repeal it. He knows Newland's not going to talk to him. That's he knows yeah. Biden's not going to talk to him. So if, in a if sense, there was it's a, a disingenuous offer. He just goes publicly and makes the offer publicly. It's on record that he made the offer when he knows damn well the other side. It's just like in Congress when yeah. a guy votes against a bill because he knows it's still going to pass and the party gets what they want. That's what it was. It's just I, I offer peace knowing damn well the other side isn't going to take it. So – it's not that's not all I'm saying about it. Interesting. He was also offering to do a referendum on who's uh, gonna join where, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, main 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 thing about uh, the nazification, only way to do it is basically just to do a total control of uh, absolute control of uh, Ukraine. All uh, wait, there all I disagree the because the last point I'm gonna make, I'm gonna have to drop soon, but the denazification point. Putin knows something that's going on there that maybe we don't all know, but there's a power struggle in Ukraine right now of control of the military, right, and also the presidency. Julia Timoshenko, 
I think that's her name, Yulia, has come out, and she's from far north Volnia, where they are strictly more Russian Orthodox there. It's an area that would probably belong in Belarus if there is a division. And she's the former, uh, I think, vice president or deputy prime minister. So somebody who definitely is in line for the possible presidency. She's propo She's demanded, really, that they send the SBU, the Nazi-backing troops, to the front lines because they are trained fighters and not to send 25 to 27-year-old conscripts and not to send the women they are drafting. If this proposal were achieved, the Russians would have a clear shot to exterminate all the Nazis on the front lines and the denazification would be effectively totally achieved. And then that aspect would be done. So this is a power struggle. This is part of the power struggle. I'm trying to figure out whether the new head of the Ukraine military is in with her plan or not. If he's not, then they're going to be putting ethnic Hungarian women, ethnic Russian women into fire zones and getting them slaughtered, the same as they were doing to the men. And the Nazis will stay in the back and aim guns at them. And you're right, then, Jura, then the only solution is to take the whole country. But Timoshenko knows this. The way to preserve most of the country in Ukraine is to send the Nazis to the front line to be physically exterminated. So that's what you need to watch for, is that motion and how they deal with the conscripts but versus SBU the, at the front line. Yeah, where, where, where is Zersky's loyalty? Is Zersky favored by the right or part of the right? Or is he... Timoshenko was first Nazi before anyone else showed up. She was first slave, American slave, uh, long before Maidan. Okay, long before she fell uh, ill. She was the first offering a very radical anti Russian propaganda. And it uh, didn't work. She tried to save you. herself. Yeah. Does hey, Zersky have any affiliation with the right sector or right, or is he not because he's ethnically Russian? I mean, is I mean, obviously there's always a chance he could switch sides and save people, but I'm just saying, I mean, is there any of, I mean, I saw that his son like said some nasty shit about him and called him a traitor or some crap, but I mean, I just wonder, you know, does he have some affiliation like, with the right sector, like Zaluzny implied with his photo, like they have a little safety net. His uh, clear career uh, career is uh, just wanting to follow orders. That's okay. what he did. I want to make a last point before I drop. Somewhere, you know, flag or I want to make a last point before I drop for Tajur, which is to remind him of a piece of history. At the Battle of Berlin, where millions of people die, the entire Hitler youth is sent in to die in the front lines, and the leader of the Hitler youth screws off and survives the war. So that is how Nazis behave. They throw in all of their, you know, suckers who they know are morons, who they know are evil. They don't care. At the end of the battle, at the end of the day, Timoshenko would happily throw the entire SBU in, take credit for getting them all killed once the war is over, and pretend she was never her plan in the first place. That's how Nazis behave. And so if she's consistent to type, she's now attempting to throw the SBU to the wolves so that she personally will survive the war. Yeah. Yeah, I always was uh, saying since I, after the war, here in the Balkans, I was always saying uh, patriots sacrifice themselves for the country, while nationalists want to sacrifice the country for their own ideals. That exactly. Are simply unachievable. That's Craig, what it is. Craig. It's always been like that. You assume that, uh, you know, she, she, she is evidently, you know, a very... A profound uh, nationalist, uh, Timoshenko, but she could. Uh, I, I, I don't see. I, I, I do see her as a possible uh, vojd of Western Ukraine under Russian protectorate. She's, she's evidently, she's, she's ideological, but she's also extremely uh, uh, opportunistic in nature. You see now how she's opposing all these laws. Uh, she's, she's proposing to send the yeah. Nazis to the front. Yeah. I see that. I think also. I think that Vengsar wants to say something because he's been hold, holding his finger up for hours. And, I agree. Uh, she's she's essentially a Christian Freeland in Ukraine, ready to shift the winds and dodge the blame and take the big job, like exactly the same kind of person. But this this is how Nazis behave, and like it's a common behavioral pattern across their entire existence. <laughs> Watch your back, Greg. Yeah. Watch your so, back. You live in in Canada. 
and you keep naming the freelance, freelance. She's gonna come yep. after you, you know? She's more important than you might realize. If you go back to the 1986 uh, trip she took or whatever to, to USSR, there was an entire KGB file on her and an entire book written on how much one person can do damage to the USSR. She was single-handedly responsible uh, for restarting a important and critical extreme nationalist movement in Ukraine by pushing for uh, blaming the Soviets and not the Germans for an important uh, uh, execution that happened in World War II. And she essentially and reopened up all those ties and wounds. Yeah, they, they despise her there. Holomodor. She was promoting Holomodor yeah. uh, very, yeah. very highly. Yeah. Yeah. The, CIA, the CIA history book of Ukraine, which, you know, under examination pretty much falls apart, that, that essentially that the Holodomor was some kind of planned thing that Russians did to Ukrainians, when in fact Ukrainians executed, Georgians are in charge of the USSR, and more Russians die in it, and there were always famines there, and the Soviets just are there for the last one. Like, the Holodomor narrative is constructed in a way to encourage a victim mentality similar to what we see to a Holocaust narrative it, that has created genocidally racist Zionism. It, it's, it's a well-known path. You get people to see themselves as innate victims with everyone against them, and then you transfer the generational trauma. But as Desmond Tutu proved, generational trauma is transferred with interest until some generation decides to default on it. Yeah, End of I mean, story. Um, yeah. The whole Ukrainian identity project has been basically hijacked by these yes. narratives as if that, that these are the myths that have built the nation, you know. But at the same time, Ukraine is supposedly super old and ancient, you know, been around since forever. But, you know... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, the founding myth of the country is that there the whole the more happened. Okay, um, so yeah, I that's mean, that's important stuff. Put one of my issues lesson. that I always talk you, about. I always when, that up. The whole the more. The, I call it the whole the more. Yeah. You because know what? I, this is, happened, but it wasn't a man-made famine. That's that's I'm, the myth. I'm not into personal storytelling, but my people, my grandparents' people, the German Mennonites of the Ukraine, who had a Volga German SSR until the for until the war. They're completely wiped out. They're victims of genocide on a scale that is unimaginable even to European Jews. It's almost like you're looking at me and I'm like one of the last ones. The language is gone. The life way is gone. The people are gone. Ukraine was full of minorities. It still has Roma. It still has Greek Orthodox. It still has Hungarians. To portray it as Ukrainians versus Russians is itself a genocidal caricature. It creates the disastrous binary horror that we saw. And that's why I'm so opposed to it. Because even though you could probably blame Stalin more than Hitler for what happened to my grandparents' people, and I could tell you stories about that that would make you cry on the same level that what's going on in Gaza makes a rational person cry. The response to it is never genocidal rhetoric. The response to it is never the statement that you cannot live next to people. The answer it is never to demean them as human beings. The answer is never trying to seek hundred or thousand to one retribution ratios. Look at Israel. Look at Israel. There is the case for why that can never work. Never work. The right answer is to stand against genocidal racism, to stand for the slow progress of international law, to never let genocidal racists actually control a state ever, and to systematically cut off the sources of supply and eliminate the people responsible for the rhetoric. That is how you do it. That is what's happening at ICJ, and it's going to come down on Ukraine too. Those Nazis will disappear either on the battlefield or at The Hague. Now, unfortunately, Arabs do not have the courage to do what Russians did have the courage to do and go and rescue the stateless people who were abandoned by the government that was supposed to protect them that had control of them that will be corrected in both cases and ukraine and israel may both not be on the map oh, as a direct result that's not a good idea <laughs> regardless they are regardless. they already say the arab hates them you know if you, all the arab countries it would be nice oh. if it could happen in both no, cases no, no. without a general invasion of the, the entirety problem, of the country the problem, it would be good 
the problem let's hope is South the, Africa wins that, Europeans, right? Let's hope. The Europeans stuff that bullshit in the Second World War. And now they feel sorry. They don't know how to respond to Israel. So they supporting what Israel is doing at the moment there in Gaza. Well, now Germany has picked a side, guilt. right? Germans feel guilt. They don't know what the, to the, the Germans. The Germans have picked a side, and we know that the German side in, is always the losing side. So now France can, can go against the German side, and then we can win. The axis of genocide is settled. Now we set up the allies. I really do view it that way. Nazism and Zionism have become a sad two sides of the same coin with the dehumanization, with the the, the the cabinet ministers talking genocidal rhetoric in public, declaring genocidal intents, with the co universal conscription into an army that is then sent in to uh, both do and then ultimately suffer genocidal outcomes. This is all insane. I have more respect for the Russians because their combat to civilian death ratio is so much better than the Israelis. But ultimately, I don't believe in things like conscription for this reason. Once you can pull in everybody, you then have control of their minds. You then tell them how to look at people. You, you then shape their whole future. You, you, you create child soldiers from birth. This happened in both Israel and Ukraine and tragically in Palestine, Gaza too. This has to stop. And the only way it can stop is with the effective imposition of something like the ICJ rule. And thank, thank all the gods that exist that South Africa came forward with its case. Thank Nicaragua for charging the countries that are, that are, that are arming this genocide. I'm glad Canada is named by Nicaragua as a supplier to the genocide. International law has to work, right? I mean, it's like, maybe it's just me and Houthi S. Truman left here you know, to support the, the genocide convention. But when Truman signed it, he intended it to apply to the U.S. He intended it to apply to Israel, the country he ruled and the country he recognized. So let's make it work for Harry. Like, ultimately, that's the vi only way that any of these structures, like the U.N., can ever work. And, you know, I'm glad to see Wakar here. I wanted his opinion on what's happening in Pakistan, yet another CIA destabilization campaign. And... You know, go Imran Khan, in my opinion. But I'd love to see what he has to say about that outcome. Yeah, I think Pakistan. Yeah, Pakistan is again witnessing an upheaval. Uh, if you look at the popular vote, most of it has gone to uh, the independents, who are uh, supported by the Imran Khan's party. Uh, but definitely in Pakistan, parliamentary democracy, you know, there's a lot of give and take. And a lot of uh, post-election, uh, I would say, uh, give and take, a lot of money is pumped in. And the two parties uh, which are contesting, Ran Khan, are now trying to basically buy into uh, the votes of the members. Some of them, they have broken. So it's, it's a very interesting situation. And uh, uh, the popular vote is on one side, whereas uh, the old political parties uh, supported by a lot of money is on the other. And but people are not charged, you know, because uh, they came, especially the youth came uh, in flocks to vote. I was there on the streets of Islamabad, and uh, because I also cover one of the TV channels, so we were seeing it what was happening. So it was almost uh, youth voted like 60 to 65 percent, which is unprecedented in Pakistan's history. Uh, and then we have people who were uh, poor or from villages, so across the board, I think. Uh, Imran Khan party has done well, uh, but somehow, uh, but they are going to definitely form a government at least two large states. That's my reading, because there's no other way. And maybe the change comes. So it's a very, very interesting, uh, I would say, political situation in Pakistan. And if it's not, uh, let's say, managed properly, it can become troublesome. Hey, Wakar, uh, I watched. I don't know if it was your last one, but it was the wiki talks where you were talking about the strike in Baluchistan and then the counter strike in Iran. And I'll tell you what, dude, when you closed that and you were like, you know, like rest assured, Pakistan is awake. 
Pakistan is aware and Pakistan will retaliate if it needs to. I mean, it was, I, I, I don't, I'm paraphrasing it, but I swear, man, that was dead. I mean, that was like, that was just like laying the law down without laying the law down. <laughs> like, I was just like, damn. I mean, it was just like deadly serious. I mean, I, that was a good report on everything. And then just the way you closed it out was just like, damn, you know, it was hardcore. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, basically, uh, in case of Pakistan, it's, it's uh, slightly different. Uh, if you look at the, uh, it considers itself to be a nuclear power. And uh, military is definitely very, very strong. Now, we, if you look at the border, uh, I think uh, with India, it's not uh, very comfortable. It's most like a hostile border. And then we have Afghanistan where Taliban came and there was a hope that after the American exit, uh, it's going to settle down. But somehow, they have been using uh, terrorism as a leverage. And then came Iran out of nowhere. Because Iran-Pakistan border is, again, very interesting. Historically, uh, there is a lot of trade. And mind you, we are part of the uh, long time back, the RCD, where Pakistan, Iran, and Turkey, it's a land connection, even the train. You can travel by train to Turkey. A lot of folks go to Europe through this route. And then there are cultural uh, linkages, especially in Rajasthan. And there are two Rajasthans. One is in Iran, which is known as the Sistan, Rajasthan, the other is in Pakistan. So it means people living across have the same, uh, mostly they are Sunni, unlike uh, majority of Iran, which are Shia. So it's very different dynamics. Now, when it, uh, Pakistan is struck by an external power, uh, it has to respond <clears throat> because uh, otherwise it becomes a precedent. Uh, like what happened with India in 2019, uh, there was an attack uh, in, basically in the cover of terrorism. And then we had to respond uh, through Air Force. So that has been the policy because if you allow it, then it becomes starts affecting the deterrence. So that's yeah, where I mean, basically it was a military message. Yeah. Yeah, it was just it was just an excellent. I mean, just the way you presented it, it's like, I mean, because we know you, we know your background. It's like it's like you know a former general, and he just laid out the policy, and it was like deadly serious. I mean, it was like just not fucking around. I mean, you just laid it out like. With it, we, we're aware we're ready if you want to fuck around and find out come on i mean i just i just <laughs> was, that was very impressive closing it, it really you know i'm not i'm not iranian or pakistani but it definitely sent the message loud and clear the question yeah, i had for wakar was kind of a big thought i had a day or two ago was is there potential for a kind of a grand plan for central asia where I mean, I saw this sometimes expressed by Imran Khan, when, especially when he expressed some admiration for India's ability to stand up for itself and reject Western demands and so on. And when I see that the issues between India and China, to me, look like they are basically boiled down to Tibet and a bunch of very minor border issues. That's it. And so what I've never understood is how does that continue to be such a huge irritant when it's such a small bit of not very valuable land, the only big issue seems to be Tibet. And so uh, if there's no threat of a U.S. or U.K. military in, uh, presence in, in an independent Tibet threatening China, which I think there isn't, then why can't all of these strong allies like Russia and India are pretty strong together? China and Russia are pretty strong together. Um, and why can't these minor issues be settled in a kind of a grand plan that guarantees Western intervention is totally unwelcome and locked out of the region and that they will mutually somehow settle issues like Kashmir or, you know, mountain passes in the Himalayas or, you know, uh, Tibetan or Uyghur autonomy? Like, it seems to me there should be enough champions. Muslims in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Tibetans in India and others to, to actively set up some kind of resolution there. Uh, that it doesn't seem to me any of those issues is big enough to potentially break out into World War III. So why don't they just decide it's not going to and make some kind of a grand plan to exclude the West from the region? And that's that was my question for Wakar, but I think he... Uh, he fell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe he pressed the wrong button or something there. He dropped out. <laughs> or maybe the CIA doesn't want him answering that question. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> oh, you, you said something wrong. You know? Then he's like, no, 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 no. Oh, he reply. Yeah, but the rivalry between China and India is, real, is really a bit strange in terms that 
there is less consensus created and more like a, a type of um, strategic uh, geopolitical competition. And the, the Indians see themselves being closure what, uh, uh, what the Chinese are just get, uh, trying to get alternative ways of, um, of getting to the seas or different new land corridors. And yep. the Indians see that as a, a competition in terms of their potential uh, backyard. But their potential mm -hmm. backyard is just potential because they haven't been strong enough to develop it. And uh, yes, let's also not forget, because this is so rhetorical, let's also not forget that India is part of the BRICS with China. India is part of the uh, Shanghai Security Organization with China. And India have these kinds of strange, uh, almost secret uh, summits with uh, the so-called RIC, Russia, yeah. India and China. So they actually are cooperating much more than, uh, than what we see. And like Craig, you said... Yeah. These are minor things that are exponential in the in the media, like being big things. But yeah, it's what it is. My, but my last point before I drop, I agree with that completely. But we made the point a little earlier that, that Toby made, I think, that that being China's Canada and supplying it with raw materials and not building up much manufacturing of its own because China always does that itself is not as good a deal as the one they were had with Europe where France would do things like buy big industrial magnets and things for its fusion reactors. So like if Putin has a choice of strategies, then really his first strategy probably is back to status quo and to development and with the West in the in the harmonious way that they were trying to proceed. And uh, the second choice is probably what I suggested, a grand rapprochement with China, Pakistan, India, where they exclude the region and build it up as a whole. And the only the third choice is you end up as China's Canada, managing the indigenous people and the northern resources and the Arctic for basically the new hegemon, which is like third choice. We, we see we see Russia very engaged in trying to balance the power of China as well. They are cooperating, but they are also man, uh, uh, managing. And when we see that the, the Russians are actually selling energy at lower prices to India intentionally, they are mm -hmm. trying to make them grow. Yeah. Um, they are trying to make them grow, and they are offering them also kind of uh, um, uh, corridors for them to sell into uh, Russia. So we can't be expecting the Russians to be selling uh, ore or uh, or oil or gas through uh, through uh, railways. So actually, what they are saying to the Indians is, "Look, you we have these railways here. Bring your stuff here to us. It's faster, and you, we give you uh, raw materials because India is also not very rich in the raw materials, and you you work them cheaper and sell to us." And I think it, there was a, something very interesting working in. You say, I have been listening a lot of integration of Pakistan into the international nor uh, north and south corridor. So Russia is even trying to put those conflicts aside between yeah. India and Pakistan. They are too yeah. disturbing for commerce and business. Hey, just real quick before you go back to Wakar. I would assume those minor things you're talking about, to me, it would seem like they would use the Belt and Road Initiative to smooth out the differences and show people the light and the benefits and the money and the opportunity. That would that would be my guess. It is. Yeah. But don't forget the linkage, right? Because the Russian INSTC and the Chinese BRI meet in the South Caspian in Iran. So militarily, Russia and China absolutely must back Iran in any conflict. And so does well, Turkey, because Turkey can't allow the Kurds to break loose and create a Kurdistan threat to him. So essentially... That is that's where the two conflicts intersect, like the Ukraine Russia issues and the Middle East issues intersect at that whole point that Iran is so central to the BRI and the INSTC. Which I mean, I just assume they'll India. use Belt and Road to to create the economic deals they need, and you know, basically like, hey, we'll give you economic opportunity, and you can operate under this umbrella of protection between whatever the big players are. You know, they'll you know they'll provide the protection. You can trade and do whatever you want. That's all I'm saying. I would assume they would just come up with a plan like that and offer it to the Tibetans. You know. Maybe the Chinese won't like it, but maybe they'll say, yeah, you're part of China, but you're autonomous as long as you give us a cut of this or whatever. And, 
you know, don't have opportunity, don't have access to markets. I mean, they'll just make them the deal they can't refuse. Yeah, whatever you know, satisfies we the West it. barely enough that there's no excuse to intervene in the region. That, but, that's but all that's needed. Going back, I got to drop Craig for now, though. Said, going to, with what Craig just said, which is very interesting, the the conflict in um, uh, Balustan with uh, uh, Iran and Pakistan made it also something very uh, evident, also for India, that the the stability of each country is important for everybody. Everything is connected, is interconnected. So um, Balustan. So it's where the, the railway and the port, the Shalabart, which is the most important port, will be established. So there can't be any conflict there. So it's very interesting how things are if you, if, uh, if changing towards this perception that the stability of one country is my stability as well. And before we had something different, which was the instability of my neighbor is my, is my, uh, <laughs> is almost uh, my benefit. Walker, sorry, go on. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I had to change the phone because the battery went down. Now, uh, on, I, I'll just start with the Pakistan-Russia relation. It's a very uh, interesting study. Uh, and then we come to Eurasia and what's happening in the region. Now, Pakistan-Russia relation has been, uh, you know, in the start, in the 50s, uh, there was an offer by both sides. And 47 Pakistan came into existence. And there was an offer by Russians and the <coughs> Americans. Because there was a you know, Cold War was at peak, and somehow uh, the leadership at that time decided to uh, side with the U.S. And there is a reason also, because a lot of Pakistani leadership was studied in uh, in mainly U.K. at that time. They were educated because we were part of the British colony, and uh, basically it's an anglophone country if you look at the language, uh, the official language. So, so that was the beginning. Uh, but Russia has been trying hard to. Let's establish uh, the biggest uh, steel plant in Pakistan uh, was built by the Russians. This is the only large scale steel industry in Karachi and still exists, you know. <clears throat> so and uh, mind you, I was one of the initial guys who started uh, interacting with the Russian media. So I've traveled twice there, took the media delegation. Uh, this was five, six years back. And we stayed in Moscow and traveled to St. Petersburg. And we developed very good relationship because we were opening the media to Russian media. I even appear at RT, uh, you know, especially RT Arabic. So, so the ice was broken, uh, but definitely economic relationship has existed. Now, they, after the Chinese uh, BNR came in, and there was talk of Eurasian integration, uh, because it was realized in Pakistan, in many circles, that we are connected, and somehow uh, the Western Bloc has kept <laughs> this uh, integration, you know, and played it uh, against each other. And that's why we are suffering. So by and by, like Pakistan is now applying for BRICS. I think they have already applied to be a member of the BRICS. Uh, and uh, in the last, I think in November, they're going to be summit in Russia. Where Russia is the current president of BRICS. And uh, now, unless India objects, because it's a very senior member, the pioneering member, Pakistan will get in. So it means in the larger game, there's an understanding of Eurasian Brotherhood and survival, even uh, people talk of uh, Euro Asian Africa, because this is the actual uh, word island, as they call it, is all connected. So, so there's a realization. So, there are groups in Pakistan, the old school of thought who studied in the West, mostly influenced like in bureaucracy, in military, uh, even in judiciary. And then there's a new school of thought which feels that no, uh, we should be having good relations with neighbors, uh, with the uh, and this BNR project, Pakistan's uh, CPEC was the flagship project, mind you. When the BNR started, uh, the first project was the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And the Americans had a lot of objection on giving, let's say, Gwadar port for commercial use to China. Because this opens a new route to Chinese South, uh, sorry, the Northwest. And then they can uh, actually, in case Malacca State or Indian Ocean is blocked, so this is a good route for energy. And, and it's not only just, uh, you know, one road, there is uh, internet connectivity, then there is, uh, because Chinese are laying uh, submarine cable, oil and gas, and then, of course, commerce and trade. And uh, we can travel from here through Afghanistan, to Central Asia, to Russia, we can travel to Europe. So Pakistan is kind of on a crossroad, which connects a lot of, uh, the only problem is hostility with, I think, India, the day this thing is settled. And I think there is a realization on both sides, the conflict 
as I think was brought, uh, uh, pointed out by uh, Povo that this was the old school of thought that you can undermine the other side and then grow. But here is a realization that you have to grow together. So, so these two schools of thoughts are clashing, but by and large, even if you look at the current vote, it has gone to uh, the Imran Khan's party is basically an anti-American vote. So people feel it. I think I think one thing too, like you're talking about, also pushing out Western influence or act, you know, control or ways to meddle. I think once they got to a point where they had their agreements and mutual cooperation, the easiest thing to do would be to create like a multinational security force made up of like Russian, Chinese, Indians, and Pakistanis that would be there with the construction crew to protect the equipment. That way it deters the CIA and other people from maybe interfering because you would potentially be starting shit with four, three or four countries, you know, when instead of it just being, oh, it's, you know, the Pakistani troops here or the Indian troops here. I mean, that would probably be the cheapest way once you have secured the agreements for access to build and all that and the cooperation, then you would put these, you know, multinational troops there to help, you know, maybe even use military engineers from the different countries to help prep the road and the construction that way it's just a deterrent to keep western influence and meddling out i mean that's the whole goal anyways it's to be a you know a quarantined route that avoids sanctions and problems and offers opportunity and benefit to a lot of places that haven't had it in the past yeah i think it's a, the idea is already existing if you look at the sco shanghai cooperation organization which i would say is the uh, mother of what's going to be the expansion of BRICS. Uh, the idea was a political and economic uh, integration, and the SEO has a security apparatus also. Now, you'll be surprised that there are uh, military exercises uh, in which SEO takes part. Indian and Pakistani troops are participating together. It's very strange. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like you would take the BRICS countries, and maybe they'd each add, add a few guys to a contingent that just yeah. kept the uh, construction crew and the equipment and the materials safe as they went along. And that way, it, it, it's a deterrent because you don't. Are you going to start shit with twenty countries or seventeen countries or however many people are there? You know, because you know if you do, and then on top of that, you know, at least fifty percent of the world is on the side of building the road and the Belt and Road Initiative, and you know the the multipolar world. So, I mean, it 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 just creates another level of risk that prudent people would be like, eh, you know, maybe we should just stay out of this one and maybe try to make our own deal with it. You know, I just figure that's the easiest way to keep the West out of there. Yeah, it's, it's a good idea. But if you look at, uh, I normally, you know, or discuss even in Pakistani forum that uh, the BNR or integration of uh, Eurasia had three major corridors, like the Northern Corridor, uh, in my opinion, was supposed to integrate China, Russia, even passing through Ukraine to Europe, uh, including the energy supplies. And then you had the Central Corridor, which is basically China, Pakistan, <clears throat> and going to Europe. And then you had the maritime route, which passes through um, the Red Sea. And also another route, which actually now touches Africa, because like Tanzania is becoming an important uh, conduit, because uh, if the Gulf is blocked, then there has to be a land route between from center of Africa. Uh, and then comes the southern Africa. So to all told, I think you are right that uh, like northern route is now technically blocked. Uh, the China, Russia, European route because of the war. And I don't know, somehow I have a feeling that it's it's a conspiracy against the BNR project on integration of Eurasia because you create war or conflict and then you start blocking the economic integration. And same probably is happening in the Middle East uh, because uh, India is dependent, like $200 billion a year trade passes through Red Sea. China is dependent and now you have a war which is blocking these states. So I think it's a good suggestion that they should have a multinational force, something like NATO, and they can sort out uh, problems and provide security. Like in Pakistan for CPEC, Pakistan had to create uh, two divisional size forces to protect the CPEC, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So two divisional means six brigades were just meant to guard the route uh, because they were attacked by some of the sub-nationalist groups. Uh, so, so I think it is important for economic integration. You require force to protect it. It's just a good idea. Yeah. 
Waka, can I ask you? Waka, okay, I've got questions as well. Okay, well, just very quickly, I noticed that Iran has now become a full member of the SCO quite recently. Yes, that's right. Iran right, is so all part do you, of... Do you think that the, the military coordination between the members of the SCO, which include China, Russia, and India, and Pakistan, and now Iran, do you think that has emboldened them in the, in the Middle East? And do you think it also weakens any Western potential action against them? Yeah, initially it started as a, uh, the military part of there. It's a smaller tool. Uh, it started as something for uh, anti-terrorist activities. So we look at the military exercises, like I think one happened in Russia, uh, known as Druzba or something like that. And uh, this was in the uh, eastern part of, uh, central part of Russia, closer to, I think, Kazan. So, so there's a thought that there should be integration. And if you look at the countries, they are very large militaries. Uh, one of the largest militaries, if you look at the top 10, uh, at least in terms of size, so uh, six to seven belong to SCO, like China, uh, we have Russia, India, Pakistan, Iran, uh, and now you have uh, some of the Central Asian republics. So it becomes a very large, uh, there's a lot of potential. The only thing is how do you minimize the friction, like Iran, Pakistan, friction should not have happened. Because in the last three years, there was an effort to declare the border the border of peace. Uh, there's already a lot of trade which takes place uh, because a lot of Iranian oil, which despite sanction, comes through Pakistan through illegal means, mind you, because the survival of Balochistan is on the Iranian oil. So that's why. And so there are a lot of smuggling gangs also which operate on the border. And somehow this confusion between Iran and Pakistan uh, was created by these groups. But now things have settled down. Just after this clash, Iranian foreign minister was here because they were signaling from Pakistan that on one side we are trying to <clears throat> integrate and then you are basically because of suspicion, uh, because it was a very serious thing to attack Pakistan with missile, or the reaction time is very less. So I think if you, we can come uh, overcome the frictions and uh, look at the integration, uh, there's a lot of potential, huge potential. This will become uh, the economic hub of the world because almost it will control two-thirds of the global GDP. Uh, this do, you think, do you think the SCO will um, support Iran militarily? So in other words, if, if Iran were attacked, would the SCO see that as an attack on one of its members and would they meet uh, to discuss it in the same way as NATO might meet if a NATO member was attacked? Not so far, because if you look at the uh, the, the military component, uh, so far it's, I would say, it's more related to terrorism. Uh, it's not become a, a potent uh, military instrument like NATO uh, or conditional. Uh, and I think within SCO, so far we have not reached the level that attack on one country becomes. But I think it's a start, uh, because when the SCO started, role, it was more like an economic union. And then came the political part of it. And then comes the military, which is very, very normal. Because uh, there are countries which have uh, already, uh, you know, some arrangements or, let's say, uh, with the West. Uh, so it's very uh, difficult to stay away. Like, uh, even I, I will just bring in India. Uh, and at time, we criticize India for being uh, in the two very large blocks, that you are part of the SCO and BRICS, which is uh, per se an anti-Western block. And on the other side, in Indo-Pacific, uh, you are basically pitched against one of the senior members. So, so this is the kind of dilemma the developing world faces in a transition period. Uh, like in Indo-Pacific, one, it is against uh, China. The other is it's indirectly against Russia. <clears throat> because if Russia-China alliance is important, then I think anything against one of these two becomes indirectly against the, the third one. So, so these are the, I think, dichotomies that we have to overcome. Uh, and then uh, West would play on our differences, <clears throat> like India-China border. Uh, although some people consider it to be a minor issue, uh, it is 3,500 kilometer long, uh, undemarcated border. So it's the longest undemarcated border. So it, it's a huge problem that there are two very large countries, big military powers, and they have not settled their border. So this has to be resolved. Now both sides have very serious stance. There are areas in India which are claimed by China, like Indian Northeast, uh, Arunachal Pradesh. One of the state is almost claimed by China. They call it South Tibet. And uh, in case of Chinese accession, 
India feels that that was their part, and these are held by the other side. Then is the issue of Dalai Lama, who is a Chinese renegade from Chinese side, and is hosted by India. So, so these are, I think, some of the problems which will take time. And I think there is an understanding between India and China also because the trade is hundred billion dollars, mind you, and other side is friction. So, so this is a kind of it's not a very black and white thing. So we have to gradually transit. Uh, Indian, uh, you know, dependency on the West in terms of exports is huge. Indian diaspora in the West is like fifty uh, million, I think, maybe more than that. So there's a lot of dependency. They go for education. Their IT industry is integrated with the West. So, so if you are transiting, there has to be an alternative. So India has gone for a multi-alignment strategy. I think for last almost fifteen years, that you basically balance it out with other powers and then try to. Uh, build up because West has the capacity to scuttle your progress, bring in regime change, and you know bring you to zero. So so far this is the perception in developing world. But I think gradually the defiance by Iran, the defiance even I would say by Taliban uh, and by uh, Houthis in Red Sea is now actually exposed the Western military power that it's not something ten feet tall. And in case you can take on, so there's a lot of setbacks to Western military power. Even I would say Russia-Ukraine war has exposed them. I was, uh, you know, listening to Putin's interview uh, with uh, <clears throat> Tucker Carlson, and uh, I think he came up with uh, very good ideas in terms of offering it to West that conflict is not a solution, and also giving the history of Ukraine, the way he sees it uh, as part of the Russian land, and unfortunately. I feel that in case Ukraine doesn't realize, there are chances of balkanization of Ukraine. Yeah, uh, when it comes to India, call. like oh, yeah. okay, go on, yeah, go on. So when it comes to India, like now, like like us, so what I see is, um, like India, like they need really need to develop their manufacturing capabilities with the help of other nations, and th and this is something of, of, is, is their key goal mm -hmm. in in their political uh, uh, decision, and. Uh, at the same time, they don't want to you know, have a conflict with the whole world. So they want to trying to bring balance so that they can get good things from everyone. But at the same time, the, when the world is not united, it's very difficult for them to you know, choose the sides. And uh, yeah, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why they're trying to like be in this you know, different, different uh, you know, anti-China group. And at the same time, you know, pro like an anti-US group, they're trying to find a way, but it's, it's, I will say at some point, I think they have to come to a point that they have to decide what's best for them and they have to be very strong and they move forward with it. And that is something, you know, I, I mean, in the past 20 years, yeah, they like, they, they, they have some, you know, um, good politician, Prime Minister came, but but still now I think that there's lack of, lack of politic, political interest in there, you know, to find that to make a very strong path, I think during the Modi time, yes, the, the, the strong you know decision is being made in the political uh, in the political environment. But still, it's, it's not that strong enough to like you know. I know you have to choose uh, choose sides in a strong way because I, I will say, for example, uh, like Russia's hugely interest of India to invest in uh, Wild War stock, okay. But for a very strange reason, India want to invest there, but. There is a huge opposition from the from the U.S. side to not to do that. At the same time, you know, they they kind of finding middle ground, and and it's, and it's, it's always creates a lot of challenges, and it's not developing the India. At the same time, when it comes to China, China wants to develop its own economy, its own uh, population. At the same time, you know, uh, China wants to do business with India, you know, and India wants to also also want to do the same. So this Russia, China, India, also everyone wants to develop their own manufacturing capabilities at the same time you know they they, they they're trying to uh, trying to uh, like dominate the you know the 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 bricks and everything so it's it's, it's a lot of dilemma going who on is there to dominate the who, who, who told you that who is yeah? trying to dominate the big the bricks like the thing is that like, uh, like what i'm saying when it comes to bricks is indian of course you're gonna say that no, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying China, the but China huh? is not trying to dominate the BRICS. Because China is not trying to dominate the BRICS. So, so what's happening here is um, there's a lack of cooperation. For example, India, China, and uh, Russia, they want, they all want to be a self-sustained. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
so that the thing is that there has to be understanding they have to come like they 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 have to they have to come do something to integrate the economically but they had difficulties in integrating the economically because for example uh, as india as uh, as vakar told the it industry is highly integrated in the western countries so they had difficulties in integrating economy with the china so, so, so for example this was one of the example and because of the reason they have to come to conclusion that like you know if if you want to make a economic union you have to integrate this economical within the brics so that it 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 works well you know within them for example if you if you look at a, like you know integration of european into us market like american market it's very integrated so they both they both work each other and they and they benefit each other in that but there's lack of cooperation is missing in it Okay. And, uh, and 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 that's something you know. I, I will say, that India has to, has has to choose sides in some way, so that I mean, the, I I feel like that. I mean, I mean, I, I don't say they have to, they have to choose sides completely, but they have to choose side in a way that they have to integrate the economy into into one why, side. Why because I don't. Have, think... Why would they have to change uh, to choose sides? They don't have to. Actually, that's the point of BRICS. That's the point of multipolarity. You are not obliged to choose sides. You actually are offered the best. The best you people offer you the best deals, and you yeah. choose from the best ones. And because somehow there are, is a balance, the the one side won't try to won't be able to um, to push you to to coerce you. So that's the point. I don't think if this was the spirit, then BRICS would have no future. It's you not know, the spirit of making choosing sides. It's exactly the opposite. It's the spirit of not being uh, not willing. Yes, first of all, not willing. So that's that's why the Maldives thing was a very bad image for, for India, but I won't go into it. The thing is that the spirit, the spirit of BRICS is the one that tries to present itself as an alternative. No coercion, no blocks. Everybody's dealing with each other. If they start doing it, like you're saying, obliging someone to choose sides, then the the dream of the BRICS is over, so I don't see it happen. Perhaps in the future, like Wait was saying, <laughs> the multipolar world might not be what we expect, but <laughs> we it are won't. forming it. It I mean, won't I work. Mean, it won't work. Oh, if, 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 I, I, you are the one with the finger, and I cut yeah, you. Sorry. Yeah, Go on. It won't, it won't work if BRICS keep putting these countries in the same way, you know? Because I think India and Pakistan need to sort the shit out before they start, oh yeah they need to as you know Walker, i live in uk you guys can't be in the same room without giving the devil look to each other <laughs> and i've been to south africa so many times i think naomi can back me up on this there is a big indian community there a big i think the biggest one in africa and there is a few Pakistan there as well, and they are always mm -hmm. fighting, you know. I don't think this is something the BRICS need right now. They already go Saudi Arabia and Iran. Iran. Yeah, Iran. these two countries, you know, they sat down and they talk. Now they call each other all the time and they visit each other, you know. Basically, this problem is done, but I don't think it's done with Pakistan and India. The Pakistan, you guys think, Pakistan yeah. and China too. Yeah. China, 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 China and India got the same problem, but they know if they want to make this work, they need to forget about that bullshit they <laughs> going on. Because if you I don't trust the currently Pakistan government. I don't trust at all. I don't trust them. And if they get in, they're gonna be like Argentina. Look at them. They go invited. They say yes, we're gonna go in. And then some lunatic won the election. Look, they say fuck off. We don't want it. What's gonna happen with Pakistan? Okay, what are going? Yeah, I, I would like to highlight two things. <clears throat> Why the transition? Uh... Uh, is taking time, the multi-alignment, especially in our part of the world, South Asia and uh, the ex-British colonies. Uh, because the elite that uh, was created at that time, a time of independence, let's say uh, 1947, uh, because both sides, Pakistan, India and current Bangladesh fought for the freedom. 
political uh, struggle was there. But the elite was all uh, Western educated because it was British system of education, whether it was in South Asia or in UK, like Nehru, uh, you know, Gandhi, uh, uh, Jinnah from Pakistan, and most of the leadership was, I would say, at least educated. Even the one who gave the concept of Pakistan, uh, Dr. Iqbal, uh, studied in Germany. So he was influenced by German uh, philosophy also. So I would say there was less integration with the uh, uh, with China and Russia in terms of uh, general population because of the language. Because uh, if you look at the largest uh, Anglophone countries in the world, it is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, mind you. We are larger than uh, the West in terms of size, the number of people we speak. So language is a very important factor. And then was the leadership. And then it continued. I think uh, if you look at the diaspora in US, North America, and Europe, uh, India, of course, is one of the largest, and then comes, you know, Pakistan, third or fourth place. So millions of people go there, and they are third generation now, and now they are into political power. Like Rishi Shunak is a prime minister of UK, he is basically Indian origin, and one of Pakistani Khans is a Scottish senior member, and maybe Scots, Scotland's chief minister or prime minister someday. And same as I think happening with other communities, like you find Africans. Uh, uh, you know, and then Chinese or Koreans. But uh, since uh, there are a lot of uh, huge population in South Asia, even Bangladeshis, there are members of parliament in UK. So this is, and this has then remained a constant. In Cold War, basically, India uh, became neutral, but had very good relations with Russia. But Pakistan, because of economic reasons, and then it was integrated with uh, Iran and Turkey to build a bloc against Russia, part of the Rimland theory. So we became part of that. So, so that is the legacy. But now there's an understanding gradually as the internet has started. Over. Like I said, we, I was the first one to take the media delegation to Russia. And we were really surprised the way that we, were, we were received. Uh, we were hosted. Uh, we visited RT, uh, you know, <coughs> Interfax, uh, Rapti headquarters. A lot of uh, good feeling. And uh, the journalists were surprised that uh, the way Russians received us. Because they thought probably it's that old mindset. We were part of the other bloc. So, so it means that there's a transition taking place and uh, uh, these two countries have to overcome that. Uh, in, in case of SC and BRICS, is the language problem also. But now English has now become, uh, it's easier to communicate. Uh, there's no common language because language uh, makes a lot of different terms of integration. Look at Singapore or Malaysia, uh, why they are more integrated with the West is one is the language and the legacy. So this is now the third generation which feels very different they are connected, they can get the information. Like Russia, Ukraine was a lot of propaganda within Pakistan also. But our group has been highlighting what is happening on ground. We've written it also that this is the reality. And what was the reason? By and large, people would go with, uh, let's say, Western school of thought. But now there is better understanding. So I think this is part of, and then the conflicts, which were either natural, like India, Pakistan, at time, people criticized why there's a bad blood. There have been four wars. Uh, you know, between both countries. And Pakistan feels that it was bisected because of India. Uh, like Bangladesh was part of Pakistan. So, but now there's a realization that conflict is not the solution. There are so many other things where we can integrate, uh, we can do travel. Like Indian Punjab, there are a lot of common language with Pakistani Punjab. Culture is same. And there's a lot of call by Indian Punjabis, which is the breadbasket of India, to have integration with Pakistan because they feel their products can travel through Pakistan to Central Asia and Russia and why there should be uh, a hindrance to that. Because it, it is very, he says, I can drive a truck from, let's say, Haryana and I go to Kabul or Moscow. Why I should be, you know, shipping it through, uh, let's say, sea and passing through a number of countries. So, so there is, I think, new generation is different. And I, I feel that uh, in next five to six years, there will be more integration within BRICS, within SCO, and uh, it could become a rallying point for development of the region. Huge potential. Actually, we can become so much independent that the West would have to then look at uh, this block as uh, the main economic state. Demographic potential is, I've written on it, look at the size of uh, the, the population. The market itself is almost, almost I think, 60 to 70 percent of the global population lives in this area. 
we can get China to start <laughs> playing cricket, I think we can displace football as the world sport. Oh, cricket. Let me ask cricket. a question. They love cricket. Let me ask a question. No, 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 no. no. It's so boring. <laughs> uh, I've always seen, okay, people normally talk about the three great We powers. have a super chat that paid $10. Maybe we could address that. Let's do that first. And no, then... Don't take it serious. It's just something that okay. was hanging for us to answer. Okay, we, Joey, we'll let's do back to the you, super chat. Super chat first. Sorry. So, it's uh, very then, interesting uh, how Putin validated most of the geopolitical views expressed in DPA Open Mic, Durant, etc. It is interesting to see a world leader confirming opinions expressed here. Well, yeah, what can I say? Well, looks like everybody on this panel could have predicted and told you guys exactly uh, exactly what's up. Everybody no, we are all for weapons. That's the problem. <laughs> No, no, well, now you so know being, uh, who is pulling the string. No, no, we were just right. We were just right. So, so now you know who is pulling the string <laughs> behind Putin. You know who's Putin's puppet. Most guys here are very real politics. Coincidence. Very realist in this, the way we interpret uh, the geopolitics schemes. If there was any constructivist within, within us here, the perspective would be very different. The thing is that real politic is coming back mostly and foremost because history is also coming back. And in saying this, uh, we understand that Putin is a very rational actor that uh, thinks when things they are on the ground. And um, like Wade said, the interview was made for people that have knowledge, people that know uh, about more um, specific uh, things uh, that uh, think about the world, know about geopolitics. It was a, it was an interview made for Western politicians to have a message for him. It was a serious talk, not a talk show. And this was a very important. It was like in the beginning, beginning of the conversations, we have a, a scientific conversation. You put your terms over the table. That's what Putin did. He said, this is a serious conversation. This is not a talk show. And then he went into a, a historical introduction. This was like if we were having a, a, a scholar uh, talking in front of us, amazing. And most Western, uh, most those not those po cheap politicians that are elected for four years, but uh, the the, the dumbs of the the parties, the real ones that make the decision making, they were able to listen to him and see he he's right, of course, especially his perspective about China and so on. And uh, we are ready to make peace because this is not going nowhere. This is, a, this is a fraction in this history of the globe. The globe is changing. We can't do anything. So the best thing we can do is cooperate and go together, not against yeah, each well, other. You know, Prada, you, Prada, you know what I think? I think that one, that sounds like Russian propaganda. You one, are, one. are now a Russian propagandist. That's what I think. What do you think about that? One, one. And one now I was just going to say, I mean, the way Putin spoke, you know, he spoke to where regular people could understand what he was saying and get the history lesson. And, you know, it just played really well to, to, to regular people. And I mean, if you look at DPA, it's a bunch of regular guys and gals sitting around, you know, working, doing their thing, trying to live life. And we pay attention to what's going on and we, we discuss it. We, you know, we brainstorm, we spitball things. I mean, it, it, it I think if you look at the whole situation with some common sense, you know, I'm not going to say Putin followed us or we followed him, but I mean, there's a lot of basic things that, you know, add up. And I mean, we, you know, people don't like it. You know, it's like, I feel like here we deal in reality and the reality is it's bad for one side and pretty good for the other. And it looks like it's getting better. People don't like that. And, you know, since we deal in reality and we look at things and try to, coming it from a normal guy's perspective, you know, maybe that's why the message hit home better because he was speaking to us in our language and, you know, giving us validation about the things we think. Cause you look at stuff and you're like, what are they thinking? What are they thinking? Just like he was, you know, like you blew up a pipeline, you have access to these two, you know, why are you not, you know, doing something to ease your burden? You know, it's like the same thing we sit around, like what, you know, pulling our hair out. Why are they doing it? You know, oh, I mean, started the Second World War, stuff like that. I mean, it just 
it's easy stuff to figure out. It's slow hanging fruit. I mean, I think in a sense, if you pay attention and, uh, and Putin just, you know, highlighted it, he just highlighted what a lot of common sense, rational people are thinking and wondering. Mm. Uh, I was, I, I was actually very confused in the beginning of the, the interview. Uh, because it's like, do you want a serious conversation or a talk show? I was like, what the, what the hell is, what's, what's the difference between the two? I was like, so confused. And then he went on and then talked about history. I was like, okay, I, this is not even an interview anymore. I don't even know what's happening right now. You know, I just listen, listen. So I just thought that was interesting. But it, like, I re, like I said in my video, uh, uh, my review about the thing, it's really not meant for everyone. Like, I cannot imagine uh, most of my friends are uh, sitting there and listen to like half an hour of him talking about history. I think they don't come, they can't be bothered. No, it's totally not like the kind of interview that you see Donald Trump always getting. You know, they always ask him hitting questions, you know, then and uh, Donald Trump will have to give some you no know, hot takes. It's not that kind of interview, so it's so different. Yeah, it was, it's uh, not, what, not what he not what Tucker expected, it's obvious. It's obvious that they both yeah. were very prepared for this interview, and it's not what Tucker expected. He even mm -hmm. tried to stop Putin. Uh, that that's what's going. That's what's getting all the talk in in the Western media. That's what it's all about. People are like, "There's a half an hour history lesson involved," but which is amazing. Yeah, that, that, that is a pretty hard bargain. A lot of Americans be like, "Oh no, half an hour history lesson." Yeah, I don't think and Tucker Carlson. Is that and Tucker Carlson talking? It made sense. All that. Sorry, uh, wait. I think he also said that as it went through, uh, we, we understood if we didn't have that introduction at the beginning, we wouldn't understand what was coming next. So it was actually quite good. Sorry. And uh, I, I, I was just wanting to add on to what Bradley said. You know, Tucker Carlton all the way in the first half an hour, his, his eyebrow is like, what? What he's trying to do? He's like, <laughs> he's like he's, he's, he's all the way like this, his eyebrow. <laughs> Because don't, no, like, I don't want to okay. see the archive documents. <laughs> and he don't dare to stop. And he don't really dare to stop Putin because he's like he he actually have no idea what's happening. He's like struggling very hard to keep to to stay stay concentrate uh, concentrated. Vaka, yeah. have you have you watched the interview, the full interview? Yeah, I have watched it very uh, keenly, and I think it was wonderful. Uh, uh, West is saying it was an info ops operation by you know by Putin. But I think this uh, this also lays a perspective from the horse's mouth, and uh, uh, and it I think it was important for Putin to explain the history. But a lot of people don't understand. They basically take the conflict to be black and white thing, and uh, so there were a lot of messaging. I think one was uh, that uh, morally and militarily the West had lost, and it was a lost cause. The other was an offer that we can still you know negotiate, which we've been highlighting. I think before the war started, uh, I, I've been following it since 2014, when the first Maidan took place. Uh, incidentally, my son landed up on the same day, was studying in Ukraine, then we had to pull him back. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war is again uh, a very important <coughs> study of conflicts and how the superpowers uh, react. And unfortunately, uh, I would say that this was the first crack in Western uh, military hegemony, uh, which they thought actually they were going to turn uh, the tables on Russia and probably push it, uh, but the reverse happened. But if you look at the losses suffered, then loss of prestige, and how it has affected the European economy, and even a debate in Europe. And then came, I think, other conflicts like uh, Middle East. So this has damaged the Western reputation, military might, or shock and or whatever you call it or hegemony very badly. Uh, the other is the offer by Putin, I think, to the Western bloc that still there is the time. And this is what he's been saying from day one, that there's a political solution. Uh, we can demilitarize. Uh, just imagine if it was done on the negotiating table uh, right uh, two years back. And uh, Ukrainian could have avoided the destruction, uh, the mass migration to Europe, which again created another problem of immigration into Europe. It's a very different problem. And then disruption of entire northern corridor energy supply. I don't know what was in their mind, uh, the Western bloc, uh, they went into it. But I think still there's an olive branch offered by President Putin. And then there was a message to the larger world that Russia didn't want war. Basically, it was forced into guarding in its interest. 
and i also wrote in one of the article that actually they went and stepped up uh, the stepped on putin's toes or russian toes and then you expect him to keep smiling so it would never happen it's just like you know somebody walking into uh, let's say europe and then europe says it's all right it's almost the way net has been expanded actually for uh, right for 1993 towards the east despite assurances given to boris yeltsin that uh, it's not going to happen but gradually they kept on pushing expansion and then ukraine was i think the i would say the straw on the camel's back it broke the back i think what happened was um, the ukrainian war is comparable with something that happened uh, after the second world war the swiss crisis when france and england decided they wanted to play the big powers them again and they were humiliated by everybody so we are seeing a very big moment imagine now that uh, with what is happening in the in the red sea china understands that they are making worse and better and says to us piss off from here so that would be also the the full humiliation we are not there yet the ukrainian war already showed us and um this is this is obviously one of the biggest mistakes another mistake which i read you, you guys probably also were interested in what other people thought about this uh, this interview another big mistake i i read it in i i saw it from a french political it was actually in the in the in the main television i was very surprised and he said something like this we the way that the western um mainstream media and and some of the most important politicians reacted showed to the public people that really read and because it was often for everybody to to listen and there was a lot of people listen the ones that have brains and they made they presented themselves as weak stupid and ignoble at most and this is also the second biggest mistake so i think in one way this interview is uh shaking uh, a lot of um a lot of points uh, uh, sorry a lot of of this strategy that has been start, that started as flawed we should have never went to a war to ukraine after there was a deal with russia and ukraine we should have uh, supported that deal because it was not a bad deal and yeah sorry uh toby i was just going to say i think that one way of looking at this conflict and the potential resolution that wakar is talking about is we're witnessing the death of nato you know and it's almost like the death of old age because nato is a cold war concept and and russia became a market economy and started to integrate with europe but also with the us the reality is there's a heck of a lot of american investment in russia as well as european investment for all the people in nato who are who are pushing the ukraine war who are not invested in russia there is an equal number of 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 lobbyists in america and in europe who have corporate investments inside russia and whose businesses export to russia there's a lot of talk about a new european security architecture just because a few people didn't want to scrap nato and make something new doesn't mean that everybody was on the same page and i think that what we're seeing is is nato passing its its use by date it's it's no longer a useful security architecture and i really think that nato has lost so much face in ukraine that that it has been a military disaster particularly the counter offensive but it it's it's also been a political disaster between germany and the us it's been absolutely humiliating for for the european leaders to to follow this nato lead and 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 harm their own populations economy in this way so you know the optimistic thing to do is to say okay we need something new and trump has been talking a bit about this as well so if that is allowed to happen if nato is allowed to pass away into the night if this is it's its last party and then we get something new then i think that could actually suit the west it could suit a lot of the the corporate lobbyists who do have a lot of money invested in russia and i think that you know naomi was talking about this i i think this was very much in putin's speech his speech was not a celebration of the brics it was uh Uh, putting down terms for the west the, particularly the way he talked about the us dollar 
He didn't talk about it in a hostile term as though, you know, the US dollar as world currency is the enemy. What he said was it's very foolish the way the US are managing it. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kind of see the whole Ukraine thing as being a very bloody and, uh, and, and unfortunate demise of NATO. Well, in a way, you are right. NATO, it was like a, a last attempt for NATO to uh, prove they are still needed. There is a reason for them to exist. And uh, did they prove? No, they created a huge conflict. It was exactly what they were supposed not. Uh, it was exactly <coughs> their goal. That, that couldn't happen. So uh, it, it's in itself, they, they shoot themselves into defeat. And now they have a problem. I don't think NATO will disappear per se. They'll always be there. The thing is that they are going to become uh, unimportant towards the the world, uh, towards how the world is configurating, like Putin said. These are long process. They have been changing and we can't do anything against it. So why why go against it? No, I consider them like you, Toby, also said. This is actually good things happening. Now, for the first time, we have the feeling that many countries, it might be a hoax, it might be oaks like weight have been saying the multipolarity m might not end up like we think but it's at least there is a promise to the countries in africa in south asia in um in latin america to finally be able to reclaim a bit of development for themselves yes taking the words of a person we had here fighting into in, in, in for ukraine in ukraine the people in the world also want to have toilets and tap water. It's the right for everybody, for the humanity. And when you look at the country like uh, Wakar was saying, like um, Pakistan, where there's so many million of people, and you, you look, you see pictures of small towns and see how much underdevelopment there is there. But these people are actually very ingenious. The way what the things they do would without of those machinery because they don't have they don't have electricity. Imagine that they have electricity. What they could do, how they could develop, how they could improve their lives. And uh, yeah. And also, if we uh, there is a problem with population. Some people talk about that, but uh, many uh, I have been also trying to be interested on it, the thing is that the population in the world will never grow over uh, uh, 10, 11 billion. But nevertheless, if we actually improve people's lives, industrialization, if we actually bring urbanization uh, um, to, um, sorry, poor countries, a, a healthier urbanization, uh, uh, birth rates will, will fall down and we can live all uh, very happy in this planet. Well, not forever, but for a while. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had, a, I had a question for Mr. Waka. Sorry to take you back because I wanted to ask him something about the Indian military. Uh, okay, normally people talk about three great world powers, the United States, China, and Russia. I also think India should be in that list because you are a large country. You have an, an you kind of have an independent foreign policy and nobody can push you around like you've seen recently. You've been, the, 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 the Europeans and the Americans have been telling you not to buy Russian oil and you're telling them, no, we, we have our own policy. I think you are now the fifth largest economy in terms of GDP, you even overtook your former British colonialists and they are uh, the world's largest population. Now my issue is that for your military, you still import a lot of hardware from other countries. I think 60% from Russia, a bit from the United States, I think for, for you to become now a true global power, you may need to now start producing high-tech indigenous military equipment. What steps are you there for to, to achieve that goal? You already so much advanced in terms of IT technology. That's the part that I feel India has been missing. Or oh, is it my own bad analysis? Joy. Yeah. Joey Waka is from Pakistan, just in case. Uh, oh, you, you mistaken. Uh, but I can, uh, but I can answer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I do a lot sorry, of it It's okay. Oh. Yeah, I think he's, he has a, a very uh, serious point. <laughs> that in terms of uh, military and economic potential, uh, India has displayed, I think, a lot of maturity. And you're right because uh, we also consider <clears throat> to be a, a very large military power, and it has the potential to become a global. Uh, military uh, power. The only uh, issue will be which will decide, and we will be emphasizing is that 
uh, India has to finally decide uh, which side they are, uh, or to the Eurasian side, and it will actually rally a lot of countries around it automatically, because uh, ultimately there's a cultural integration. Uh, mind you, we speak the same language, only the way we write it, the script, otherwise uh, Hindi and Urdu is the same language. Uh, the food, and India is a very large Muslim population, maybe more than Pakistan, actually. So I think, in my estimate, it is uh, 250 million to 300 million people. So, so India is uh, uh, more, I would say, diverse. And a lot of potential. Then look at the geography. It dominates the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> uh, it uh, could become a connection between, you know, West Asia and Southeast Asia. And also North-South. In case they settle down their uh, dispute with China, there are four or five routes which pass through Himalayas. They can connect uh, China with the Indian Ocean also. So, so these are the challenges that they have. Uh, look at the middle class is growing. Uh, and then I think the military is almost, uh, in terms of size, it is, I think, third largest. Uh, and uh, the only thing is the production of hardware. But they are now into it. They have uh, even landed on the moon. So technology is there, missile technology. But in case India can, the only thing is that uh, somehow, because of, I would say, historic reasons, they have developed conflict with uh, almost all neighbors. Like China, active conflict with Pakistan. Uh, even now, Myanmar is impacting Indian security because there's a lot of instability. We have not discussed uh, there's a civil war going on in Myanmar. So it means that Indian three sides have conflict uh, or tensions. So in case, I think we all, actually, including Pakistan, can overcome these issues, which has been, I think, a number of times pointed out by this forum. Uh, and we've been highlighting it. Uh, Things can definitely improve. Uh, the economy can grow uh, almost, you know, in double figures for South Asia. Okay. So we have another super chat, or well, ah, one. Sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna address it real quick since we already talked about it. But you know, the Istanbul Agreement is part of that peace deal that they had in April, and you know, obviously Putin mentioned that to let people know that that was another miscalculation as he called it by the west if that addresses the super chat i mean it it was part of his grievance list when he you know mentioned all the things that you know he tried to do and that failed prior to the war and after the war started if i may yeah, I think what I understood from, if i may if i understood what happened um uh, with the idea of desnification <clears throat> from putin he made it very clear and very I think many people have this idea that Russia will do something like the, the Nuremberg Tribunal and go and pick up these people and so on. No. What he said is that Ukrainians should write it down in their laws that these people can't be, can't be in, the, in the politics. They will persecute these people for their crimes and uh, also not allow this ideology to formate. Let's be, let's be frank. This is nothing new. Almost all countries in Europe have anti-Nazi uh, or fascist or, or ultra-right laws. And these parties keep all over in Germany, in Portugal, in France, or well, in France, I don't know. But <laughs> these parties keep, keep being uh, illegalized. These groups keep, keep being uh, punished. So this is, I think this is very, uh, um, uh, um, so if, if many Western politicians sometimes say, what did he know with the Disneyfication? He wants to know. It's very simple. It's very, uh, it's very um, common. He wants uh, the Ukrainians to put in their laws, in their constitution, that um, uh, Nazis can't be part of the, of the normal life. It's pretty much acceptable. Yeah, so when we discussed this question earlier, um, some people thought that, uh, yeah, the fact that Putin said that they almost achieved that through negotiations, it was a sign that it could be achieved through negotiations. Vaughn and maybe some others uh, thought that Putin was just saying that because he knew that that's an option that the West wouldn't go for. So it allows him to basically continue the special military operation and look like he's ready to negotiate. What? Yeah, that's because kind of what we discussed. Because during those, no, during that those was days, I was covering point. the conflict. Yeah, so we disagreed. Days, I was that, covering yeah. the conflict. The, I was covering the conflict. Uh, I I think in one of the syllabus I already mentioned. Although those are very early days, I did say that it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to happen because 
the the Ukrainians' uh, propaganda, the narrative that they put out into the public, it's clear that they're going to fight all the way to Crimea. They they are very determined to fight. So all this Istanbul negotiation was like a you know, a side thing. Whereas when you look at the actual propaganda, the information coming out from the Ukrainian military, their you know, government, they are very determined to fight. So I never believed in the Istanbul uh, negotiation. I know that you will always fall through. It will never happen. And I will, it turned out to be right because it's like it's like a it's negotiated by a totally different team and it's totally un, unrelated to the Ukrainian government government, that kind of sort of things. They killed the guy uh, who was the negotiator, yeah. I, I think yeah. Prata is being <laughs> being very optimistic about this idea that denazification can happen voluntarily because I, I think what Putin is really saying is like NATO has to go. But the other thing is he may be hinting that this is how Trump or some other Western leader exits Ukraine because it would not be beyond the West's, um, you know, mandate to say, you know what, we no longer tolerate Nazis and we've suddenly discovered there are Nazis in Ukraine and so we wash our hands of them. So I think that maybe he's suggesting the Nazi issue as like, you know, we can bond on this, on this, um, you know, intolerance of Nazis. But I, no, I really, no. I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Russia can have NATO in Ukraine. I think that's the real issue. I think denazification means denatification. And and another issue that I, I I want to say is also that if I can spot it, because you no, know, Russia definitely have their, you know, the FSB and everything. They are looking at the entire bigger picture and everything. If I can tell that you know Ukraine is not sincere, I'm quite sure the Russia or Russians also know it. They they just play along, so that like like some of you guys said, you know, it's just to justify, uh, you know, to have a moral high ground. Like they they redraw from the northern front. The reality is, if they stay, they will be destroyed because the Ukrainian forces was ramping up, and the the number of troops that they have holding the Shenikhiv and Sumy region is not enough. They can't hold the front. Eventually, they will be wiped, they will be attacked and kicked back. So the redraw is for a military strategic situation uh, realities. They are they are struggling to to fight the increasing number of Ukrainian troops, but also you know they can make make a case of moral high ground. So you no know, Putin is now play, just playing along and you know, saying that oh you no know, is we we are you not know, giving them a good deal. We redraw to remove the gun from the head. You know this like this is just part of the narrative. This is just propaganda. In reality, is that they can't hold the front anyway, and the Ukrainians have no interest in actually really negotiating and russia is clearly also knows that they're just playing along you know that's just what i think yeah in fact yeah, i, I think that's a good Wyatt. observation i think i agree with you Wyatt, because they are, they had sent only forty thousand troops to Kiev. oh he's i mean that's what i mean like like why said just playing along it's like him bringing up the options during the interview about peace and the different times they offered it and how he's still open to it all you have to do is lift the decree. You know, the simple things they'd have to do that he knows damn well they ain't going to do it. So, you know, it, it's he's just playing along now while he does what he wants. I mean, sure, I guess if Ukraine tomorrow capitulated totally and gave him what he wanted, then he maybe take the deal. But we all know that's going to happen. I mean, think about who he's, like he said, who can he talk to? Who can he trust? Look who he has to work with. That means... Okay. I mean, and you who think has I mean, actual power Newland, in Greenland, Schultz, Biden, Blinken? I mean, it's I'm like the there's US. no incentive the for US. him to do it, but he can. But think about it. It plays to the West because it's like, oh, you know, he's trying to make peace. I mean, like I said, the message to the middle America, the taxpayers, you know, what the fuck are you doing over here? Why are you wasting money? Don't you have better things to do? You know, I mean, and then all the little digs and all the things, you know, like, hey, you know, if you don't believe me, go ask this guy. He was in the fucking room. You know, I mean, it was, it, you know, this whole thing has just been played well. I mean, yeah, they make mistakes, but I mean, Jesus, they, they really hit the home run with the propaganda to, on that interview. Yeah. As far as just making hits at the West and, there, and it's like, where's the lie? Like he said. Poland's got a pipeline. Why aren't they opening it for you? Ukraine's got a pipeline. You're giving them all these tanks, all this money. Why aren't they helping you? I mean, just sowing the seeds of discontent and, you know, maybe waking people up like, 
you know, hey, I had to pay 800 fucking dollars the last month for electricity and I turn all my lights off and run the thermostat at 68. You know, and then you hear Putin talking about, you know, why are you sending this amount of money and this amount of this and this? Why are you doing this? You know, don't you have your own problem? And then people start thinking about their own problems. I mean, it was a it was a brilliant move. Yeah. I would like to come into the timings of the interview. Over five hours, <laughs> over five hours, we talking, and it's been one fucking topic. Vladimir. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Sorry, okay. On the timing, yeah, on the timings of the interview is very critical uh, because this is happening now in February, uh, and uh, what I think uh, Putin is also communicating is three other I think strategic uh, narratives. Uh, one is that in case uh, his offer uh, for peace is not uh, let's say taken seriously, so you're looking at the spring offensive coming in. You're going to be a step up in fighting. Uh, because as the thaw starts happening, despite there's going to be slush, but military operations are going to pick up. So there's a message in terms of uh, momentum of military operation. The other is, I think, uh, the link with what has happened in the Middle East. Because West was, uh, uh, mind you, NATO, I think we've discussed, is supposed to be able to handle two and a half front, two large wars, uh, or I would say Western allies, because NATO maybe is not responsible for Indo-Pacific. So one is the war in Europe, which is happening. One is uh, containing China, and the third is the half war. In terms of their size, they consider a major conflict with a with a middle-level power like Iran or Iraq is half war. So so they they think that they are able to handle two and a half wars. And uh, I would say the half front is just opened in the Middle East. Iran is not coming. And only militias have tied down Israeli military power and I would say to some extent Western military power. Now, if you look at the response by the West against Houthis, there were a lot of push by you know, people like uh, uh, some of the senators and ex-retired military generals in the U.S., including McMaster uh, uh, and others, uh, to attack Iran. They have not been able to do it. So it means that militarily it was more of a bluff. They cannot handle more than one major front, which is Ukraine. And this is also not a whole European war is restricted to Ukraine. So I think this is also important. The now West is uh, entangled at two fronts. And in case China opens, so it's going to be disaster in Taiwan. But this is a good timing for Putin to communicate that uh, in terms of military and financial resources. Like Ukraine was, I think, promised uh, hundreds of billions of dollars was supposed to come. But now they have mustered only, I think, the some of the Russian frozen assets in Europe, something like that, that they're going to release. So, so I think it's looking at these two fronts also and communicating that Western military power has limitations. And in case you keep pushing, basically it's going to militarily lead into a strategic defeat. In, in Ukraine, I feel that that is already defeated and exposed uh, because if you, Ukraine has lost almost one-fifth of its real estate 80% of the seaboard and the total loss in terms of economy is, in my calculation is 1.5 trillion dollars because if you lose your productive area, the industrial belt, the seaboard, if you calculate, it's a huge loss and at what cost? Look at the demographic problem, we've also seen that there's loss of men and it's going to change the demographics of Ukraine in the long run, there are going to be more women than men which creates you know, another problem. So all told, I think the timing is interesting. And uh, in case uh, Europeans can understand it and de-link themselves uh, from the American hegemony and look for peace, because ultimate, and he also talked of nuclear war, uh, because they were caused by you know some of these pushing Poland and all that, that it could be disaster for the entire world and he doesn't want it. So all told, I think there were three strategic messages as well, which I thought I'll highlight. Um, so, are we going to move on to the next subject, or? Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry for cutting you guys yeah. off. Uh, you guys talking about earlier about the NATO, something NATO is finished. I just want you guys to know that NATO is not finished. NATO is still alive. And then uh, there is a three no, things it, about this war. Three things. Mike, Mike, Mike. NATO is going to save uh, Africa. 
Just you hold on. I'm, yet, I'm going to explain to you now. You understand what why I'm saying you know, that? I'm, 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 okay. The thing is, they're going. Their leadership has to going to be changed. Why they make so much error with this war? They miscalculate the old things, right? Because what they do, they was think about the old Soviet Union. How they was defeat Soviet old Soviet Union back then, right? In Soviet Union, there are three three things that Russia has today that the Soviet Union do not have. And that is why they be able to defeat Soviet Union easily. So they are going with a uh, calculation of the way they defeat Soviet Union. First, today Russia have their own agricultural system. They produce a lot of crops where Soviet Union did not, right? Depend on West, mostly for the foods, right? On like uh, Russia, which they did. And uh, secondly, Russia, uh, Soviet Union have too much population. Too much population always become a too much headache. Okay, which Russia have a less than that. So, and totally now we have a mineral resources why, whereby nobody used back in the days, something that nobody needed at that time. That is the downfall of Soviet Union. They have so much resources, but they, nobody needed at that time. Unlike today, everybody's hungry for all those mineral resources, which uh, Russia, have, everybody keeps talking about gas, gas, gas. That gas is a fraction of many of the resources of Russian is a fraction. So they talk about oil and gas, it's a fraction. Russia, uh, we talk about foods. So all those things are pushed Russian way, way ahead. That the West do not calculate all those things where they go to, where they do their drawing board. They still using all those Soviet calculations. If they could have had that, they would have know how to defeat them. And third thing is China. China come through for the Russian, what they are, what, like I said like earlier, West was so blind not to know advantage of drones in a war. If they could have calculated all those to their war system, because back in 2014, all this is not, it wasn't like this. So if they could have calculated all those, they could have known what they, what to, how to adjust. The NATO should have known where to adjust or not to adjust. But when they say, oh, China do not, don't give Russian weapon, but they don't think about drones. If they could think about drones, they could have know how to, that is one side. Now they have to go, this is what I'm thinking. And hopefully, hopefully they don't do it. They are going to give Ukraine nuke. Okay. What? Hopefully. So that was a great idea. Hopefully. Let's give Ukraine a nuke so they can launch this. But yeah, yeah, no, you are right. Let's give Ukraine a nuke so they resolve the overpopulation in the planet. You are so listen, right. The Ukraine will solve listen, all our problems. They will listen, nuke listen Mike. The Come on, Mike. We are saying it. Don't believe problems. it until it happens. When it first uh, we we okay, uh, we can obviously it's move on because that's ridiculous. For Africa, <laughs> believe me. Yeah, when they right. say they're going to give one, I, Russian I think yes, Mike, everybody Mike, said that Mike, was Mike, just totally. Mike, it's not going to happen. Mike, these people can be trusted. We were fucking drunk. Mike. You want to give them nuke? There goes ghost. He looked weak. He didn't get no, to say what you he guys wanted. keep arguing. You say it's not going to happen. Believe me, when they say jet, this is what they say about uh, F-16. It's not going to happen. It's happening. Abraham, it's not going to happen. It's happening. Uh, all those yeah. uh, long range weapons, and it's not going to happen. Are they? It's happening. So, the, the, don't say it's not going to happen. Hey, hey, Mike, Mike, where is it happening? Where are you seeing those 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 ghosts? Because they are ghosts. There's, there's no, I mean, the Abrams are it's are there crazy. maybe, but they're they're not happening. I mean, they nobody's seen this shit. The challengers, nobody's seen shit. The leopard twos, they're, they're all burned up. The Bradleys are all burned up. Yes, they do. I mean, they, they the M1s are there, but they ain't done shit. Wow. Wait, wait. Agree to disagree. There's no point trying to you convince everyone. Fun. You say your point, and then they disagree, <laughs> and then that's it. You know, there's no point to argue because you guys are sitting on different ends. You all will never have an end point. There will never be a result in this argument. You know, I, 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 I give you. I really, you have the I really time to share no your view, and then that's good. You know, wait, so, guys. Yeah, I, I really, really hope him. no one Let's in give this you state is listening to my. You know. Because, you know, let's give Ukraine the the let's give Ukraine the nuclear weapons. They will solve the population problem in the world, like he said. Yeah. It will be amazing. 
Well, go, 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 go. No, you guys can't get it. Can't you guys don't get it. Guys, you they would say, this is how they give it to <laughs> Ukraine. They would say himself. Ukraine build it themselves. They're going to say Ukraine build it themselves. They're not going to say they give it to them. Okay? They're going to say they're homegrown. Okay? No, they you can't. see the weapon they've been using now. They can't, homegrown. No, they can't <laughs> solve it by themselves you because know, they, they just have might. used uranium. You know, they, can, they can produce... Uh, they could produce dirty bombs, but the whole world will be against them after that. You see, if Ukraine ever does that, it will become closed by everybody. Nobody will ever go want to talk to Ukraine. So don't My, come us with what, this bullshit. Sorry. They're taking it serious. We might laugh now. It's not going to happen. Russia are taking it serious. You see, like, uh, is it one of the British uh, leaders who was saying it? You guys don't pay attention. When they say something, they they will fall prepare you down for a long time. You guys was, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Believe me, it will happen. Well, you're right. Okay? Ukraine will solve the problem of that's overpopulation little, in the planet. That's a little new. I agree yeah. with you. <laughs> what, what do you think is going to happen after they use nuclear weapons? You all die. Total war. Total war. Total annihilation. Uh, well, it's okay. not seeing yeah, the, 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 the wall. Why, why all the stuff? Okay, I mean, we can move on. We can move on. This is honestly pointless. This is honestly pointless. We can move on. Let's move on. God. Okay. Hello. We're going to just. Hello. You hello. We're going to discuss Trump litigation. Mike. Come on, Mike. Trump litigation. I mean, the way I see it is, is, is Trump's going to continue to win these court cases at, at different levels, just depending on what court districts he hits or Supreme Court. I mean, they're all bogus. I mean, he won. It's great. He won. But there's like 100 more to go. And in next week, somebody will charge him with something new and that'll be the hype. And then there'll be another case thrown out or another ballot case tossed or you know, uh, an injunction lifted or whatever. So, I mean, it, there's just a long way to go with it for me. So, I mean, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. I mean, I'm glad he won. It was obvious he was going to win. Everybody, even the lawyers that hate him, said he was going to win. So it's not a surprise, but it's just one of those processes that's annoying because, you know, you know, he's waste. they're just there trying to waste his money, waste his time and fuck with him. And it's pathetic they'll do anything to beat him. Mm, yeah, can, yeah, well, I, I read the, the the published statement of the Supreme Court. It's not a finding. They haven't actually reached a verdict yet, Vaughn. It's just um, it's basically the interview between the justices and the lawyers from both sides. Uh, now, it's pretty clear that they're going to lose for, if, if you read the submissions of the, the counsel from both sides. And it's also pretty clear why they're going to lose. I'll very briefly say why. So the Colorado State Court has declared that Trump is an insurrectionist and therefore under Section 3 of the Constitution, he is prohibited from holding office and therefore he cannot be on the ballot. Now, Trump has not actually been declared to be an insurrectionist by Congress or by any court. This is a fact finding of the Colorado State Court. Now, there's a whole bunch of different reasons that I won't go into, but, but, but essentially what it comes down to is the Supreme Court has said, well, you know, if the Colorado State Court can kick a, a Republican off the ballot because they decide that he's guilty of being an insurrectionist, then why can't every red state do the same to every Democrat candidate? And now we don't have any elections and states can now take on the prerogative of deciding federal powers. Now, where it gets interesting is that the Democrat Council basically concede this point. And if you read the, the judgment carefully, there's a section where Murray, who's the counsel for the Democrats, he concedes, right? He acknowledges that they're going to lose. And what he says is very interesting. He says that what this means is that after Trump is... A, what, what he wants is for the Supreme Court to say that Congress has the power to dismiss 
a president as an insurrectionist with a simple majority vote. Now, the reason that the Democrats want this decision in the Supreme Court is because this question of how Section 3 operates has never been decided yet. So the Democrats are planning a, a, a move to dismiss Trump by simple majority vote instead. And, and the thing is, like, it's not clear that this is good law because whether or not Trump is an insurrectionist, does that have to be decided by a court? Does he have? Does he deserve due process? Does he get to respond to the claim? Does anybody have to prove that Trump is an insurrectionist? Does Congress actually have to try Trump or can they just make a vote and vote to apply Section 3 because they think he's an insurrectionist? This is what the Democrats are looking for. They're looking for the Supreme Court to say not that Trump is guilty and that Trump can be struck off the ballot. You know, they actually acknowledge that the Colorado decision is bad law, which is interesting because that means the Colorado Supreme Court, the state court in Colorado, deliberately falsified a finding in order to pursue a political agenda. But that's to, to one side. What the Democrats are after, and they admit this in the judgment, you can read it if you like, they want the Supreme Court to say that Congress with a simple majority can dismiss Trump or anyone else because they're an insurrectionist. Now, that is massive because what it will mean is that Congress will now have the power by a simple majority vote to dismiss any sitting president. They won't have to actually find them guilty of anything by any legal standard. There'll be no due process. And so the what if questions still apply. Well, what if every time Congress you know, has a new election, there's a simple majority against the president. So then the president gets turfed out, right? So the thing is, when we do see the judgment, what we're going to have to look at is how the judges come down and what they actually say. Because even though Trump is going to win, if the judges in the Supreme Court find that it is Congress's prerogative and that Congress, by a simple majority, can declare him to be an insurrectionist, even though the Colorado Supreme Court can't, they will actually have given the Democrats what they want. So Trump winning this doesn't necessarily put him in the clear. And, and, and finding against Colorado does not deny the Democrats what they're after here. It's pretty sneaky stuff. I hope that was somewhat clear. The, the other no, thing you. is, though, too, with Trump is by him, by him winning, you know, the, one of the, the most liberal justice on there already said to in one of her uh, counters to the, you know, people going after Trump that she, you know, he said something about officers and she said, he's not an officer. He appoints the officers. So a lot of this doesn't even apply. So the whole idea that the court is going to be able to touch him with treason or accuse him of treason or sedition or whatever is not going to happen because they've already established that he's a separate entity in an executive branch just by saying that right there. I mean, yeah, there could be some sideways thing going, but it's been made very clear by even the most liberal justices that they're not buying this argument. They recognize the dangers of the argument and they're more the, and there are even some uh, speculation. It could be a nine Oh majority you know, in, in favor of Trump because of the questions they're asking and the responses they're, you know, making to some of the arguments. So, I mean, the fa they, they really pointed out the fact that some of these more liberal justices really went after what they were saying and, and we're, we're creating that separation. I mean, it, it, it's all, it's all, it's, it's all, it's all in favor of Trump. It just needs to go through the process. So it might be another week or two. On with the gas. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, uh, about, I, see, the I biggest was say problem it, Trump is facing right now, the biggest problem Trump is facing right now is Georgia election. He's going to easily defeat the, you know, insurrection case, but the Georgia election is going to be the biggest problem right now that he's going to face. Because mm -hmm. the way they put that case forward, like, uh, can you find me 10,000 10, votes? Like, it's rigged the election. So that which is really, really, really more difficult for Trump to overcome right now. And they knew that. But the thing, other thing is that uh, even if Trump win, because they have so much thing they're going to drag him to, they're going to drag him in the mud, even worse than before. 
him win is going to become a disaster for him. He, he doesn't care about that. I mean, you could drag him through the mud all day. He doesn't give a shit. He'll fucking drag you right back in it with him. So let's respect. Um, well, I was going to say that um, just going to make a quick point. It's interesting what Toby brought up that there's actually uh, another layer to all this where they're trying to find a way to get the ability to get Trump off the ballot in all other ways. Um, and that's kind of interesting that Trump is that much of a threat to anybody. It doesn't seem that way to me. Like, uh, it's not like Trump is particularly a uh, believer in anything that maybe. They're not trying to get him off the Trump. ballot. They're trying to establish a method to get him out of office, even if he wins the election. I get and that, that would but that's weird that they seem that much of a threat. That would be the Democrats and the Rhinos basically voting to get him out. It's like a failsafe, a last-ditch effort. Walker, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I just Go want ahead, to uh, yeah, highlight another thing is the possibility of the second civil war in America. It's becoming a serious question because the way, uh, like Toffler had said, that the current uh, parliamentary system or the bureaucracy is product of the second wave. Well, she's they described basically world into third wave, three waves. And now it's basically information age and people are aware and they can influence. We've seen it in Pakistan. So in U.S., I think uh, they should be looking very seriously at possibility of uh, civil war happening because of if the Trump is denied. He's, I think if you look at all the polls, he's leading by a huge margin. Uh, and the the intelligence of the establishment within U.S., like CIA, uh, they don't want to overturn, let's say, NATO's policies in the West because Trump is, I, I'm sure, going to bring peace uh, in Eastern Europe when he comes to power because he very clearly said that the solution is not in extending the war. So the stakes are very high. If you look at Trump's following, I've been following him uh, even before his first election. Uh, uh, he's a populist leader. He appeals. Uh, we do uh, use a lot of common sense, and uh, so they're going to be, I think, a lot of uh, effort by the Democrats. And if you uh, uh, popular, if you go against a populist leader through courts or through act of, let's say, Congress, I think it's going to create very serious problem. Because as somebody mentioned, that their other states could also then start, you know, deciding against the Democrats. So it, it creates a huge problem. And uh, in case Trump is denied his right, I think the uh, U.S. is heading into a civil war. It's a very serious debate taking place in the U.S. because people are not really going with the Democrats' policy. And U.S. is also polarized hugely in terms of uh, immigration policy, in terms of uh, voting patterns, in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and I think uh, Trump is more pragmatic and a lot of people following it. So I think in case they deny him, there's a possibility of a civil war in U.S. Because the way... Well, 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 that's that's before, exactly right. Because well, if, sorry if for Congress are given this power, it destabilizes the, the, the political system. You see, if they change the balance of power and they weaken the presidency in this way, they have to empower someone else. And in this case, by empowering Congress... They will diminish the presidency so much that it will elevate the, the larger states. And if you elevate the power of the larger states and, and, the, and the party system in the party system, you diminish the power of the smaller states. And that is exactly what will cause secession. So this destabilization of the federal system in America, which seems to be the objective of the Democratic Party, is it's it's no joke to talk about a civil war because. It's not that a civil war will happen because everybody's emotionally upset. A civil war will happen if small states feel that their mandate and that their power has been eroded in favour of larger states. If, they, if, if people start feeling that the game has changed and that the rules are not what they signed up to, you will get secession movements. You sorry, may Toby, anyway. Sorry, so this stabilisation is a very real threat. No, no. Sorry for Let's respect you off. the it's finger. Yes. It's not going to be civil war. Let's respect the finger. Let's respect the finger. Okay, guys. Otherwise, it's, it's Carol's. Yes. So Bradley and Mr. This Lambo. is a part. So it's not Bradley gonna be, it's uh, not gonna I was just going to make a so, very short point. I was just going to say that the lawfare used against Trump seems to only serve to it serves to legitimize institutions rather than Trump for Trumpers. You know. 
So they must they must understand that how this looks from an optics standpoint. It's not going to really convince anybody who's already hardcore in the Trump camp. So it's it's done for uh, other reasons, you know. Then they're not they're not even trying to gun for that audience. That's all I was gonna say. Um, Mr. Lambo, Mr. Lambo, yeah. Mr. Lambo. Mr. Lambo. Be... Mr. Lambo, you want the one with the finger? Yeah, I, I I'm going to go a little bit off topic, but still about Trump. Uh, you talked, I think, four hours about Tucker Carlson. I didn't watch the open mic until I came online, uh, but I assume. But the thing on the Belgian media is very interesting. I'm not surprising at all. They are busy talking like that. This they refer some things that Putin said about things that only can advantage for Trump. I'm going to give you one example. When Putin said, "If the moment you, Ukraine doesn't get funded anymore by the United States, it's just been waiting until the the war is going to be over, and then we can continue." You know what I mean? Like Trump always said, I'm going to stop that war by cutting the money, you know, and cutting the weaponry and doesn't give anything anymore to Ukraine at certain points. Um, the Belgian media said the whole thing about the Tucker Carlson interview was only uh, put it in a positive way for Trump. That's how the fucking Belgian media is thinking. It's like... <clears throat> Saying they are busy saying that trooping uh, that Putin is still busy talking with Trump already and they're going to be best friends and ending everything like you know, fucking nuts. Um, that is how the our Western media is talking about the thing about Trump, also. Uh, it's you know, our Belgian media they refer to only messages that they are seeing from CNN. So all the information we are getting from Trump for the situation for the for the for the justice courts that Trump needs to get in front of, they are referring to some also they, they show some things uh, that they are uh, they show some clips from CNN, literally from CNN. That's how fucked up that propaganda is busy. Even in the United States, if they are talking about Trump, they're going to refer things that CNN is, is saying. CN fucking N. You know what I mean? In the United States, I don't know how many people are still watching CNN. You know what I mean? Of how many people are believing what they are saying. That's how messed up it is for the Western part here where I'm living. But yeah, it's it's... That's a problem you have with the propaganda. They're doing everything. Put Trump and... But everything. They're doing... That's pretty badass, Vaughn. Is that a real patch? That's pretty sick. <laughs> you're, you're muted. Uh, Maybe uh, for my... Oh, that, that one's a sticker, but I got guys. a couple patches. That's it's not going to be a civil war in the United States of America. It's not going to be a civil war. Fuck is that, okay? And that Trump, they kick him out. They send him to jail. They do it to him. It's not going to start a civil war in this country. That's a fact. No, because America is finished. All this hard American, they used to be back in the 70s, uh, 60s, 50s, you know, it's all gone. Okay? If America could allow them to be locked down in the COVID, they could not protest or do anything, agree? They, that will tell you one thing. It's finished. Okay? They will just go along with everything. Whatever it is, Everybody will go along with it. Okay? They lock Trump up. Everybody will go along. They will just be a little bit angry, and that's it. It will be over. Okay? They let him free. Fine. Nothing will happen. But the funny thing is that uh, Trump might even be worse for Russian than even Biden. Because mm -hmm. now, when they see, believe me, no. it might be worse for Russian than Biden. Okay? Because now they will start going after his families, threatening with all <laughs> kind of jail. I mean, they first find allegations. Like I said, they will drag him through all kind of crazy stuff. Immediately, he will have to bend. They will find a way to bend him. Okay? You, you, all these laws they are details. doing, they are using that. They are prepared that for him. If he win, then they will start using that, try to bend him to the way they want him to go. In matter of fact, it might even be super worse than we predicted. So, we shouldn't count on it. Because he says he's going to no, stop the war. You, 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 you mean he's going to stop the war. You forgot some big detail. Trump is a businessman. He's not about war. Right. He is about business. He's yeah, a businessman. 
Mike loves op uh, Mike uh, dreams about the explosion of a nuclear bomb somewhere where there's a lot of people. Please don't go there. Oh, there. really? Yeah, <laughs> never going to happen. I, I was going back to the idea that um, uh, <laughs> from, uh, something like say about we have Donald a bigger Trump problem at hand, which is mm -hmm. Biden. You Sorry for go back know. to the European politics, which is Biden being accused of not having enough intellectual cap capability. Um, that is becoming a danger for the nation. That is more than obvious to everybody that Biden is not the man making the everyday decisions that they would expect from a president. No matter, no matter the less, of course, in the US, the president, there's many of the levels of decision making and the president can't change everything like he can. And this idea that Americans and everybody in the world are becoming, it's becoming clear that this man is uh, limited and he's running for a second term. This is a much bigger problem. And the Democrats have not been having the, the strength to choose another candidate. It's becoming too late actually to do that. And at the same time, they see they either they get rid of Trump or they will have to have Trump for uh, the next election, which is which seems more and more and more uh, probable. Um, trying to, uh, it, it, I also don't think that Trump will be put out because, like many of you guys said, the dangers of uh, a full out rebellion in the United States was much worse than what we saw in 2020. It's much bigger now. The reaction will be really extreme, and, and, and the Democrats understand that the, they also want stability for their country. Well, there might be some lunatics. They would like something else, but they want stability. Not everybody wants to have a dream about a nuclear bomb somewhere in the world to, to resolve the overpopulation thing <laughs> problems. Sorry, yeah, I, I understand that. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's like the same thing that, that Putin says. Uh, it's if we fucking nuke the thing, we're going to create a major big problem, is destroying the world, you know, is the thing he wants to, to conclude with it. Of course, he's not going to nuke. But the, the, the thing is with Trump, that guy had four years of time now to prepare himself for the new legislation. And he's, he's going to be prepared as ever. Uh, the, the Biden problem, like I'm going to refer again, as Putin said, is the CIA does govern the United States and other presidents. Mm -hmm. It can be something really a bit true. I don't I don't know in which which part of it. But uh, no, the, the thing the, the thing is concerning with, with, with Biden and the worst part is just after that fucking interview, <laughs> he gave himself uh, a declaration, uh, Biden, and he messed up again. <laughs> It's it's just idiotic uh, that people still believing in Biden and still going to vote for him. And the state he is now, he's fucking. That guy is starting to get mentally away because his age uh, is is, is uh, you, you don't even see him doing the big term and saying it's not going to be a civil war or sort of civil war because Trump is not going to be elected. The danger is it can be happening if you're looking at majority of the of the people of the United States. Even take just the situation that's happening in, in Texas, where Biden actually don't give a shit about Texas, about the borders. I think if it's again Biden and the next uh, president and not Trump, because Trump will be pulled out for some reason. Uh, I don't care which one. They're going to create a fucking disgusting situation in certain states. I don't going to say for all United States, but I think certain states are going to revolt very hard. No, I, I they, agree with would you. They read Trump out using main ballots. Let's say he wins his court cases and uh, he's on their ballot. They just do what they did in 2020, manipulate those mail-in ballots to ensure that he doesn't get in. That's what I think they might do. Oh. What do you think? Hmm. Million ballots. Yeah, these ballots, yeah. You just use a paper yeah. and a pen and the problem is solved. Yeah, they just do what they did in 2020. So yeah, of they course. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they could just do it because we are talking about a very small, uh, a very small distance between both. Uh, what we are going to see now is a, a much bigger difference. The Biden is really down on all pools. And this is much probably the going to be a similar result unless perhaps he goes and deci they decide. But it's too too late to find a new person. There is nobody there. 
Yeah, we're still, still speaking about November. It's November the elections, I think. So we are now in February. So we have nine months time. So it can uh, happen a lot with Biden in nine months time. He can even maybe die. And that is my question: Who, who, who actually can you replace as a Democrat? Who can you well, replace? There's, there's a lot of rumors Biden. going around now that, uh, particularly after that uh, disastrous Biden performance that we saw last Thursday, where he talked about the president of Mexico, amongst other things. Uh, after that, uh, I rumors that, you know, are just rumors, but uh, I've heard them in multiple places, take for, for what it's worth. But there's some talk about removing Biden at the uh, Democratic convention with either Gavin Newsom or Michelle Obama. Yeah. I would say Newsom is more likely, but I, I got I got to have my doubts to, to believe that Biden can survive a, an election. Uh, not in the state that he's in. He's he's not in good shape, guys. I mean, you you look at him every day, and it just it's progressively worse. So uh, I I think that there could be some truth to that rumor for sure. Um, and then on the other side, uh, I think what the Democrats are hoping. And what the deep state is hoping, whoever they replace uh, Biden with goes ahead and beats Trump. And then we don't have a problem. And then the contingency plan will, if pr Trump wins, is how do we prevent him then from taking office? And uh, let your imagination go wild with that one. So I heard on the, uh, the, the team pool uh, IRL. They also discuss about this issue. They mentioned about this possibility uh, is part of is within their system uh, that they can actually uh, the vice president can along with all the all the head of the different governments. Uh, I mean head of the different departments. They can actually uh, decided to take take down the president. They can confirm that uh, he is not fit for office, and then the vice president can just take over and become the 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 the, the person ruling and becoming the president. So. Uh, it could be possible that that could be put and then you're gonna have like Kamala Harris as the president and yeah if Biden, because Biden now is quite compromised because of this uh this court case about his uh you no know, all the classified information in his garage and then uh the the reasoning now they saying is not to charge him is because he's not fit to be charged due to you know this uh OH and he's like so he cannot be charged but he can run the country you know I think there was a reason they okay. they released that. Finally, I think they're setting up the narrative. Yeah. And just like just after the end of the transmission of the Putin's the Putin's uh, um, interview, which is also a strange coincidence. Sorry, Vaz. Ah, okay. Vaz, you need to you need to put some uh, no red color paint or something. You know, some you to know, make your finger when very I speak prominent. Over people, when I speak over people. Okay, you know, the thing is, I'm no Donald Trump fan, but I said this before, if I was allowed to vote in the next election, I would vote for the guy. Not because I love him and I think if God is going to change the world. Nah, the only thing I would vote for that guy is because he cares about America. He would be busy in America and take his hands off the rest of the world like in four years he was in power you know we didn't have peace but everyone was much better you know instead of starting okay let's go there and fight everyone was busy in the state this is why europe is dying europe is dying because of the united states europe needs trump in power so it's gonna be busy and i hope Whatever the fuck he pick up for vice president is not someone lunatic like the woman uh, Nikki Harris. Nah, Nikki, Nikki Haley. Yes. Nikki Haley. Because trust me, if that woman became vice president, Trump is gonna die in the office. Yeah. Believe me. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that Donald Trump needs to be careful who speak for the office. 
and then Nikki Haley is gonna win the next election and another one, you know. We I, 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 I think this is a good perspective from Vos, a great perspective, which is uh, when if Trump comes to power, one of the good things that might happen is that he will be busy with his own country for a long time. He has he learned a lot what happened bad in the first in his first tenure, and now you'll have to somehow get rid of that problem. It's not that in the American he can do much because there is all these levels of different decision making. And not everybody can change, but he he understood how things work. The first time, he was like a a newie, a newbie. So uh, I, that's a good idea, Vos, and I think we should also take that into account. Accounting, yeah, and, broadly. And I think that Trump will realize that uh, they, he don't have a lot of time, uh, because he's also very old. And then four years after the first term, he realized it's actually a very short time. He can't really do everything that everything that he wants to do. So I think the second term he will speed up. Uh, in my opinion, uh, in what in what he needs to do, and uh, uh I, we I have Ed, Forrest is here, uh, but uh, who 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 needs to add on? Uh, oh, I can't see the finger. Uh, I was just Who's gonna say, Bradley, uh, I Mr. yeah, Lambo, I, just to add to that, I don't know. Um, uh, it's an interesting point that was discussed here earlier, where the people were suggesting that, uh, whatever it is, you're gonna try to find a mechanism. It was Toby that was bringing it up to make it not work you know they, i don't know why they're so threatened of trump maybe it's personal you know and they're afraid to deal with his temper tantrum or something like this i have no idea because i mean he did he did everything it's not like he uh, made, made rapprochement with russia possible right he armed the ukrainian uh neo-nazis and all this other stuff but for some reason it's a big enough deal to try to do all this wheeling and dealing and background shit and try to get him uh I don't know, not not plausible as a candidate or able to be removed if he is president. I think it's because he's not part of the club. You know, it, it reminds me of Russia. You know, like how they deal with Russia. You know, the entire you know the collective West how they deal with Russia is like you are not part of the club. So you know, even if you do your best to try to integrate and everything, or they will just still demonize Russia, just like Trump. You know, Trump did a lot of good for United States. And uh, but still, you know, they want to you know take him out. You know, we need to stop this propaganda about Nazis in Ukraine. There is no Nazi in Ukraine. That's Russia propaganda. You know, please stop it. That, that's that's like one guy, one one mercenary <laughs> said that during an interview with Will I Am. He said, "People just like the symbols, so they they tattoo them. They didn't know." Something that, that tattoo is just, you know, that tattoo is just for them to look cool on the internet, yeah. you know. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Like, it's self-expression. <laughs> they just have a, a desire to express themselves and also Hitlerite propaganda. It's crazy. It's so, fucking crazy. So we have reached <laughs> six hours. So I think we should do closings. If yeah. not, you know, we'll end up going to 10 hours and I really don't want to start that trend. No, okay. I DP open my started off with three hours, then after it become four hours, it become five hours. I say no, five hours is too much. Now we are start with Toby. Let's start with um, let's start with Toby. Another open with... mic without without Africa. Yeah, yeah. Africa is not. Wait, important. we are it's two Africans small, on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I say let's start with Toby. You know, every 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 <laughs> village has his clown. DPA has a few of them. <laughs> Tell me, do your closing. Uh, yeah, okay. Interesting open mic. It's good to see Wacko back. Haven't seen him for a while. Um, and interesting to see some new faces. It's the first time I've been on with Naomi. Uh, <laughs> yep, that's it. Thanks, Wyatt. Appreciate it. Thank I'll you, see you guys I'm, in the lounge. So I'm so not used to such a short no closing. Uh, Prata. Okay. Don't Prata. worry, we go Prata here. Yeah, we, um, we need Prata to balance it up. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, oh, sorry for the comments. Who, ne uh, who oh, next? Prata, go. Prata, Prata. Prata, release. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we had this amazing interview with Putin that uh, even before being launched, it had kind of overreaction uh, all over Europe 
all over the Western countries, uh, saying immediately that it was a bad thing, people shouldn't listen to it, and how Tucker is a horrible person. He will just give the, the floor to Putin to say whatever he wants. Um, actually, who knows Putin a lot? He has gave many interviews uh, uh, on these last two years. It could be actually provisible what he's going to do. But Putin made something much uh, much more different than what we're expecting him to do. He did a presentation to actually to um, uh, educated people to think about a little bit what they are doing to bring that bit down to the to the point. But this um, this first overreaction made something even worse. They have they have a, a lot of consequences in terms of what the population, which was also able to listen to this conversation, and they saw that not not all countries, but many countries uh, had their leaders saying that the same phrase. This interview was ridiculous. Uh, Putin uh, said a couple of um, uh, of lies, a pack of lies. And all that Russia is doing is imperialism is going to, to steal um, territory from Ukraine. So this was the move. Uh, Chancellor Scholz said it, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Britain and some other, some other guys. And in doing these, they made things even more worse because the main message from Putin was, we have been here for such a long time. We are not going anywhere. This is our border. These are people that are connecting to us. This is a fraction of time in the much longer history and we want to negotiate. Look at the look at the facts, and we want to negotiate. And uh, some people then there was some reaction uh, from some other less important official saying things like, "Well, we I, uh, Putin is not really wants to negotiate. That we don't see that. I think he wants to um, fool us." And whoever has a bit of brains understands what is these people doing? They, they want to keep war, what they want to, to achieve with it. I also noticed something very interesting in Europe, we didn't discuss it today, was the fact that many countries in Europe didn't comment it. Macron made no comment about the, about the, um, the interview, not Portugal, not Spain. I think in, even Italy didn't make also no official comment about it. So these actually show a division now in Europe about this, um, how this war is going through. We also saw in the same day the uh, political change of shares in, in Ukraine, the, the interview that we just, uh, the, um, the declaration from Biden just after the interview uh, uh, explain, uh, showing that Biden has a problem of uh, intellectual capacity to keep actually being a president, uh, actually almost like saying, look, guys, I'm not the one signing the, the, the bills or the, making the big choices like Putin almost in the interview suggested. So in a way, uh, I think this interview, there was there had nothing to be amazing, become one of the uh, changing points in what is going to happen in the next month. And I hope it sees because it offers us to be more rational about all these things and, yeah, make change. Thank you, brother. Waka. Closing. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for giving time. Actually, we remain so busy uh, because of Iran-Pakistan crisis followed by elections. So I am also part of a channel. So uh, normally don't get time at night to uh, really give my uh, full, you know, part. Uh, but it's always refreshing and good thing. I, I think one thing Westerns to realize, even in Pakistan, this election was called a social media revolution. Uh, initially, people would say that it's just, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, but the way the politics has happened now, social media is driving everything. And uh, DPA has done a lot, I think. It's an international community of brotherhood and we talk very frankly of the issues and that is good. I think Western media, Putin also pointed out the way they control it. Uh, but I think mainstream media is, uh, nobody now gives a F to mainstream media, honestly, even in Pakistan. Because social media has allowed a debate where common people can sit and express their views and also drive the political agendas. So West has to realize that uh, they, they like, they try to demonize you know, even Tucker Carlson, I don't know what do they do when he goes back. Uh, but uh, I think the interview, because of suppression of this interview, has actually found more viewership, more following, more comments. I think it went into millions and millions of views all across the world. Even in Pakistan, I think um, uh, um, almost close to a million people watched this interview, despite that we were in the elections. 
So it means that you cannot now suppress the information and the truth comes out because it's very frank on social media and people can express their uh, views. And that's how I think <clears throat> globally we can solve problems also because alternate view is very important. What is thrust by the states is now becoming diminished because of social media. So thank you very much, uh, for DPA. Well, I, become, I become irregular because of my commitments with the media. And somehow it's very difficult to find time for long session. But I feel that I should be coming regularly. And gradually things start settling down here. Um, and we have less problems. And I, I'll be more regular. Thank you. Thank you, Waka. I just want to highlight. Are. I just want to highlight, it's actually almost 5.30 a.m. in Pakistan. So, you know, he's he's not sleeping at all. <laughs> just Thank you for, your, for sharing your wisdom and time with us, Wakar. Always very appreciated. Thank you. So we have the new guy, Joey Eros Ian. I, I don't know which one he wants us okay. to call him. Uh, just call me Joey. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much for hosting me. This is my first time. I've been, as I said, I've been, I watch all your videos on the Ukrainian war and also sometimes pop in, I just watch passively this DP open mic. So today I just decided, let me try my luck and see if I can contribute. Uh, a fantastic team. I've had very diverse viewpoints from all over the world from you people. And uh, I've enjoyed myself a lot. I hope hopefully I'll be popping in once a while here and there. Right now it's 3 30 a.m. where I am. So <laughs> yeah, so I was really stuck in there to uh, until the end. So thank you so much. Anyway, thank you, Joey. Keep that short. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Joey. You so yeah. Appreciate so it. uh Br Bradley. All right. So I'll I'll uh, really quickly just kind of want to uh, underline some of the stuff that we talked about um, that we really we mostly this open might be really discussed the Putin interview. So, I mean, I mean, that, that just shows how big of a deal it is. Right. Where we can't even help ourselves, but we end up talking about it for, you know, five hours. Um, so I think the Putin Tucker Carlson interview was a big deal. And uh, Putin laid out at least the Russian position or, you know, at least his own position. I think that's a very important aspect of this whole thing. For some people, they maybe they've never even been, uh, they've never heard it before, that there is a Russian position that is not, we got to rebuild the Soviet Union, you know, the caricature, cartoon, bad guy thing that we have going on. Some people really have no uh, way of reaching outside of that. I think a lot of Americans don't know that Putin was willing to negotiate early in the war or even now. I think his offers to negotiate are genuine. Uh, Vaughn might be right that they're not, but there's no real way to know that um the fact that the intro the 30 to 45 minute uh, long history lesson is talked about so much is actually kind of interesting because maybe it does turn off some people but maybe it's a good thing for the marketing of the interview as well because people can think of it as oh like if i really want to have an understanding then i guess putin really goes into the history you know so i mean there's there's maybe uh maybe there is something to that i don't know Tucker Carlson was not giving Putin a softball interview. He asked him some adversarial lines of questioning. But uh, one thing that really stood out to me in the interview, which I don't think we talked about, um, was that uh, Putin went out of his way to not bring up names and particulars of in the interview of things that ha happened in conversations that he had, which is very interesting. Like He was like, no, I still respect the private conversations that I've had with these people. But they're still liars, you know. You guys are liars, but you know I'm not going to throw you under the bus. Um, so that's kind of interesting that he did that. Um, and yeah, that's kind of uh, just a recap of kind of my thoughts about the whole thing. And I want to say thank you very much to the panel and for Wyatt for being a trooper and holding these uh, open mics. Not everybody has the patience for for doing this every week, but thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Bradley. Nunya. Well, how do I follow that up? I mean, my God. Uh, nice to see you back, Bradley. That was a good speech you gave. Uh, and I echo your sent sentiments uh, 100%. Uh, yeah, I mean, what else to say? I mean, it was a good week for Putin. Uh, in, in boxing terms, this was a definite, you know, body blow. Now, for those of you who don't follow boxing, you know, if you see a body blow, you know, on the clips or whatever, it doesn't look all that impressive, right? 
it's not like a Mike Tyson uppercut that's going to crush your skull or anything like that. It's not going to make the highlights or anything like that. But for those who follow boxing, those who understand, those it's those body blows. Those are the ones that really win fights. Because when you're sitting down, you know, in between rounds and you're, you can't breathe because your, your ribs are caved in, that's when you want to quit. So that's exactly what Putin dealt this week to the Western narrative, I think. Uh, and I promise you, people noticed. I mean, we've got 200 million uh, plus on X alone and it's growing. Uh, people saw it. I think uh, next couple months, you're going to start to see people digesting it. And I think you're going to see a narrative shift because, frankly, Europe has no other choice but to shift. Uh, so I think that's a good thing for Ukraine in the long run. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to note about, uh, you know, Putin. And then on a side note, just had a lot of fun with you guys today uh, in the chat and stuff. You know, all the regulars, Bozo and Lori and Fightback and Glenn. You know, I have a blast every week just, you know, watching you guys go at it in the chat too. So uh, shout out to you guys too. Uh, cheers. Mr. Lambo. Um, uh, I, uh, I, um, I didn't watch nothing. So I, I heard only from Bradley and the others that uh, you only talk about Tucker Carlson and Putin. So I'm just going to give me my two cents on that one, on that interview. And it is like, Actually, I did learn something new. What's me told? He actually did a, a two-hour interview about what he already said since, I think, 2014, something like that, or even earlier. But he explained it in a more better story way. That was very good, actually. Because when the things came out about Boris Johnson and Biden saying... No, 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 no contracts, no agreements. Never got on the news. And now they start to speak about it. Wow. Again, you know, the thing about he never wanted to have NATO coming closer and closer and closer. He said that five times. We don't want to have NATO closer to our borders. He already said to NATO five times. We don't want to have the NATO closer to the borders. But does NATO go closer to the borders? Then they ending up with Ukraine to say we want to have Ukraine as a NATO country. We're going to start the deals about that. Putin became very angry. I'm going to say, dude, I already asked five times, don't come closer. What did you did five times? You came closer. Now I'm done. And he had good reasons and his point of view to start to attack, to defend some regions of Ukraine starting with Crimea, Donbass regions and uh, as If you're playing a strategic game and you have your enemy getting closer, but you can make agreements with your enemy and you're not agreeing with your enemy, or your enemy is not agreeing with you and just do their own things, what are you, what are you going to do? Are you going to lose your game or are you going to continue to fight your game to win your game? That's exactly the same that Putin does. They came too close. They used Ukraine, and Ukraine was also in a certain part, like he talked about the history of Ukraine, very important for Russia. Uh, and the industry also, during the USSR, Ukraine was a very important country for shipbuilding, plane building, uh, machinery building, ammunition building, rocket building, other stuff. That's just explained for the military and transport. And turned off as Ukraine, but like the whole biggest transport fleet was being designed by ask of the USSR, ask of it, that big plane that they destroyed or somebody destroyed last year, the Antonov 225, was designed and built because Russia, the USSR, asked for them to build it. So Ukraine was also always very important for Russia. And it's just logic that, you're, that Putin, after a while, is going to say, okay, guys, I ask you a lot, very friendly, just stop to messing up with me. Or am I going to attack? NATO say, oh, what are you going to do? And it started, 2022, it's really started. And now you have the situation you see now. It's a war that's controlled by NATO. 
They try to find a reason to weaken Russia. Never going to work. And you watch the interview. It's fucking amazing how chill Putin is. How chill he's explaining everything. How in the chill way he's speaking. He's perfectly knowing what's going to happen in the future. Why? Russia is very big. And they still have a lot to continue that fight. And they're never going to stop. Like he said, the moment NATO stop funding Ukraine, we're just going to let bleed Ukraine out until they're going to surrender and going to ask for an agre agreement of just raising the white flag. And then they don't going to have any choices anymore left. Russia is going to have totally control to depend and to say what we're going to do with Ukraine for the future of Ukraine. That's what's going to happen. So that's what I what I am seen as conclude for Putin. For me, it's nothing new. If you watch it, the interviews of Putin before, you're going to you, you just have now a big beautiful story of two hours, but one half hour of history lesson to just refresh your sire to yourself how the history is of Ukraine and know what is happened and what the future is going to be. It was very chill, not aggressive interview for Putin. It was very professionally made by him, very good, not written notes, starting to bully or fight somebody else, like other other people said here. If you want to know the truth, just ask the people with who I talk to. That's fucking amazing of him. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to watch the open mic tomorrow because I'm going to feel fucking tired, but I'm going to rewatch everything. And uh, I think the conclusions I made, everybody said something about it. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lambo. I actually wanted to react something about something you said, but I forgot about it. He's like, so he just keep going on. <laughs> um, boss. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. Is all right now? Yeah, that was another good open mic, and it's nice to see. <coughs> Sorry, Waka and Greg in the same panel, and it's closing, you know. That's the best thing ever. These two guys, they always know what they're talking about. You know, I'm not going to talk about Vladimir Putin and this interview because it's full of propaganda. I don't want to be part of that propaganda. And one other thing, Russia needs to watch out because the breach are coming, you know. They go fight, challenge. That's enough. The best tanks in the world. So what could go wrong? Yes. It's shame that we didn't talk about Sudan because there is a shit going on. Serious shit, you know. If everyone always talking about Gaza, there is a fucking shit is going on in Sudan and in fucking Congo, you know. This is 10 times worse than it's going on in Gaza, but no one cares about Africa, so mm. they just leave it. <laughs> and Joy, welcome to the jungle, you know. I hope you come yeah. more often to yeah, sure. say hi. And yeah, why? Thank you for giving us time, you know. You just sit there for six hours, listen to us talking shit about giving each other nooks. I don't fucking know <laughs> where we're going one day, you know. <laughs> I'm glad we don't I'm glad we don't have the some the audience is not as big as Taco Castle, you know, because people will think we are on something really, really bad. Yeah, that's all I've got to say, man. Thank you, Voss. And uh, Craig, you're muted. Is that better? Yep. Yeah, well, uh, I do care about Sudan, and I've been looking at the refugee numbers for it today, and all around South Sudan, you can see that every country around um, other than North Sudan, has been absorbing refugees, and it is a very large number of people, and it is a horrific situation. I've also been in, uh, tracking by watching an awful lot of Africans 
talking about it on TikTok, where you see a lot of discourse on TikTok about the African situation. And I got to say, after probably about 20 hours of that, I still don't know exactly how to define a janjaweed, but I know it's bad. And I don't know how to define a bantu, but I know it's good. And I don't know how to characterize the situation except to say that when Russia uh, tried to intervene, I think positively in the region, Victoria Newland paid a visit, and we all know how that ends. So the whole South Sudan situation is probably as central to um, North uh, East Africa as the Palestine situation is in basically the, the rest of the region. And those are two similar situations across from each other where you know, a US-backed proxy is sitting in the middle creating horrific genocidal chaos um, that disrupts an entire region of people from getting on with business. And the reason is obvious because you know, China has a deal in Djibouti for a port. It wants to build a railway across all the way to West Africa. Uh, it wants to develop the continent. And the United States doesn't want that. It's really that simple. All they're trying to do is make Africa poor. They don't want the resources. This is something the capitalists get wrong and communists get right. They're trying to preserve monopolies, not achieve resources. If they can keep their safe mines in Canada and Australia uh, and keep high prices for them, then they want all the cheaper resources from poorer people off the market entirely. And they do that by disruption and war. And that's a very cheap thing they can do. They keep Ukraine's resources off the market. They're not trying to get the resources. They're trying to prevent others from accessing them. They want to make sure that Russia doesn't get Ukraine's resources. They don't need Ukraine's resources. They have plenty of other places they can keep the prices up. And the higher the prices are, the more valuable the control of the monopolies and the sea routes is. And if they come from islands, that's great because the sea empire can control them. So always think about that in resource terms. It's not about getting them. It's about preventing others from accessing them. If you make that mindset shift, you'll start to see the world a lot more similarly to the way Vaz and I see it and a lot less similarly to the way um, you know, the, the neocon economists who are always getting it wrong see it. Uh, the Congo situation I'm less familiar with, but it is bad. And another, how you, how you disrupt uh, basically Central Africa is with the Congo situation. So there's, there's always some way to create a conflict that makes resources inaccessible and a poor investment to extract. And this is what they've been doing to Africa if they're losing control of it, if France loses control of West Africa, the second best thing is to disrupt West Africa so that you can't get anything out of it. And so the people go poor and get disrupted. You know, if you can't control Ukraine, then the second best thing is leave it disrupted. If you can't control Venezuela, leave it disrupted. They have done this all over the world and it is making the world poor. China has the exact opposite agenda. And the Chinese agenda is actual development, actual continental development. The world has turned to China because China is a friend and the U.S. is an enemy to the entire planet. Now, if I was going to offer the American empire some advice, I would say go to where you're actually necessary and welcome. Uh, island nations like the Philippines and Indonesia will always need to comb work with the sea empire. They have no choice. They're, 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 they're separated by sea just internally. Um, uh, work, if you want to work on this Asian continent and, uh, and deal with the um, you know, essentially constructively, then, then work with India and Pakistan and, and offer them deals where as long as you stay at peace with each other, you know, you're both going to get rich. Like, and do nothing to interfere in the politics of either country. Absolutely nothing. Just offer them incentives to develop and deal with you. And that's it. And that'll be enough counterbalance to the Russia, China, Iran situation. Uh, it'll keep, you know, them skin in the game, investments in the game, you know, and, and, and make it a take it or leave it deal. But, you know, invest in places where they want you. You know, South America doesn't want American intervention, doesn't want American leadership, but you can make positive deals that they will want. So if I was telling America what it would be, offer a big fat apology and two good to be true deals to Central and Latin America, offer a huge apology for the Jakarta method and to Indonesia, offer to Philippines that you're never going to drag it into a war over Taiwan and tell Taiwan that if they can come to equitable terms with China, those terms will be respected. And maybe it's two different deals for the, the North and the South, for the KMT and for the uh, more indigenous people of Formosa. But whatever it is, just agree not to disrupt things anymore in the world, you know, and disband and rewrite the mandate, something like the CIA. Become like the 
benevolent sea empire if you can. That's about the only advice I can give America. As far as the presidency is concerned, <laughs> the major parties have put, you know, bad candidates forward. Nikki Haley, Trump, and Biden are all unfit for office. So it boils down to the to the VPs. I don't think Kamala Harris is qualified, and I don't trust her record. But um, there's still some chance that Trump might choose Tulsi Gabbard, who I think does have some quality. And how this affects international affairs is huge. Um, Trump and Tulsi are both pro-Israel. And that actually plays very negatively into the U.S. story right now. If RFK Jr. chooses Tulsi, he may take as much as 15, 20 percent of the vote. He actually only needs to take 33 percent technically to win if he gets the right uh, mix in the right states. So we are actually seeing independent candidates for president who are far more qualified. If it's RFK Tulsi, that's a better ticket than anything else on the table other than maybe Jill Stein and Cornell West, who is a legitimate actual left ticket. So when you see far better candidates for president coming from the more independent sources, and the major parties are putting literally cacists across, like a cacistocracy, where you put incompetent people in, you sleaze them in all of their 4,500 appointments, and then you just steal, 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 because there's nobody in power who can stop you, because there's nobody in power who's competent. That's totally the collapse of an empire. So the major parties have put forth complete garbage, you know, and it really boils down to who is the vice presidential candidates and who is down ballot? Who controls the Senate really, really matters because they ratify the appointments of the executive. Uh, who controls the House really, really matters. Who controls the big states, Texas and California, really, really matters. So I don't even want to talk about presidency at all. It's almost irrelevant. I want to talk about, you know, for stability in the U.S., look at who's running the states, look at who's running the Congress, look at who's running the Senate, and forget the presidency. The presidency can't cause the civil war. Presidency is a foreign affairs job. And when you look at that, you just, the odds of a qualified president of the United States are very low. And I'm with Vaz. A disruptive, ineffective, useless president of the United States might be the best thing right now because the world does not want, does not need, cannot stand, and is at great risk because of U.S. leadership. The most dangerous thing Biden ever said was, America is back and ready to lead. That is the danger. America leading. Most of the situations in the world that, that suck are because America is too strong. North and South Korea can unify because the U.S. is too strong. It's too dangerous to have them on China and Russia's border, right? Israel, too strong. You know, arrogant, now literally genocidal. That's, that's disastrous. South Sudan, Victoria Newland shows up, makes a credible offer of support, and next thing you know, horrific civil war. Like, this is all chaos caused by America. America tells Ukraine, hey, we'll arm your Nazis and uh, you can go take another try at Russia. Like these, Venezuela, all these situations are because America is too strong. A weaker America is in the interest of the world. It's actually in the interest of America because then they would give up on some of these imperial ambitions. They'd focus on domestic infrastructure, build some high-speed rail, and work with closer partners. Mexico, Guatemala, they should be investing immensely in Guatemala. That's where all the migrants are coming from. That's why people are coming north. They should invest in Philippines and Indonesia, like I said. They should make decent offers to South America and to India. You know, if you're only investing in one quarter of the world, then you can make much bigger, better investments. This was a successful strategy for the U.S., they didn't invest all over the place. They did it in order. Germany and Japan, heavy investment, wild success. South Korea, heavy investment, wild success. Right? This works, going one at a time to countries that actually want you there. That's how you build, you know, peace, and that's how you build friendships, and that's how you build stability. And if somebody comes to the presidency at this point who knows that, that's a miracle. I'm not worried about the inside of the United States. It doesn't matter to me very much if... Texas splits and, and Mexico recognizes it and they work out their own border issues or whatever. That, none of that will lead to a civil war. There's no issue on the table that would cause a civil war unless Russia or China allied with one of the breakaway states. That's what caused the U.S. civil war was fear that Britain would ally with the Confederacy and basically get its paws back into the continent. It really was that as much as it was slavery, which is a huge moral issue. You have nothing of that scale going on. So as long as breakaway U.S. states didn't make alliances with Russia or China, stayed in a kind of EU-type arrangement with the other breakaway states, there wouldn't be a civil war in the U.S. So I, I just don't see that as a primary issue. What's going to happen over the next rest of this month, just to wrap this up, ICJ is going to rule on the Israel situation. And 
that is going to be huge. We are going to find out whether the International Court of Justice really causes a catalytic move around the world to comply with it and whether the US and the UK get to ignore it and continue to supply a genocide along with their allies. I'm already seeing in Canada that the pressure is immense to stop supplying Israel, immense. And I suspect that will be the case in most of the allied countries in Europe too. So if ICJ starts to work, then we might see a, a, break, a, a great outbreak of peace. Uh, Hungary could complain about the treatment of ethnic minorities in Ukraine. Russia could complain about the Donbass. All this stuff would be taken to court instead of being taken to the battlefield. And that's just a much, much safer world. Now, that's all that's wildly optimistic. I've given you five or six ways out of World War III. But the thing that frightens me the most is we had nuclear non-proliferation for a reason. And that was because of the increasing capacity for biological weaponry. It's much cheaper. States can do it. They can keep it on hand. And once it's out of the bag, it's out of the bag for good. And fingers can be pointed, blame fingers in every direction. As we saw during the pandemic, everybody can get blamed for a pandemic outbreak. So the most frightening outcome here is that on the urge of a nuclear, on the verge of a nuclear war, that somebody pulls out the bio. And the most vulnerable country to that is the United States with its anti-vaxxers and its anti-maskers and its freedom. It would basically have no capacity to control a major outbreak unlike China, which has proven that it can lock down and it can hold those things in. So we have this great danger now that the asymmetric defense against bio is so much stronger in China and even in Russia than it is in the US. So it's the most vulnerable power internally to disruption and to war, and it's the most aggressive abroad. One of those two things has to change. If it's RFK Jr., he builds a working public health system and that helps their biosecurity immensely. Uh, and he calms down the Ukraine war, and that helps immensely. He may be on the wrong side in Israel, but that might be settled by then if they can at least respect the ICJ. So be terrified of the scenario where nuclear weapons proliferate to even one or two more players and everyone getting bio in their hands as the response, as the defense. That's the most terrifying scenario. Be equally terrified of the scenario where the United States continues to try to lead. It has to stop leading because where it's led, is over a cliff. And there is no good outcome here where the ICJ is not working and where countries are not able to take their issues to the ICJ and expect, at least on the civil trade, uh, diplomatic relationships, shipping outcomes, that they would achieve so much pressure on a misbehaving genocidal country that that country effectively could not continue. So hope for that. Hope the same factors that got Yugoslavia off the table, that got apartheid South Africa off the table, work on Israel, and that ICJ is proven effective. And then you will not see civil wars. You will not see continent-destroying disasters. You will see a working global international law system as Harry Truman intended when he designed it. And that is about the best we can hope for over the next 50 years. Then there's technological disruption to talk about, but that's going to be for another time. We got technology and climate issues all still on the table all not dealt with while we're dealing with our petty interhuman issues we have non-human threats that are rather vast so i hope that in 2024 we can stop talking about the conflicts we've been talking about and start talking about bigger things well then and by the way thank you for mention Congo. Thank you. I mean it. It's the next thing. We've got to pay attention to it. And each of these regions is being disrupted by the same method and by the same people for the same reason. And the more that we look at, the more we see the patterns, we more see the tactics, the more we see how they work. I still maintain Craig should have a YouTube channel. You know, his monologue, you know, will be well watched. Yeah, I'm so sorry, that was too much of a monologue there. <laughs> no, he's all right. He, actually, it's good. Uh, yeah. Daniel. Hmm. Oh, no, not this guy. Not this guy. Please. I'm hey, joking. <laughs> How are you, man? Yeah, I'm all right. You good? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so yeah, I, 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 I should have played. I should have played, man. Sorry. Uh, I didn't know you guys were closing. But Craig, 
Uh, whoa, I love Craig. Why the fuck doesn't he come here more? Yeah, he I love, usually I love hides in the live chat. Yeah, yeah, I love the way he speaks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm saying I love the way he speaks. I especially love the points he made. Uh, like, um, it's it's hard to articulate what he said uh, normally, uh, but he he was very accurate actually. What, what happens in in not just Africa, even South America, it's the same thing. Uh, prim- the primary goal of the U.S. is to make sure that nobody becomes well a threat now in the future um i did i didn't follow much of the much of the much of the conversation today i was i was busy um i, ha- I had bits and pieces about sudan um i wish i was present you also have a kenyan here today which is nice uh you recruited so, me <laughs> yeah i got new people here so just just uh that, that's good um Yeah, I, I don't have much to say today because I, I kind of showed up late, so it's my fault. Okay, Slava Ukraine! Yes, what? Slava Ukraine, what? Slava Ukraine. Slava Ukraine? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we need to tell us. Shout it! So Slava Ukraine, so come on! So that we no, don't I'm not fucking Slava Ukraine. What the fuck? Voss, <laughs> Voss, save the Everybody movies. knows, everybody knows, everybody knows I am fucking Club Putin. I, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't get it. Okay? I support Putin. And if he's watching, yeah, I, I, I support him 100%. And, and yeah. as, I hope you guys talked about his... his uh, uh, Putin is a bad his... man. Why are you supporting me? Why wouldn't you support man. Putin? He's like, a crazy, any he's a crazy guy with being... a lot of nukes. Come on, man. With a lot of what? Nukes. Uh, new, 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 yeah, new, new, the sole and only reason Putin is actually just still there is because he has nukes. If he didn't have nukes, we'll be fucked. Like, we all know that. You, you know, you know, you know, I'm gonna them. say something. I'm gonna say something that is gonna surprise you guys. Remember, yeah. Sad, remember Saddam saying, remember Qaddaf. Mm-hmm. You know, if he things went wrong for Russia. Putin would be gone the same way. Putin would be dead. You know, these people Putin always have, say, we are the good guys. We are coming to help Putin, you. Putin, what kind Putin, of good guy, what kind of good guy hung someone on fucking live TV? Huh? Okay, was, 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 why are you talking like you, you, you still don't know that the U.S. is evil <laughs> as fuck? Like, why are you talking like 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 it's, Daniel, it's even the us know. knows it's evil as fuck you the us is very like, daniel oh, and my yeah? is watching me then what's mr lambo you need to understand about voz yeah. he's <laughs> actually working for the bbc so he only says crap voz voz the other day was saying here in the west and i was like i thought we talked about this voz You're not supposed to be saying we in the West anymore. <laughs> I live in you the West. You already talked about this. And, and plus, MI5, MI6. Come on, guys. No, no, I, think, I, think, I think White wants to sleep. <laughs> we finished closing no, already. You you guys, like, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the you problem. Need, you know? yeah, where where yeah, would you send me like that? Other than guy. Angola. Like, your accent is strictly Angolan. Like, where else would they fucking send you? No, he's not. He has a like, very brutal... He has a anywhere. very Cockney accent. It's Cockney. It's completely you London. You can't be anywhere. You He'll drink his one. cup of tea later. Hmm? He'll drink yeah, his like, cup of tea later. Okay. Don't worry about you, that. You don't want a cup of tea. You're in England and you can't even speak English correctly. Oh, come on, like, come on, Daniel. Like... Daniel, sorry. Daniel, bitch uh, fight with him and the voice chat. There are more than six different accents in London. <laughs> He doesn't, he doesn't speak Oxford English. He speaks Cockney. Is that how you want me to speak? Fuck that. This guy learned, this guy Greek, learned you know. English in, on, the, in, the, in the nightclubs. Trying to stop, find stop the British ship. Stop scamming my time. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to reach seven hours at this rate. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. okay, okay, okay. Bye, 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 bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye, bye. Wears, I don't think he's going for the prettiest chick. He's just going for whatever he's going to smash. Let's be honest. Bitch fighting you do in the voice chat, my little friends. 
I, I understand. Uh, but hey, I came here late. Give me a chance, man. Mr. Yeah, Lama, I was also late. late. No, 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 no. Like you. no, no, no. The AI too cannot process the timestamp. You know, if these get too Bye. long. Bye, guys. <laughs> bye bye. Kisses, kisses, big out. kisses, Wyatt. Bye bye, bye bye. So yeah, they scam me. 40, 40 minutes to do closing. What the hell? <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, good open mic. I think this open mic is a uh, very, 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 very good. Uh, we talk a lot, a lot of very different issues. I think because mainly uh. A lot of things happened over the past week, so there was a lot of uh, very uh, strong and good conversations. And uh, yeah, and I cannot drag in anymore because the video is getting a bit too long. I'm not sure if the AI too can digest it. So thank you for watching. Do press the like button, subscribe. I'll see you guys. Oh, yeah, I just want to talk one more thing. One more thing. Um, the channel is Shadow Band. Uh, the DPA Open Mic channel is Shadow Band. So I'm currently good in the process of changing the ownership uh from one google account to another so hopefully it will stop the uh the shadow banning uh by going to a you know a less less censored uh, google account so just want to say that and uh bye bye bye, bye guys i will see you guys in the next update uh, outro 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 outro